Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the, um, playing the short video. Uh, my name's Karma Conville. I'm a senior director here at BNP Paribas, and I'm the deputy head of the rural team at Strutton Parker. We're absolutely delighted to be able to host you all today at our UK headquarter campus for the annual LEAF conference. So welcome. I'm glad you all made it through security. Um, five years ago, BNP Paribas acquired Strutton Parker. Our newest shareholder is the largest bank in Europe and amongst the 10 biggest banks in the world. Their tagline is, the bank for a changing world. And for us, that changing world is one with sustainability at its core. Strutton Park is a rural consultancy business, as many of you will know, with over 135 years of legacy and history, with a real focus on farming and long-term land management. Our 25 offices across the UK manage over 2 million acres of land, and provide advice to nearly 5,000 clients. And as our videos just showed, we're helping all our clients put their future in perspective, whether that's helping small family farming businesses with changes to legislation and applying new environmental schemes, right through to working with some of the largest institutional clients on huge landscape recovery projects. Many of our core values resonate with LEAFs. And that is why we are pleased to host you today. Before I hand over to Philip, I've got a couple of people, a couple of pieces of housekeeping to deal with. Please ensure that your phones are on silent throughout the day. Nobody wants to be that person that gets the fine. We're not expecting a fire alarm. They happen on a Friday. So if we hear the fire alarm, head out of the door, across the um, main foyer, and you'll be pointed to a muster point. Other than that, I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day. I look forward to meeting many of you at lunch and over the breaks this afternoon. Philip, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Carl, and thank you for facilitating us being able to be here today in this brilliant venue in uh, central London. So thank you very much indeed. And a very good morning uh, and a warm welcome to everyone to our annual conference. Um, Pathways to Sustainability, Scaling the Transition to, of Global Agriculture. What is really wonderful is that we have this venue full to capacity from people right across the industry, from farming, finance, retail, advisory, and many others who have a passion and interest for in the sustainability of our food systems. Now, many of you will have read our annual review, and there I made it very clear. LEAF is in great shape. I believe the progress that our organisation, our charity, has made over the last 12 months has been exemplary. We have continued to build trust through our leaf mark standard and that farmers are farming more sustainably. And while we've enjoyed the support of Waitrose and M&S for many years, now we have Tesco, Aldi, Lidl and Asda taking their growers through that very same journey to advance their sustainability objectives. In fact, Tesco are just starting to roll out the standard to their global supply chain production base. And I'm delighted that James Bradshaw is with us today, and he's going to speak to you a little later this morning. Having researched very carefully, we are now investing in new systems for our standard. And those will <coughs> facilitate the ever-increasing need and requirements for data collection and management. Of course, we have always supported growers in achieving accreditation. But with the exponential growth in membership, we have now enhanced that training offer to support both implementation and continued improvement. This is absolutely fundamental to success. And it truly differentiates us as LeafMark from other standards. Our Leaf network continues to grow. 
with new innovation centres launched last year at Hartbury and Aberystwyth. And three new demonstration farms from the extremes of the country, from Varfell in the south of Cornwall to Forefront Farming uh, in Fifeshire, and of course the Cambridge University Farm. Our network is pivotal in pioneering new approaches and pushing the boundaries of integrated farm management. This is at the very heart of LEAF, it's the very heart of what we do, is our mission to convert farmers and innovators to understand, achieve, and access best practice. I'm absolutely convinced peer-to-peer -peer learning provides the insight to the right solutions. Because after all, there is no handbook on this new but essential journey of growing more with less. Farming today faces unprecedented challenges around volatility of markets, spiraling costs of both labor and power, and levels of risk that none of us have ever experienced before. I was interested to read towards the end of the last year an article that Tim O'Malley from Nationwide Produce uh, put in the media. And he spoke about the tight returns from the vegetable sector. The reasons, he said, uh, were manifold. But the main reason, by far, is not Brexit. It's not inflation. It's not growers throwing in the towel. It's not being desperately short of labor. It's the weather. Farming is indeed on the front line of climate change. For us in LEAF, our resilience programs are key working in partnership with Corteva on the Resilient and Ready program and the Co-op Foundation who are supporting farmers on their journey to net zero. Together, we are advancing more sustainable farming. At the agriculture event at Duncan Farrington's farm last autumn, it was evident to every one of us, every one of us has a collective responsibility to action change. And of course, LEAF's educational programs have inspired so many young people to understand more about where their food comes from and how important it is that we look after nature. Carl and his education team last year worked directly with over 38,000 young people. And overall, 700,000 people benefited from the work of his team and their projects. And in last May, our honorary president, the Duchess of Edinburgh, joined us at Harper Adams for our residential uh, teenager research project. She was absolutely delighted to see these young people exploring the intricacies of food production in all its senses, and for us to understand how they perceive our ag uh, and value our agri-food industry. It is only by understanding this that we will be able to change how we engage, how we convert, and how we develop the next generation that will enter our industry. LEAF's vision is to engage, inspire, and motivate both young people and wider society to be conscious consumers, ensuring we have a world which is growing, eating, and living sustainably. Our flagship Leaf Open Farm Sunday draws thousands of visitors to farms who've opened their gates to demonstrate our industry's, industry's commitment to sustainability. Last year, 87% of visitors said that Leaf Open Farm Sunday increased their trust in British farming. Of course, in September last, I handed over the baton to David Webster, our new CEO. And I vividly recall the telephone our conversation I had with him the previous September when I was leaving Stanley. We talked the same language and had a common vision about the next steps in Leaf's journey. 
David's experience in working in ABF as Director of Sustainability and Public Affairs brings to leaf a new skill set that could not be more appropriate. And we are very, very lucky indeed to have him. So I hope you enjoy today's program. It's different. I want you to go away inspired. I want you to help support our journey to drive climate positive action for farming and food production. But before I hand over to David, we're going to play you a short video, which was taken towards the end of Caroline's life. In fact, it was her last event. And I remember well the long conversation we had as she drove up from Cornwall. She was a remarkable person who was determined as ever to drive change right up to the end. We miss her dearly, but her legacy continues and lives on. Indeed, it's thriving. I think she would be thrilled to see her leaf where it is today. Thank you. I'm the fourth generation on this farm. When I was in my early teens, the hedges were cut very short. Every ditch was dug out, but that's actually very valuable habitat. The idea that healthy food needs to be grown in a healthy environment has been part of the Jordan's DNA from the very start. And for decades, we've been working with our farmers to create wildlife, rich and friendly habitats. The Jordan's Farm Partnership is a pioneering collaboration between ourselves, the Wildlife Trust, LEAF, and the Prince's Countryside Fund to focus on sustainability across our entire UK farm supply chain. It is a holistic approach to sustainability across the partners, and it's one that we're really proud of. So we've cultivated up this plot here specifically to help the woodlarks breed. I've had three males singing this morning. That's really good news. Habitat management is challenging. The farmer needs to actually provide those habitats. They're sown habitats. Pollen and nectar plots, wild bird food plots, hedgerows, they need to be looked after with as much care, really, as the crops. We've got this plot where we're trying to provide as much food as we can for pollinators, all the bugs. See the clovers and things? That'll be up to here. I had always felt that if nature is doing well around us, then we're probably doing something right for the crops we're growing. There's no reason that we can't have conservation going on right next to efficient food production. The LeafMark provides a management framework to achieve a high standard of soil health, decarbonisation, water quality, whilst also boosting productivity and benefiting the environment. If we want to accelerate change and really turbocharge the change that now is needed for climate change mitigation, for really building biodiversity and biological diversity, it's about nature-based solutions and how we are smart in using nature to help build resilience in the field. But it's a long-term commitment. I'm fortunate in that uh, what I do, I, I absolutely love. So this time of year, it's actually a good time to see tadpoles. That's always a good sign of a nice, healthy pond. I have worked with the Princess Countryside Fund, mentoring some students. Farming has huge, huge challenges. The important thing is to educate the next generation so that there is more awareness of habitat and sustainability. I love seeing the seasons. I love seeing the farm grow and looking for ways that we can improve the environment that we're in and the business we want to drive forward.
let's check that this is working. Good. Okay, well, um, we're going to show films throughout the day today to illustrate the work of Leaf and our partners, many of whom are in the room. Uh, but that particular film was one that I was very keen that we showed. It was the, as Philip mentioned, it was the very last project that I worked upon with Caroline um, in particular early in 2022. Um, as we all know, Caroline was a remarkable campaigner both for farming and for change. And I feel, in one sense, deeply saddened and also greatly privileged to be stood here in her stead. Um, and I would also like to say thank you to Phil Ward, Caroline's husband, for joining us today. That also means a great deal to me personally. Um, when Caroline and I first met in 2006, I was working for Bill Jordan uh, of Jordan Cereals, another great pioneer of the UK conservation farming uh, movement. Since the mid-1980s, Jordan Cereals have paid their farm suppliers a premium for protecting wildlife. And in 2012, I had the honour of working alongside Caroline and others to help develop the current iteration of their long-standing conservation programme, the Jordan's Farm Partnership. Um, all the farms in this important scheme are LeafMark certified. Collectively, they manage an area of land equivalent to the size of the city of Oxford, and approximately 25, in fact, I think 27% of which is managed for biodiversity in partnership with the Wildlife Trust. It is a wonderful example of the power of collaboration and I'm delighted that both Gillian and Duncan from uh, Gillian from the Wildlife Trust and Duncan from Jordans are in the room with us today as well. But as is often the case with careers, as mine developed, the less time I spent in the field looking at bird's foot trefoil and the more I spent it behind a desk looking at a spreadsheet. Um, and my focus increasingly shifted towards the challenges represented by much larger supply chains, some composed of thousands of growers in developing markets often highly fragmented at farm level, but deeply consolidated in the center through processing or distribution, making uh, traceability either extremely difficult or absolutely impossible. Agricultural supply chains are under enormous pressure for productivity and efficiency, as everyone in this room will know. Since 1961, the cropped land available to grow food for every person on the planet has reduced by more than 50% as a consequence of population growth, amplifying pressure on the people who work within them and the planet that sustains them. The question of how to effectively engage with the problems this presents will be one of the most significant management challenges facing the whole agri-food sector over the coming decades. Um, whether in the context of food security, scope three greenhouse gas emissions reporting, natural capital risk assessment, or human rights due diligence. However, the case for engagement is utterly compelling. Many of the practices that we have relied upon to increase agricultural productivity in the face of entirely legitimate needs to feed and clothe people have themselves caused and are causing huge environmental harms. As the chart above shows, 78% of global ocean and freshwater pollution is attributed to agriculture and 26% of greenhouse gas emissions. Deforestation, eutrophication, biodiversity loss, Global agriculture has fed a growing population efficiently, but created enormous externalities, the consequences of which are becoming increasingly clear to us all, not least state policymakers in all Western nations who are, as we speak, drafting legislation to force businesses to actively mitigate the risk of harm within their own supply chains. The pressure to act is evident and will become only more so as the pace of global warming escalates. The UN IPCC predicts that from 2030, climate-related impacts will start to make parts of the world we live in today completely uninhabitable, and agriculture will be one of the sectors most exposed to risk as we pass through the 1.5 degree warming threshold over the course of the coming decade, which is not very long. AI-driven research by Stanford University in the US modeled that global temperatures will rise above two degrees by 2060 even if measures are taken to rapidly decarbonize the planet over the next two decades. Changes in farm and land management practices are therefore likely to be required on an enormous scale. Many farms are already responding to the impact of changing weather, and the photographs here reflect a depressing reality that is now familiar to everybody in this room. In the UK now, we are 30 times more likely to experience heat waves than during the pre-industrial period prior to, to 1750. For every one degree rise in air temperature, 
that also has the capacity to hold 7% more water, hence we are experiencing more frequent and heavy rainfall too. Uh, a retired area manager with the UK Environment Agency quoted in the media recently offered a blunt assessment on Storm Henk in January in the UK. Quotes, we simply cannot engineer our way out of the flooding challenges currently posed by climate change. He went on, Keswick defences, built in 2012 for a one in 100 year event, were overtopped in by one metre in 2015. Brecon flood defences completed in 2015 to defence against a one in 200 year event were overtopped in 2023. It is abundantly clear that change is occurring rapidly. It will ultimately require all farm businesses to take action to reduce risk, increase resilience, and meet the evolving expectations of society and governments for environmental accountability and assurance. However, it is not all doom and gloom. We're also living through an incredible period of energy and renewal in farming, perhaps best captured by the surge of interest in regenerative agriculture, where the benefits of harnessing natural systems, as Caroline described, are being recognised as an opportunity as well as a necessity. Since joining LEAF, I have met some of the most forward-thinking farmers in the UK, many of whom are using techniques such as agroforestry, cover cropping, companion cropping and direct drilling to improve soil structure and promote rainwater retention, while also reducing costs from diesel, nitrogen-based fertilisers and other farm inputs. LEAF is also working with leading academics on a number of new approaches to protect agricultural production while also optimising environmental delivery. We will hear from some of these uh, partners today and I'm pleased that so many are in the room. The collective, change, the collective challenge we now face is to ensure the more widespread understanding and adoption of best practice. In that context, I've come to appreciate a powerful insight at the core of LEAF and, and Caroline's approach which is that to create the conditions for change, one has to start with the farm business and work back towards the problem, not the other way around. Caroline set this out in the form of the LEAF Integrated Farm Management Framework Wheel, which we still use today, multiple aligned interventions that collectively create a more sustainable and resilient farm business. I too believe that good management practice based on evidence and data is the single most powerful tool we possess to interface with global agricultural supply chains and leverage resilience at pace and at scale. Before I hand over to Tom to open proceedings today, I just wanted to say a few words about LEAF and the organisation that Caroline built. Um, you'll have seen on your chairs, there, there is a notice there about the uh, Caroline Drummond Scholarship Fund, which Cedric Porter will, will mention a, a little bit more about later. To me, Caroline's enormous legacy has become only clearer for every day that I've worked with in LEAF. Her far-sighted vision, her belief that farming is a social good, her recognition that farm businesses are diverse and complex, her faith in science and technology as a solution rather than a problem, her innate understanding that for change to be effective, it cannot be imposed, it has to be owned. In framing pragmatic solutions to the enormous challenges we all face now, she was very far ahead of her time. LEAF now brings together thousands of farms globally, as Philip mentioned. We work with 18 leading academic uh, innovation centres and 40 wonderful demonstration farms across the UK. Last year, we took 38,000 children onto working farms and 170,000 people visited Open Farm Sunday events. As an organisation, we now number 40 wonderful people who are incredibly hardworking. We're changing and we're evolving. However, our job remains to convene and connect because we recognise the power to facilitate change lies not with us, but through you, the people in this room. Progressive farmers, food producers, retailers, academics, investors, financial and agricultural specialists, policy makers and consultants, environmental NGOs, teachers and opinion leaders, many of whom we're about to hear from today. On behalf of everybody in LEAF, I would like to thank you for being here. I would like to extend my most sincere thanks to our sponsors, Strutton Parker, Oxbury Bank and Frontier for making this event possible and our speakers for so generously giving up their time and sharing their expertise so freely. 
I am really looking forward to the event today, and I really would encourage everybody to participate fully, uh, to channel Caroline's vision of a more sustainable planet and her belief that we can deliver it if we work together. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much indeed, David, and thank you to Lee for inviting me uh, here today. I'm just going to get it out now. A few people have been asking me. Yes, they are my crutches, and in case you're wondering, I had a new knee not, that, not very long ago, um, which, of course, is a sign of being bionic, not a sign of old age. I'd just like to get that right out there. Come on, then. quick hands up. Who's got a new joint in their body that they didn't have when they were born? Little forest, we just remember we are superhuman. That is what you, that is what you need to know. Um, uh, there was some suggestion, uh, not least from medical professionals, that I shouldn't be doing this sort of thing less than two weeks after the operation. But I thought there's one thing that will get me off my sick bed. It is definitely uh, a definitely leap. But if you see me doing some strange uh, stretches and exercises, you know you are frankly interrupting my physio routine. So you know this is where we are today. But I am absolutely thrilled to be involved with this today. I mean, everything that Leif says and does and all the talks I hear and the films I see just say, this is the way we need to be going with agriculture. And I'm so excited by the kind of people in this room who are, who are delivering that. So the way the day is going to kind of shake out, we've basically got three broad topics. We've got the uh, whole farm management thing, which we're going to kick off with. Then we've got livestock and soil throughout the day, and we've got some fantastic speakers on each of those. And we're going to have some panellists on stage. There's going to be uh, time for questions from the audience as well, and uh, a little bit of interviewing from me up here. So that's the kind of mixture we're into. Now, panel one, which is about farm management, what I'm going to do, if that's all right, is I'm just going to ask uh, the, uh, the, the main speakers to come to the stage now, if that's okay. So that's Alistair Rosemary, uh, Wynn and Jop, and uh, Joe. Have I got that right? Yes, I have. Uh, Wynn and Jop and Joe Trotter, please come to the stage now um, and then get into position uh, while we. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. I think there's enough chairs for you there. Um, so um, while they come up, let's have a. We're going to have a, one of the, the many films, as David said, which do help, help illustrate and actually get us to see out in the field what we're talking about. And the first film we're going to play is about rice. Very much. Rice, one of the world's most important staple foods, integral to global food systems. The crop feeds more than half the world's population every single day. It also provides livelihoods for nearly one billion people involved in rice farming, processing, or trade. Most rice producers are smallholder farmers who are especially vulnerable to the impacts of economic, health, and climate change crises. Rice itself is both a contributor to climate change, as well as being highly vulnerable to its impacts. With an increasing global population and rice consumption set to expand by 25% over the next 25 years, the need to meet this demand sustainably is becoming increasingly clear. So, how can we support farmers to switch to sustainable farming methods and reduce the sustainability footprint of rice? The Sustainable Rice Platform is a global multi-stakeholder alliance established in 2011. It is now an independent membership association and together with its institutional members, SRP aims to transform the global rice sector and to ensure a healthy, inclusive and sustainable future. SRP offers farmer-friendly tools to help drive this transformation of rice supply chains. The SRP Center for Sustainable Rice Cultivation helps farmers boost their yields and incomes whilst protecting the environment. Through the SRP Assurance Scheme, retailers and other market actors can make significant and measurable contributions to corporate sustainability commitments. The OnPack SRP Verified Label guarantees the integrity of sustainably produced rice on retailer shelves and allows consumers to choose sustainable rice that directly benefits small farmers and contributes to protecting our environment. SRP enables the food sector to deliver healthy, high-quality, nutritious and sustainable rice to consumers around the world. Join SRP now and be part of the transformation of the global rice sector by becoming an SRP member, by procuring SRP verified rice, 
by participating in the SRP Assurance Scheme or by supporting a registered SRP project to work with rice farmers. Absolutely fascinating. I'm not sure if there are any rice farmers in the room. But <laughs> it, 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 it is a reminder that everything we do, particularly in the climate change space, also up to a point in the wildlife space, does have a global footprint. This is a global challenge we are facing, and it is very important uh, we bring farmers and producers from across the world on board. And of course, Leaf Mark is very much doing that now with, a, with an international reach. Now, as I mentioned, the first uh, section is about uh, farm management, particularly integrated farm management. And there's a quote here just to kick us off from uh, COP28, that was the, the recent uh, climate summit in Dubai, that agriculture and food systems must urgently adapt and transform in order to respond to the imperatives of climate change. In that context, this panel will be exploring the specific role of integrated farm management in scaling the transition to more sustainable farming. And the idea is they'll have uh, uh, eight minutes or so, definitely no more, each uh, to talk about these, these, these things. And uh, first up, we have uh, someone who will be very familiar to anybody who's been involved with Lee for a while, uh, Dr. Alistair Leek, Director of Policy at the Allison Project, of course, a leaf innovation center. And Alistair has been both a conventional and an organic farmer. Alistair, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tom. Actually, I have to say, given the amount of rainfall, I wish I was growing rice. <laughs> I've been very fortunate to be on this journey uh, with leaf for the last 30 years or so. Some of the slides I'm going to use today were actually put together by Caroline and ourselves to train the basis trainers to train farmers and agronomists in integrated farm management. But I, I want to use them because I want to give you the, an introduction to the journey that, that we have traveled on uh, so you can get some context. And I think a key thing that was already being mentioned is the importance of science in what we're, what we're doing. So um, let's turn the clock back. <clears throat> Where should we start? In the Middle Ages, actually, because the fundamental of what we're talking about here is a good crop rotation. And what the four, Norfolk Four Course Rotation did was have restorative phases uh, intertwined with exploitative phases. And we've extended that concept into integrated farm management. But when I came into the industry, we were growing continuous wheat, or wheat, wheat, rape, or wheat, barley, wheat, barley, and, and not approaching this at all. So that's a fundamental building block of what we're doing. And there is great science behind why that actually works. So the actual concept of integrated management began in 1959 with integrated pest management. And with the advent of LEAF, we moved that into integrated crop management. Then we realized that actually it was bigger than that and we needed to do integrated farm management. And now with the farmer clusters and the environmental farmers groups, we're doing integrated landscape management, which I think is really exciting for dealing with climate change. So here we are, 1959, group of Californian researchers spray some green fly with half a dose of insecticide and get better control. Now that's just not right, because we farmers know that if you don't control a pest population, what you do is double the dose. Because if what is a little bit is good, then more has to be better. <laughs> but these guys showed that a half dose did the trick. And when we dial behind the science in this, it's because it's not just all about the chemical. It's about the biologicals as well. And what we want to do is change the pest to uh, predator ratio. So at the bottom, by using a selective pesticide, we can increase the number, uh, decrease the number of pests, but still maintain a critical number of beneficials. And these are the sort of beneficials that we want to maintain. And having discovered that these are very good, what we want to do next is to increase their numbers. So what we invent is something called a beetle bank. And if you don't know what one of those is, go and look it up. <clears throat> but it's a very simple structure. And I can tell you, our scientists have recorded an average of 1,300 beetles per square meter overwintering in that beetle bank. And they're ready to go out in the springtime into the crop and stop that orange curve of aphids reaching a level where it, da where it damages our crop by suppressing the population. 
We put beetle banks in on our farm 30 years ago, never used a summer aphicide since. And this is the damage that a pesticide can do. <coughs> These are <coughs> pit four traps catching beetles. And the far left there, you've got between 20 and 60 beetles. We then spray, almost eliminate the beetles entirely. It takes 32 days for that population to recover, during which time the next lot of greenfly have flown in, not met an army, and we end up having to spray again. We get on what we call the pesticide treadmill. So Carol and I put these ideas together as to what integrated farm management should be all about. And I'll let you read them for yourselves. Um, <clears throat> yield optimization to me is an important concept because previously we were doing yield maximization. And actually, it's the efficiency of production which is important. And the concept of threshold approaches, which we've just demonstrated very well for insects works, but does it work? quite so well with weeds. So for example, we do want weeds in our crop because they add biodiversity. And this is a crop of organic wheat, which I grew. When you walk into this crop, the hum of insects is incredible. It is absolutely fantastic. For me, this is perfect production. But the following year, you have this problem. Because weeds said shed their seeds, and then you have a massive seed bank to deal with. And there's an old saying, one year's seeding, seven years of weeding. Let me tell you, that old saying is very true. <laughs> this is what we need to do. This is the integrated approach. We let the weeds grow at the side of the field where they have least impact on our yields. We've also done a lot of work within the integrated farm movement on, on, on tillage systems. I'm not going to say much because we've got a soil session later. But for me, again, this is about how it impacts upon pest management. If you look at the top corner of that screen, you'll see a yellow plot and a green plot. The yellow plot has been ploughed and has got barley yellow dwarf virus. And right next to it, you've got a direct drill plot that's got no virus. And the only difference there is the cultivation system. What is causing that? We couldn't work it out because beetles, we know, run all over the place. So they'd have crossed into the plough plot from the direct drill plot. We looked down at the direct drill plot, we did some analysis, and what we found was spiders. So the beetles are our ground troops, the spiders are our paratroops. We know how to make more beetles, how do we make more spiders? <coughs> so we set up an experiment, Zero till, min till, and ploughed, and we suck the insects out of these crops. And this is in a crop of uh, oilseed rape, which you know, many of you know, it's really difficult for us to grow because of cabbage stem flea beetle. Now, look at the results of this. The orange bar is the spiders. So, in the ploughed plot, we've got very few. In the min till, there are more, 10 times more in the zero till plot. Now, the yellow and blue bars are the cabbage stem flea beetle species. Quite a lot in the plough, quite a lot in the min till, none in the zero till. Ladies and gentlemen, we have cracked how to grow oilseed rape without neonicotinoid insecticides. We did the same thing the following year. The spiders didn't turn up for work. And that is a problem with biological control, because unless we can scientifically work out how to manip the benefit, manipulate the beneficial populations, we can't get that benefit. So my final few slides, I really have to bring in the concept of regenerative agriculture because that's what everybody's talking about. But really, regenerative agriculture is integrated farm management focused more on the soil and no more than that. But I'm absolutely delighted that it has captured a great many people to come in and join the movement. What we need to be doing is getting back to more of this, what we call restorative phases of the rotation, where we use fertility building lays, breaks in the arable cropping to improve soil health, fertility, and biodiversity. And I know many farms now are switching over to this approach, which is fantastic. How did I do, Tom? Did I do that in eight? Well, look at that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave.
get uh, food for thought there, very nice and clear. Now I'm going to welcome up uh, Professor Rosemary Collier, who is a Professor of Integrated Test Management from the University of Warwick, and will do illustrate the impact of Integrated Test Management if, uh, when applied at scale. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. Good morning, everybody, and thank you to Leaf for inviting me, and thank you to Alistair for introducing IPM. Um, so, yeah, what I'm going to do is just provide, I think, my perspective on IPM and where we're up to at the moment. So, obviously, integrated pest management, although I guess it, according to Alistair, kicked off IFM, um, it is one component of the IFM circle. Um, there are lots and lots of definitions of um, IPM, and I do change from one definition to other, another from time to time. Um, but I quite like this one, an FAO definition, um, which calls it an ecosystem approach using all available measures with an emphasis on non-chemical practices. Um, people also illustrate IPM in different ways, and sometimes they use a circle, um, like the IFM circle. Um, but I prefer to use the um, IPM pyramid, which is a, a sort of hierarchical approach. And I think my main reason for doing that is that it shows um, us all, uh, researchers and practitioners, how much attention we should spend, pay, to the activities at the bottom of the IPM pyramid, which are about how you um, manage your soil, manage your land, growing resistant varieties, all those sort of things. And I think also you can sort of think about it also as a, as a cake um, in that you need the, the sort of substance of the cake at the bottom, so the things towards the bottom of the IPM pyramid, and then the, the chemical control is hopefully just a small amount of icing on the cake um, where you need it. So I think we're all agreed that the key aim of IPM is to be less reliant on the use of synthetic pesticides um, and approaches may be um, proactive and I would perhaps give organic farming as a, as a sort of extreme example of that, happy to discuss. Um, but I think in this country, at the moment, more often um, it's reactive and quite often it's in response to either a, a loss of pesticides and or resistance to pesticides. And uh, again, also right, rape, cabbage stem flea beetle just been mentioned. Um, and there is a, a, an interesting and quite large amount of activity now being devoted to oilseed rape and sugar beet um, because of the loss of the neonicotinoid insecticides. So in my view, IPM requires careful planning. Um, it needs to be part of the whole IFM, IFM process. And you need to think <coughs> about the implications um, for pests, in this case I mean sort of invertebrate pests, vertebrate pests, diseases and weeds, and how, where and when a crop is grown will influence all of these pests, um, and how each pest is managed will have impacts on others, so it's a, a systems approach. So I think in the UK, um, IPM's most advanced in protected crops, crops like tomato, that's because they're very simple systems, um, few species involved, and if you release a predator, uh, then it, it knows it's got to eat the pest because there's not, nothing else there for it to go at. They're confined, so whatever you release can't get away, and they have controlled environmental conditions, so no extreme weather events. Um, and they're also high-value crops, so people can invest quite a lot in sophisticated systems of pest management, to me, the area I work in, outdoor vegetables and salads, is the ultimate challenge, um, and that's the high quality requirements uh, from retailers and consumers, um, the high inputs that need to be applied um, to actually get that high quality, which includes obviously pesticides, fertilizers, water, and management time. Um, there's no containment, no environmental control, and with these crops, no time to build up an ecosystem as there is in orchards. Um, and there's huge potential for loss and waste. 
And of course, the problem with most pests and pathogens is that they move around. Um, you don't know where they're coming from, and you don't know how many will arrive and when they'll arrive. And so forward planning is vital so that you're prepared, um, and monitoring and forecasting systems can help to support uh, decision making, which involves uh, the collection and use of data. A group of projects that I've been involved recently has been looking at the management of the bean seed fly, um, which is a pest of several crops, but particularly onions and beans. Um, and I guess to a certain extent that is a reactive approach because some of the insecticidal controls have, have disappeared. And a number of us have been working on different projects. And in fact, I'm pleased to say we've actually, I think, addressed every layer in the IPM uh, pyramid. Um, we've built up certainly a greater understanding of the pest and how to manage it. Um, I don't think we've reached the final solution yet. Um, but one thing to flag up is that bean sea fly and other pests, diseases and weeds, you need to think of them in terms of, of the whole crop management. Uh, and for example, with bean sea flies, some cover crops may actually be a source of bean sea fly. This work and other things that we do at Warwick led us to um, look at the, the sort of technology that's available and advancing. And one thing we've done with bean seed fly and also with migrant moths like diamondback moth is look at the use of, of so-called smart traps, which are basically um, traps that have a, a camera in them that takes an image uh, once a day or more often and sends it to a website so that you can look at your traps uh, whenever you want in the comfort of your own office. Um, and this is particularly useful for things that where you need to monitor very regularly and things that will arrive suddenly, like migrant moths. And it's certainly shown me that, that networks of these traps that perhaps several businesses could um, share could be very powerful. So I guess that's, again, thinking about things on a landscape scale uh, rather than on individual farm scale. So just a few final thoughts. Um, first of all, in my, in my opinion, we're far from having sufficient IPM tools to manage crops, uh, most crops effectively. So, and I would say this, wouldn't I, more R&D needed. And the top two on my list at the moment are identification of useful crop traits, so plant breeding, um, and to, to me, that, that is what we really need to speed up, is the development of, of varieties that will deal with all our future challenging situations. And then I think there's a lot more to learn about diversity within cropping systems at a range of scales, um, and we need to have a rethink about this. So I guess from a crop production point of view, I think true IPM um, is probably achievable, but not instantly. However, um, I'm convinced that even with effective IPM, um, we are not going to reverse um, the loss of nature and recover nature. And I think that needs even more imaginative farm thinking and farmers are essential to that. So thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Rosemary, uh, for that. And now we are going to move on to a bit of the international perspective, indeed about rice, with uh, Wynne Ellis and Jock Blom from the Sustainable Rice Platform, who delivered the film earlier. And uh, we're gonna, they're going to be talking about decarbonisations and how to scale adoption. Thank you very much, gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, and good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here, and we are really honoured to have a, a place at this table. Although, as we heard, um, there are relatively few rice farmers in, in this room, I'd like you to think of what LEAF is doing as a, if you like, a test case of what can be achieved um, on the global scale in driving a transformation on a global scale. Um, uh, this is going to be a double act. I'm going to be joined shortly by my colleague, Yop, who is going to talk about how sustainability is being perceived um, at downstream level in Europe and in the UK. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about how we are um, uh, working uh, in the rice sector 
to catalyze a global transformation. It's quite an ambition, you have to agree. Um, and I'd like to start by perhaps setting the scene, and, and, and I, um, Tom also mentioned this earlier, um, what we are doing is a microcosm of what is required at a global scale. The theme of today's um, conference has never been more relevant, where we are seeing increasing tensions between environment, agriculture, and climate, all of them reaching their boundaries um, and impacting upon each other. There was a great report in The, um, uh, in the Guardian a couple of days ago um, reporting a study, the findings of a study by the Food System Economics Commission, um, uh, where, in contrast to you know, those tensions that we're seeing all the time at retailer level, where you're saying there's a, there's a, there's a tension between uh, the business demands and sustainability, and we can't do sustainability because you know, it's just not viable. To contrast that with what we're seeing at the macro level here, where this report says that we can expect a benefits of up to 7.9 trillion pounds as a result of transforming the global food system. And that the cost of doing so would only amount to something like 0 0.2 to 0.4% of global GDP. So that sounds to me like good business. Um, the proposed actions um, and recommendations of the study will probably surprise no one. Um, but um, really, we feel, we feel very strongly that um, we support these recommendations, obviously. Um, uh, we're going to focus now, of course, on integrated farming systems as an approach to stabilize and create more resilient farm systems, uh, landscape-based systems, um, and uh, away from monocultures and so on. Um, if we are talking about global food systems, you cannot avoid a conversation about rice. You've seen the video. I'm going to skip through quite quickly these next few slides. But you can see that it feeds or otherwise supports around about half the world's population. And many of those um, 3.5 billion people are living at or below the poverty line. So it's an incredibly sensitive crop that touches upon at least five or six of the sustainable development goals. So it's a really important intervention point if we can do something with rice. Um, it is um, also worth noting that, you know, although we don't eat very much rice in, in UK, it's something like six or seven kilograms per capita per year, compared with, say, 200, 200 kilo, uh, kilograms per year in, in my case. I'm based in Bangkok. Um, it's a billion-dollar industry in UK. It supports a lot of jobs. Um, it is, you know, it contributes uh, you know, a billion dollars, a billion pounds to the British economy, and it's an important part of our cuisine today. Um, as you saw in the video, it's both a culprit and victim of climate change. Multiple impacts of climate change are affecting particularly the deltaic areas of South and Southeast Asia, all the way across to east, uh, the east coast of China, um, from ri raising, uh, rising sea levels, rising temperatures, uh, intrusion of salinity, uh, salinity is, in, is, in, is intruding into the Mekong River up to 100 kilometers right now. So it's a really serious uh, challenge to rice production in these areas where nothing much else can be, can be grown, actually. So um, we must look at rice as both a contributor and a victim of climate change. It's also, strange as it may seem, a forgotten crop. Until, um, until the 80s, we had sustained, voluntary sustainability standards for many, many high-profile crops, such as coffee, cocoa, oil palm, and so on, but not rice. Uh, so three decades later, you know, as a south, mainly south-to-south -south traded crop, um, it became obvious that we needed to do something about, about you know, how, how do you define sustainability in the context of rice. And it's amazing to me, you know, looking at this, that this happened because the sustainability footprint of rice however you might want to measure it, dwarfs that of other high-profile crops, um, as you see here, like, like oil, palm, and cocoa. So it was time, really, to move from high-profile crops to look at high-impact crops, such as rice. And that's really what the, um, that's really what the birth of the sustainability uh, symbol rice platform was, was, uh, came, came, came from. Um, forgotten, that is, until probably COP28, now, Paris um, was a really important methane moment, as we know. And this, is, um, this slide wins no prizes for, our tip for um, graphic design, I know, and I apologize. <laughs> um, but it came to me from the Global Environment Facility. 
um, showing, the, showing the projects that are involving rice in the Global Environment Facility. I don't know how many of you are familiar with GHF, but it's a five and a half billion dollar fund, multilateral fund, um, that goes to um, uh, impact programs in agriculture and environment and deforestation. But what, what's important here is to, if you look at the, um, the third column from the right, we are, have just ended the seventh replenishment of that fund, and there were precisely two projects involving rice. Um, both of them in, we're involved in. Now, in the, we're now into the eighth replenishment round, and as you see here, you can see just how much things have changed since COP28. And many of these projects are actually in Africa, where we are seeing um, the fastest global growth in consumption, production, and importing of rice. So it's a really important um, geography to be paying attention. So this reflects a global shift in both the food systems dialogue and also the climate dialogue. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So SRP really is a not-for-profit organization. Um, it's a multi-stakeholder grouping. Um, we've done a lot of work to bring in civil society actors uh, you know, to, to ensure that the tools we produce are robust and are fit for purpose to support small farmers. Um, these are some of the tools you see here. We launched our first, our, our voluntary sustainability standard in 2015. We're about to relaunch it in the summer uh, with an additional carbon neutral module. It'll be an insetting module to, to, for, to, to drive um, scope three, abatement of scope three emissions in value chains. Um, what about the impacts? So farmers who are adopting SRP in Thailand, in Vietnam, Cambodia, and India have seen um, a number of different benefits and a number of different synergies as well. So net incomes are increasing, mainly not through premiums, not through you know, the largesse of the supply chain actors, but because they are saving on pesticide inputs. And that's really important because it represents an intrinsic incentive for farmers that doesn't depend on the kindness of supply chain actors, the millers, and so on. It's not market distorting. And most importantly for, for us, as, 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 you know, from a policy perspective, it cuts emissions through alternate use of techniques like alternate wetting and drying by up to 50%. So these are important uh, findings that happened across a bunch of different geographies uh, around, Asia, around Asia and South, South and Southeast Asia. Now, coming to the end here, um, upscaling. We've got these tools. We've got the standard. How do we deploy them? Um, we are working, we set up a consortium of six organizations, you can see at the bottom of the slide here, uh, with some development agencies, basically to capture funding through um, large multilateral uh, instruments such as the Green Climate Fund and the Global Environment Facility to drive landscape level approaches to transforming rice production. So far we've secured something, actually it's more than that, it's around 60 million right now um, for projects in, in South and Southeast Asia. One last project I wanted to, to mention is that we are also in the process of establishing a global, um, a global rice fund. These will be blended finance facilities with different, uh, to respond to um, different appetites for risk, different ticket sizes for farmers uh, facing financing gaps. So that's something I think which will make a significant difference through the engagement of financial actors. Um, yeah, we launched in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic our assurance scheme. It's enjoyed considerable traction in, in, in uh, uh, Euro European Union member states. Basically, it helps to de-risk supply chains, enhance transparency, and also give consumers, um, empower consumers to make a difference to small farmers through their purchasing decisions. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Yop, who will take the floor and talk, talk about how downstream actors are responding to these measures. Thanks, Yop. Thank you so much. So those were the eight minutes of win. Now I will take my eight minutes. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, my name is Joplom. I have 25 years of experience happen. in sustainability, sustainable trade, sustainable partnership. I had 45 years of experience in playing soccer until I got too fat and too slow and too heavy. So they caught me last year. So I see you in the gym uh, during lunchtime. Uh, so my uh, role was uh, within uh, SRP in 2020. They introduced the SRP verified label to introduce it into Europe and to see the appetite for that. 
And instead of all the millions that uh, Wynn just mentioned, there was no marketing budget to do so. So for me to do the trick, to promote SAP Verified on the European markets. And um, the first thing was like, who of you was aware of this immense impact in the rice industry? I, th I think there are only a few maybe that know the immense impact in, uh, in the rice industry. So that was actually my first job, you know, to create awareness around this impact and, and, and do it also in a positive way. Then we also said like, okay, if we don't have like marketing budget, let's tr transform our members into ambassadors. Because if we can unite and optimize the marketing potential of 110 members and their reach and their marketing channels, then we can reach out to millions of millions of people. So that was the second thing we did. And then we looked, okay, where to get started? So we thought like, okay, let's focus on Northern Western Europe because there's the biggest sensibility about corporate social responsibility, sustainability amongst the consumers. And then we also said, okay, let's start at the end of the value chain because if actually retail is going to shift to sustainable rise, then they push demand through the entire uh, value chain and we immediately reach out we have availability to thousands and thousands of shops and millions and millions of consumers so we started to contact top 50 retail in Europe and also um, um, with the ID like if they they only have to put in like seven words into their tender requirements get us SRP verified rice so it's a very simple step that the retailer has to make, only put it in their tender requirements. So we were lucky enough to uh, immediately contract Kaufland and Lidl, which is part of the Schwarzgruppe, which is actually the biggest retailer in Europe. And what was also nice about them is that Lidl wants to make sustainable food available and affordable to all. So you always have this discussion about price with sustainability and with organic. But by contracting Lidl, we immediately made this statement that it doesn't have to be more expensive. You know, it can be available for everyone. So there was a big breakthrough. Then also Albert Heijn, who was already a long-standing member in the Netherlands, changed to sustainable rice. We had the biggest retailer in Scandinavia, changed to sustainable rice. And as we say it in Dutch, if one sheep crosses the dam, the herd will follow. And that's really what you also saw happening. So in the Netherlands, we also see now 90% of the retail is shifting from conventional rice to sustainable rice. It's a massive breakthrough. And we also say, because uh, that it doesn't have to be, uh, it should be non-competitive. You know, it should become the norm by 2050, like, like uh, 2025, just like cocoa, like coffee, like bananas, uh, sustainable rice should become the norm and it should be not competitive. So that's uh, what we did. Uh, we increased also consumer awareness, also with, with like a fancy word, create some FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. So this is also highlighting like a press article uh, accompanied with our campaign that sustainable rice is conquering European supermarkets or Dutch supermarkets and consumers. So we really created this momentum for sustainable rice in the Netherlands now, in Germany now, and in, in, uh, in Scandinavia, and ho hopefully also after this LEAF conference in the UK as well. I know that there are some retailers in the room, and we also use this opportunity to have a ro roadshow and interesting insights actually in, in, in the market uh, over the last couple of days. So also a bit like what David already mentioned, you know, it's not a membership, it's a movement. You really have to do it together and you have to do it in a holistic, integrated way. You know, constantly be open to, uh, to, to new uh, changes in the, and trends in the industry. So it's, not a, it's, it's much more than a label, you know, it's lobbying, it's advocacy. It's now we are going into scope three, as uh, Wynne already mentioned. We are looking how compliant are we with upcoming uh, legislation in Europe, which becomes more stricter and stricter. So we really take all this step uh, together with the industry, for the industry, and we walk the path and the sustainable journey together. And I think that is really important. And that's also where we see the overlap with uh, LEAF. So thank you so much.
straight on to James Bradshaw, who is head of technical produce at Hortelga Echoes, which is uh, one of the most quirky consulting firms in the market and which drives the brand of Hortelga. Thank you, Tom. Morning, all. Hope all is well. Um, I'm absolutely passionate about farming, um, and I've yeah, grown up from it from a very young age. And so working with Leaf over the last 18 months is an absolute privilege to, to be going uh, you know, global. So I thought it was worth just contextualizing and how Leaf fits into our overall planet plan uh, within Tesco. So really clear, six key pillars of which net zero by 2050 and 65% um, of healthy sales. And LEAF absolutely comes into improving our products within the uh, produce uh, industry and protecting nature. So why LEAF? So 18 months ago, um, we did a full review to understand the market and absolutely the values and the integrity that LEAF has um, was, were absolutely aligned to our um, ambition of going global and driving sustainability across uh, the supply base globally. It's been a journey, well recognized in the UK, and therefore the LEAF team wanted to go on that journey with us and understand some of the challenges for going global across uh, the, you know, the various different continents. And driving the environmental improvements with growers that aren't currently doing it and that recognizing that they are doing it and how we then communicate to customers. And ultimately, Leaf, the Leaf logo is helping customers make a better choice and knowing that their produce is being sourced and grown in a sustainable, sustainable way. Just in terms of the scale uh, of the program that we're embarking on together, we're working with over 10,000 growers globally from South Africa to uh, Americas to Europe, and they've got all various different challenges. Um, I'm pleased to say the UK, we've now done that, and some of the learnings that we're taking on further afield. Collaboration has been absolutely critical within this project, um, and it's been at the heart of it. And good examples of, of with what LEAF are currently doing is you know, partnering with Caesar in South Africa to grant partial equivalents and as allowing to remove that duplication and cost. Building the auditor capability, by no means you know, 10,000 growers, we need the credible auditors to um, adhere to the high standards that LEAF does. Interpreting the different languages of growers, um, you know, uh, whether that's in Peru, Chile, etc., all very, very different. Um, and therefore, listening, listening to growers that are small, small holders. One hectare of beans in Kenya versus a large scale farmer in the UK or Spain or South Africa has very different requirements. And how are we adopting the LEAF approach um, to, to, to fit their needs? So, look, given the climatic challenges we've all been experiencing. LEAF absolutely plays that role in building a resilient supply chain for the future and gives customers and shareholders confidence that we are protecting the planet uh, for the future. Just to bring it alive, I thought it was just, a, just one example of many where um, a grower in, in Italy um, source where we saw stone fruit and, and berries with our partners DPS of the complexity. So eight growers, 218 farms, and they've all been accredited last year, which is a phenomenal uh, achievement. Um, and by doing that, engagement's been critical, early adoption, whether that's been webinars with the LEAF team, um, whether that's been on-site visits, whether that's been rarely had phone calls. So absolutely passionate. And they certainly haven't seen that as a cost. They've seen that as doing what's right uh, for a business and driving their overall impact uh, of, of their farm. So 
So I touched on engagement and some of the themes that I've written down of, of why growers are wanting to come on that journey. Climatic challenges, and I think Philip mentioned it earlier, that whole balance of risk versus reward is ever, ever increasingly being discussed within the produce industry or farming as a, as a general. Um, leaving future generations, myself including my grandfather always said, we're only custodians of the land and then we pass it on to the next generation. We all want to do that, absolutely. And there's a common theme, whether that is landowners or whether we're renting the land. Growth mindset. We can't keep doing the same thing. Mentioned earlier, we can't keep putting wheat after wheat, rape after rape. We've got to be challenging ourselves. Growers are challenging themselves. And certainly as I've had the opportunity over the last five or six years of traveling the world, meeting some very entrepreneurial businesses, um, innovative, but more importantly, resilient in the world that we're in. And customer expectations. Customers are expecting that we are uh, producing product the right way, looking after the environment, um, as well as then sourcing it sustainably. So uh, after our ambition as aimed by 2025 to have 10,000 growers certified, the wealth of data is going to be phenomenal. And therefore, the partnership is going to allow us to draw that baseline to drive continuous improvement and build, build on the success that's already there today. To support that, we need to recognize all the good work that growers are doing. And therefore, the journey that we're on around communicating to customers, and it is a journey, um, and educating them. And this is just a few examples of how we're doing that. So if you go into, you'll see all of our British produce now, uh, as well as other retailers have got the LEAF logo on. Uh, some of the new stores, fresh transformational stores, we're now communicating holistically in the produce department. So as you draw in, they know that all of their produce will be like, um, certified to LEAF. Healthy recipes and engaging with LEAF in Tesco magazines or whether that's online. And then stakeholder comms in terms of our PLC website. I'm sure that will evolve as we bring the customer on, on, on the journey of what LEAF uh, stands for. So, in summary, we're taking that leadership position. Sustainability will absolutely continue to be a priority for customers and for shareholders. Supply chain, you know, are going to be continuing to drive improvement, and that's through demonstration farms, as well as then the use of agri-tech and ever increasingly becoming um, more useful. And it's also allowing us to showcase some of the existing work that, that uh, growers and suppliers are doing to produce healthy produce. Thank you, Tom. James, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, James, thank you very much indeed. I'm also going to invite uh, Tom Green from Leafmark and Tom Parker, who's the head of Di Customer Digital Solutions at Frontier Agriculture. Uh, somewhere, uh, is there a chair short? There's one there. I'm gonna, not going to offer to carry it around. Um, uh, right, we, need, we are, I'm afraid, uh, running over, which is often the curse, but there we go. So... Uh, Please start thinking of questions, and uh, those who are responding to questions, if you could keep your answers quite punchy, uh, that would be absolutely uh, appreciated. So thank you very much. I'm just going to take a little bit of a prerogative, because lots of questions from me. Um, uh, uh, James, uh, James from Tesco's, James Bradshaw, um, I was really interested by what you said about data at the end there. I mean, is, is there going to be some really interesting benchmarking? Let, let's take sort of nature on some of these you know, farms across the world. Will you be able to say, you know, this was the amount of biodiversity, you know, b when we took them on, i.e. before they'd started within and the leaf mark, and this is the level now, whether that level is two or three years, five years' time? Is that the sort of thing you can hope to show? Absolutely. And, and that's, the, that's the journey that we're on with the UK, some of our, you know, potato growers, of where they've now got a base mark and how we're then continuing to drive that performance. Um, because that's the sort of thing that will really communicate to, to, to customers, which is obviously good for you, but good, good for Leaf. If you can say, we used to have you know, X million bugs or X million, whatever you measure it, and now we've got 
you know, 10x um, would be uh, real, real evidence of that. Uh, please, uh, those of you in the room, do start to put your hand up if you have a question. We have uh, mics being brought around by Callum and Megan. So, yes, let's take this, uh, yeah, this gentleman right. Hello. Uh, yes, right here. And once again, questions quite punchy to and preferably to one person rather than six. Hello, Richard Whitlock. <laughs> um, UK food, second cheapest in the world, about 8.6% of disposable income spent by consumers. We've got uh, farmers on strike in Europe about the green criteria. There's a rebellion in the UK over the Red Tractor Greener initiative. We've got two things pulling in, this, in different directions. Farmers, of course, want to look after the environment, but they want a viable business as well. How do we deliver on that when we've even got record consumers relying on food banks? And do you have a particular gentle, uh, person, uh, sorry, a lady or gentleman you'd like to answer that? Or am I oh, going to choose for you? you? I'll leave it to you, Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I am going to start with James Bradshaw, actually, because there is, in effect, underlying the question is, can we do all this while uh, you and others insist that food is cheap? Look, I think um, I was waiting for that question. <laughs> um, look, it's a competitive environment. Um, and I, I think we, you're absolutely right. The, we are wanting to do the right thing for, far, for farmers. I think, not answering it directly, but collaboration, clear planning, being closer to growers, to having those um, strategic plans together, uh, and transparency across the model, depending on what that is, is absolutely critical to make sure that the, it's sustainable throughout the whole chain. And uh, I'm going to bring on uh, Tom, Tom Green on this one as well, um, who's uh, Leafmark, uh, Leafmark Chair and CEO. Um, do you think this is all achievable with, a, with the constant reduction of the amount of, or the proportion, I should say, of income we spend on food? Well, I think uh, we've got so much to be proud of in Britain uh, in relation to our food industry. And the, the collective effect of our retailers has been extraordinarily good for consumers who enjoy quality, range, uh, and, and price. But the thing I think we need to focus on particularly today is the fact that farming more sustainably is not necessarily farming more expensively. In fact, go just recently I stood on a farm in uh, Hampshire and, con uh, and, and commented on the quality of the crop I was looking at and discovered that this was a crop that uh, it was a crop of wheat that had been direct drilled with a beautiful um, continuously green cover crop into which it had been uh, drilled. And the gentleman who was responsible explained to me that this was the seventh year that he hadn't been ploughing on that particular farm. Mm -hmm. And that one of the measures that he used to demonstrate the quality of that outcome was that his diesel usage per hectare had gone down from over 100 litres per hectare to somewhere around 50 litres a hectare. He also referred to reduced nitrogen and reduced herbicide and insecticide use. He's a leafmark farmer, and that is a great example of the um, uh, framework that Leaf offers, because what he d demonstrated there in that one little case study was something that is replicable, repeatable, and scalable. And uh, over many crops, that could be done. So uh, I, I think, you know, thank you, Tesco's, for helping us uh, enjoy great quality, low-cost food, but the farmers have the opportunity to, um, I think, enjoy that, but also farm more sustainably and more economically. Thank you very much indeed. We'll come to a question there in a moment, but just something I wanted to ask uh, either uh, Wynne or Yop. Um, one of the th things I've heard to try and reduce the uh, climate impact of rice is to grow it dry, because um, paddy fields are the huge emitter of, of, of methane. Is that something is growing dry rice and the varieties you need to then do that, is that in your, in your, your stable, so to speak? Um, very much so. Um, I, as, I, as I mentioned, alternate wetting and drying uh, during the season is a well-established way of reducing water use and emissions. Am I on here? Yeah. Um, however, uh, I think you're referring to the, um, actual uh, aerobic rice, mm. which is um, being developed by organiza research organizations such, a, such as the International Rice Research Institute, and particularly in China, I don't think it's well, it's well established yet. I mean, I, there are varieties which are amenable to that. But clearly, this will be an enormous breakthrough when stable yields can be achieved 
by those dry rice varieties. So, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. Hi, yes, it's Annabelle Cox from Tensei. My question to Win and Job. First of all, congratulations on your brilliant strategy to get your SRP into the consumer awareness. I know that would have been complicated. My second, but my question is, how and who were the certification board that actually gave you the initial certification, and how long did it take? Okay, well, we... Thank you. Um, really you just raise question. your mic up your lapel a bit. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. As a multi-stakeholder organization, it's, 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 it requires time to bring those, those different perspectives into the room and achieve consensus. And I remember, I, I have a background in, in integrated pest management myself, and so I, I felt in a, in a unique position to be able to act as referee between Bayer and Oxfam in that conversation when we were looking at the criteria for pest management within the SRP standard. So it took about 18 months for the original standard to be developed and released. Um, it's been revised twice since then. Um, and then, of course, the assurance scheme itself took quite a while to develop, again, about 18 months, so that we could uh, establish uh, robust procedures that follow the ICL Alliance codes of practice. We are an ICL community member. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it takes quite a while if you, if you are engaging in this um, um, within a multi-stakeholder context. I don't know if that's quite answered your question. Okay, so, so the SRP itself is the standard owner, so, so we basically own the standard, but it is audited by independent, um, independent auditors. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. We'll just get a microphone over, over there to Anthony, but why, while it's on the way, um, uh, to, Tom Parker at Frontier Agriculture, I should give you a chance to come in, otherwise we're going to be cut off here. I mean, I, I just almost want to start with a bit of, bit of a question, really. It says... Customer digital solutions, uh, what does that mean and how does it fit into this debate? Um, thank you, Tom. It fits into this debate because it enables um, what Mr. Work Worklock just asked there, which is about delivering value back to the grower. Um, in, in Frontier, so we sit along the supply chain between the consumer being the, the, um, the bakery, the, the brewer, the, the food ingredient manufacturer, and the farmer at the other end of that. Um, Farmers need to derive value at the growing end, and it's our position to um, elicit that, to develop the contracts that have got premiums within them to put financial value back, to develop the tools that give growers um, insight into what they're doing. We, we've already heard the word, the awful word, data, cropping up <laughs> um, a lot today. No farmer ever woke up thinking about data. Well, maybe they should. Maybe they should, but let's cross that bridge another day. Yeah. What, they, what we need to wake up thinking about is insights, efficient businesses, and of course profitable businesses, because there is no more significant component to sustainability than being profitable. An unprofitable business will not be sustainable, and Frontier is there to give those tools, advice, and insight to growers to, to keep that supply chain sustainable. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yep, yeah. Anthony Snell, um, fruit grower from Herefordshire. Um, obviously, we need to import crops but we're very focused on british and british is best okay but uh, i just uh, there hasn't been any talk at all about the unsustainability of importing due to the huge <coughs> amount of, you know transport and things like that so i think it's important that we talk a little bit about the sustainability of bringing uh, fruit and vegetables from right the other side of the world. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'll just take a little bit of that. I mean, it, it is basically terrible if you fly it in, not so bad if you ship it in, is, is, is broadly the, the answer there. But I was interested to put a little bit of this to Alistair, because you talked about how it, the drive has moved from maximization to optimization, but it is still important to take up Anthony's challenge, isn't it, that we don't, that the changes that IFM brings don't end up demanding more imports from around the world at unknown environmental impact. Well, that is a particular challenge and one that I've been involved in for some time. I'm responsible for burning about 2,000 tonnes of coal a year to heat 
plus house tomatoes in the UK when the amount of diesel to bring them up from Spain is considerably less. And this is the reason why IFM is so important, because you cannot look at individual compartments and try to compare them. You ha really do have to look across the whole piece in, in, in what you're doing. Um, you know, I, I presented a case there for a more, a more restorative approach to how we grow crops. And on every environmental level, that is better, except in terms of the amount of gross food we produce which inevitably goes down and has to come from, from somewhere else. Inevitably. Inevitably, yes. Really? Well, if I'm going from a rotation which is purely exploitative, using uh, petrochemical inputs to drive it into a more biological system, then I'm going to be producing less gross output. Hmm. I've heard some regenerative farmers say there's a dip, but then you can bring things back uh, and, and indeed sustain. They may be talking about the yield per hectare, not the total gross yield output of the farm. Because you wouldn't be yeah. producing every, every year, I, every I can, field. I, I have grown nine tonne crops of organic wheat. I only do it one in eight years. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does anybody else just want to pick up that sort of production or input thing? I saw, saw some nods around or thoughts around. Does anybody else want to pick it up? Yeah, James, briefly, please. I was, I was just going to say, look, the climatic challenges that we're all facing, we can't, uh, we can't have our eggs in one basket. And therefore, from a resilience perspective of supply, um, we've got to look more broadly, whether that's in the UK, you know, growing carrots from Scotland all the way down to the, down, uh, down to the south coast. We have to, we have to spread our... Um, Sources. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to ask Rosemary something as well. Are we, are we really talking when it comes to a lot of practices on the farm, but particularly when it comes to pest managing, is, is it as simple really as moving from chemistry towards biology? It's not, it's not simple. It's but, it, but is that an overall trend? Is that a fair description of the trend? Yeah, for, but yes, I guess bi biological in the broadest sense in that, as I said in my talk, I I think there is so much more to be done about about breeding crops that that have greater resilience. Well, that was actually my yeah. next question yeah. because it, it, it's something I've learned in recent years that crops, particularly the way they're bred and indeed judged, they're judged in very high chemical input environments, which I think is a story in itself. Is this the same with with you saying we should breed crops that would work well with biological systems rather than chemical control systems? Is that a the point? Absolutely, yeah. Right. There are, I mean, at, at Warwick, we lead a project called the Vegetable Genetic Improvement Network, funded by DEFRA, uh, where we are looking for, yeah, these, these traits that will function better in, in sometimes low input systems. And it might also not be, in terms of pest and disease resistance, complete resistance, which can sometimes break down, as does, as does pesticide mm -hmm. um, resistance, but, but might be something that you combine, for example, with, with biological control to achieve the same end, but with several components. And are you getting support from the industry, from the breeders? From, are you getting enough to, to drive in this direction? Uh, yeah, we get, we get support buy-in from the, the breeders and from the industry, but the whole thing just isn't going fast enough. And, you know, you've got a, probably for a new variety, you've got I don't know, 12, 13 year lead in time, and we just Oof. need to do much, much more of it. 12 or 13 years. Christmas. My goodness. Uh, yes, ladies. Thank you. I have a question about rice. Thank you. Elaine Hindle from the British Nutrition Foundation. Could you just lift the mic Sorry. up a bit, please? Is that better? Um, sustainability and nutrition obviously go absolutely hand in hand. Could you say anything about how, when you're looking at rice sustainability, you're also thinking about biofortification, and how we might improve the micronutrient quality of rice. Thank you. Are you, are you hinting at golden rice and GM golden rice? Or well, I, I wasn't hinting, but I'd be really interested in hear, hearing the views. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, really interesting question. Again, um, uh, the uh, um, what's it called? The game, is it? I think the game has just joined SRP um, as an organization um, promoting, bio fort bio promoting fortification. And as you know, there are two types of fortification. There's, there's biofortification, where you breed, you breed the um, levels of zinc and selenium and so on into the grain. Or you can have industrial fortification, where the grain is effectively ground up, and you know, the iron and the, and the minerals are added, and the vitamins are added to the grain, and it's reconstituted. 
Um, both of those are legitimate and, and being promoted in, by different governments around, around the region. IRI is doing a lot of work on, on uh, high zinc, high selenium, high iron and vitamin A. Uh, golden rice is a particularly contentious one because there are, um, there's talk about it not being you know, sufficiently stable or available even um, to prevent uh, the stunting of two million children a year, which is what it's advertised to do. So it might not quite do what it, what it says on the tin yet. But I think it's, a, it's an absolutely important um, uh, process considering that rice, uh, rice is the staple for so many millions of poor people. You know, so to improve the nutritional status um, of, of those people is critical for poverty alleviation. Thank you very much, Dee. We're going to have to take the last question. Nice and punchy, if you would, sir. Thank you. Uh, Andrew from Soil Sequest in Australia. My question also for you, when I'm just wondering if um, the SRP have had any um, insight into the hyper-rooting and semi-perennial varieties of rice being bred by Dr Abed Chaudhry in Bangladesh, the soil carbon and productivity gains from that? So just to be clear, this is rice that you don't take out the plant every year. It's, it's, it's a rice bush. <laughs> Correct, yeah. I think up to four yields, okay. four, four harvests from each crop. Interesting. I, I can't answer that question. I know just as there is with, with the, the question on dry rice, uh, dry land rice, um, there is a lot of research work going on in Bangladesh. has been particularly um, effective in, in translating or in, in bringing in varieties of parent lines from the International Rice Institute into Bangladesh and incorporating them into their national breeding programs. So you get both submergence and um, drought tolerance built, traits built into the same variety. And that's been quite effective. But you're talking about ratoon rice and semi-perennial rice, which will also, well, certainly it will have you know, major advantages in terms of reducing the need for, uh, the need for uh, cultivation at the, you know, during the season. Um, my understanding is that is that yields drop off after four years, and you and you do need to replant. So it's not a not a permanently perennial solution. They, they, it is a semi perennial solution, um, available in certain niches. But definitely, um, I would like to see that spreading um, quite a lot, uh, depending on local adaptations. Well, thank you very much indeed. Who knew there'd be so many questions about rice? It clearly shows that the <laughs> yeah. designers of this, this panel this day were clearly onto an untapped need, an untapped interest. Uh, but for now, uh, please put your hands together and thank uh, Alistair, Rosemary, Wynne, Yacht, uh, James, uh, Tom and Tom. And if I could ask this uh, panel to... Uh, uh, gently leave the floor and hand over the, your microphones to the next people uh, with the help of Fred here, the, the next, uh, next panel who are going to be coming up. Um, and perhaps while that happens, if we're not blocking the screen too much, we could have our, our next film, which is a Waitrose film, which is looking at the work of uh, regenerative agriculture at Leckford. And please, while that film is going on, if... Uh, uh, Andrew, uh, Tamsin, uh, Finlow and uh, Jude uh, could take the stage. That would be great. Thank you very much. Inspired by nature, at the Waitrose Leckford Farm, so are we. That means protecting it and achieving our net zero ambitions by 2035. Relying less on harmful to the atmosphere fossil fuels like diesel but still be able to fuel our farm. How are we doing this? By using the farm's organic waste and cow manure. It releases climate-challenging methane gas that we're turning into a renewable, low-carbon biofuel. Enough that it can help us reduce our farm's carbon footprint by as much as 1,300 tonnes a year. And it all happens under this gigantic balloon-covered pit Bigger than two and a half Olympic-sized swimming pools. Better still, the slurry that's left behind is turned into a natural and rich fertilizer that's spread back onto the soil, using nature to power a more sustainable, cleaner energy future. Neat, huh? Why did you get your bearings off of that film? Who? <laughs> Me. <laughs> Disorientated. Um, Thank you very much. If I could just uh, 
just coming up to the to the stage, so we'll uh, let people uh, let people take their seats. But I think Andrew is with us, aren't you? And you're mic'd up, and you are raring to go. So um, this panel, I'll just sort of put an introduction into it. Um, we're talking uh, largely about uh, livestock and its position in sustainable farming. And this really came from a challenge from Mike Berners-Lee, who at the last conference um, said that we should be reducing the overall number of livestock in the global food system. And I have to say that's not an outlying idea. Uh, and this year we'll be, uh, we'll be asking what if is the role for livestock, some might say, if any, in a global sustainable food system. And if so, what will this climate-friendly livestock sector look like in practice? And uh, same uh, system as before, eight minutes per speaker. And we're going to start off with Andrew Hode, who is um, head of uh, head uh, head of the Lakeford Estate, who I think we just saw in that film. Is that, is that correct? I think we had a brief glimpse of your good self. Um, head of the Lakeford Estate, whose aim is to showcase... Uh, their long-term association with leaf work on regenerative farming and their biomethane facility, Andrew. We good? All right. Uh, morning. Yes, we're still morning. Um, yes, so I'm Andrew Hode and um, head of Leckford Estate. Okay, um, so in eight minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the role of uh, Waitrose uh, around sustainable livestock systems and also Leckford. Well, actually, I'm not going to do that justice in eight minutes. So I will give you a very quick introduction into uh, Waitrose and um, then talk more about what we're doing on our own farm, because I think it's quite relevant to today's conversation. Um, a little bit about Leckford. Um, so Leckford um, has been in the partnership for uh, 95 years. Um, we have been a leaf demonstration farm for the last uh, 20 years, and we, amongst other things on the estate, um, farm an arable um, beef system with some top fruit and two vineyards. Um, we are located in the very beautiful Test Valley in Hampshire, and that's relevant because uh, we have the very famous River Test Chalk Stream that runs through the centre of the estate. And so my point really to make is that we really do understand the wider responsibilities of land ownership and protecting the environment. Um, so very briefly um, about Waitrose and uh, sustainable livestock systems. And my apologies to Waitrose colleagues that may or may not be listening uh, because I really can't distill this down into one slide. Um, so look, Waitrose has um, a really strong focus on sustainable food systems across everything we buy. And um, specific, um, and actually, look, we've done that for decades. Um, so specifically in terms of um, livestock systems, uh, look, we have a really strong welfare focus. That is relevant because we really do drive for um, natural systems as possible so that we are really providing um, environmental and social enrichment for um, our livestock. So if you take the context of um, beef, as part of our beef system, in terms of the protocols that we have, we ask that our beef have access to grazing for at least one season. Uh, we have dedicated supply chains and very long-standing supply relationships. And so we work closely with our UK farmers. And we really do believe that actually having long-standing relationships enables you to plan for the long term, which is incredibly important when you're making systemic changes around sustainability. Nothing happens overnight. Um, Increasingly, we're recognising the role of livestock within regenerative agriculture, where the system supports it, and that is important. The context has to be right. And, of course, uh, we are very committed to responsibly sourced feed. So we are signatory of the uh, UK Manifesto on Soya for the removal of uh, soil from our systems, and so we will be uh, deforestation and conversion-free from 2025. So that's the Waitrose context. Um, Leckford, busy slide, apologies. Um, in 2022, we, we sort of published um, in our plan for nature, John Lewis Partnership Plan for Nature, what we were all about at Leckford. And we're all about a farming system that is all about high quality food, but it's kinder to the environment. And of course, you'd expect us to deliver against all of the Waitrose standards. But we also feel that actually having our own farm gives us the opportunity to really test and understand sort of the future horizon and plan for the future and really help that drive 
and inform our agricultural and nature strategy as a business. Specifically in terms of Leckford, we've committed to um, complete our um, transition to carbon net zero ahead of our business goal of 2035. Um, we are very focused on biodiversity regeneration and habitat restoration. And 18 months ago, we recruited a biodiversity officer on the estate, which has been a fantastic thing for us. And I have to say, personally, I now can look at the landscape in a very different way. Um, we have moved to uh, low disturbance farming techniques. So we are three years into our transition to regenerative farming. And increasingly, we want to use Lequid as a place where we can engage with other farmers, the sort of peer-to-peer -peer learning. We recognize the value of that. And we really want to support others in that transition to regenerative farming. And I'll just share with you this quote here, which, um, uh, so the estate was actually Speed Lewis's home. And he was a naturalist. And, you know, he was, he was a genius in his time, a genius now, because even back in 1935, he was talking about bringing the mind of naturalist to business. Um, in terms of um, the, the estate, I'm not going to dwell on this. I mean, obviously, we are practitioners of integrated farm management. In terms of regenerative farming, we very much follow this model. It's relevant because we believe that livestock is a key part of our regenerative system. And in terms of Leckford and what that looks like, um, back in 2020, we made some pretty big decisions about the future of our farming operation. And as a result of that, I mean, we've had livestock in the estate forever, but we, we made a very deliberate decision to move to a beef suckler herd. And we're running around 450 to 500 animals, which we believe is right for the system we're running. Um, they are spring and autumn block calving. The picture here is actually them on our water meadows, so they're doing a really good job for us in terms of conservation grazing. And we also run about 1,500 sheep on the estate over the winter. And that really supports our wider system. Uh, fair to say that actually all of our livestock are effectively um, all on homegrown feed, and that's enough to be able to support them through the grazing season, but also in the winter. And we also feed them the byproduct from our cold pressed rapeseed oil enterprise in the estate um, in the form of rape mill. Um, so we, we, we genuinely believe that integrated livestock provides many wins and actually is a route to us getting to carbon net zero. Um, and why is that? Well, this is a <laughs> slightly busy diagrammatic, but this is um, in any one year, if you were to look at our, our farmed landscape, this is what you would see. It's not a complete picture. It doesn't include our top fruit, doesn't include our vineyards, or indeed the extensive countryside options that we have got. But what it does show is the importance of herbal layers within our rotation, cover crops, permanent grassland, and, and all centered around arable production. So we are all about producing high quality food. One of the things that we did when we made the decision around suckler herd was to move our arable rotation to a 12 year cycle. And the big difference from where we were was the introduction of these things herbal lays. And the cattle love it. And actually, it's so beneficial for um, building soil fertility. So this is the restorative part of our rotation, but also supporting biodiversity. And we're seeing some really good stuff on the ground. There's a lot of measurement going on now. So a lot of what I would talk about is anecdotal improvement, but we will be able to objectively present the impact of that over the next few years. What I love about this is that every level, there are multiple levels of benefit of each part of what we're doing on the rotation. And when we're all about a regenerative farming system that ultimately means that the soil does more work for us, that nature supports our farming enterprise, this has to be the right way for us to do it. The other thing I draw out here is, of course, we've got biomethane production. And the thing, actually, I wanted to sort of say, actually, with this slide is the relevance of livestock is it sits upon all of this. So actually, it makes sense of having herbal lays in the rotation. It makes sense of having cover crops. It's doing a job for us. We've got 500 acres of conservation grazing we have to manage. We've got chalk downland. Um, and, the, and the team were very excited this year that we actually had Duke of Burgundy on our chalk downland, which is fantastic and a really good indicator of overall environmental improvement. So the other bit here is biomethane plant, which is a very industrial part of this whole plan, but actually really, really important. So we understand the challenges around methane. Um, we have a winter house system, so we are producing manure and slurry, and actually it made perfect sense for us to then turn that into an energy source. That has given us a source of compressed natural gas, so we are moving to gas tractors. It also gives us an alternative to so digestate from synthetic fertilizer, and actually also has given us soil conditioner. So some really good things are coming out of that. 
So if I were to distill that down very quickly into sort of three key sort of priority areas in terms of how we think about what we're trying to achieve on the estate. So look, this system is giving us environmental benefit. So it's conservation grazing. It's also giving us those ecosystem services as part of the overall rotation. When you see our herbal lays in peak season, they look amazing. And you'll see the insect life, the pollinators that are living and thriving in that environment. And so that's a really important part of this. Woodland management, we're just sort of beginning to push into this, but we really do see a vision where we will be more, more ably, actively putting cattle into our woodland landscape. And we think they'll do a good job for us in that space. The stockmen have slight challenges. Um, in terms of achieving carbon net zero, there's a lot of things to say here. Very, very briefly, this is about circularity. So actually, you know, the crops we are producing are building soil fertility. We are pretty independent in terms of actually how we're feeding our cattle. We're producing gas on site, which means we can reduce down the amount of fossil fuels we're using. We're reducing down the amount of synthetic fertilizer. And of course, we are using a byproduct to feed our cattle. And that makes sense commercially. Look, we are in this commercially. And what we're producing here is a circular system that gives us a really high quality, high welfare beef that Waitrose wants. And it's actually doing it at a lower price. And that's important for us. And there's so much more for us to unlock here. But we genuinely believe that livestock, with all of its challenges, are a really important part of our regenerative system. So very, very finally, um, of course, nothing stands still. We're really interested in how far we can push things. Uh, we definitely want to get behind mob grazing this year because there's some real benefits around that. Uh, we definitely want to open up our woodland to cattle. Uh, it's good for them, particularly in periods of heat where we're seeing more and more hot summers. But also, we think they can do a really good job for us around scrub management. Uh, we want to do more measurement around particularly enteric methane production. There's a lot of information out there, but we really want to try and nail actually what is the contribution effect of that. And we will look at things such as diet and breeding. And of course, this point about actually using Leckford in this sort of ability to be able to facilitate those conversations across the supply chain. So it's a very rapid tour of, of Leckford, but I hope that brings to life some of the stuff that we're doing. Uh, thank That's you very much indeed, uh, Andrew. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we have a slight change to our advertised uh, program uh, right now. In, in place of uh, Tara Garnett, we have uh, Tamsin Blackstow, who's also uh, a director, uh, sorry, also a uh, researcher at Table, which is this organization within Oxford that looks at our food systems and part of the Oxford Marketing School. Thank you very much for coming along. Uh, right, yeah. So I'll start by giving uh, Tara's apologies. She is struck down with COVID. And so. <laughs> Thought it best not to give it to all of you, um, but I'll I'll do my best to deliver the talk she would have um, she would have delivered. Um, so yeah, I'm a researcher at Table. We're based at Oxford. We're also based at a bunch of other universities in the Netherlands, Sweden, um, Colombia, the United States, and Mexico. So we've got a kind of a, a global perspective on, on some of these conversations. So um, the context of this talk is obviously talking about livestock systems and Tara was really keen to focus on the degree of change we're going to need across the system as a whole. So what level of dietary shift do we need to see to achieve our climate goals and what are the implications of that for, for um, livestock systems and, and agriculture as a whole? Right, in a way, this, this slide's kind of the whole message from one point of view, which is that... Um, even if uh, all the rest of the economy went to net zero four years ago at this point, because this paper is a few years old now, um, we would still produce enough carbon emissions with business as usual in the food system to surpass all of our to to um, surpass all of our climate goals by the end of the century, just from food. And the biggest intervention we could make to reduce those food system emissions is the light green bar here. That is um, reducing the amount of meat that people consume. So this model, um, they, what they describe as plant-rich diets, is about a two-thirds reduction in, in meat consumption for countries like the UK. Um, even that, as you can see, is not actually enough to avoid 1.5 degrees. For that, we need to um, implement many different measures, but this is the biggest single one. So that's modelled diets. If we look at current diets and if we try and get out of that carbon tunnel vision of just thinking about greenhouse gases and think about the full 
range of impacts of agricultural systems. Um, we see a, a picture that, that fits very well with that. So this is a study of uh, 55,000 diets in the UK. Um, and looking at the different environmental impacts, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, but also land use, water use, biodiversity, and eutrophication. And in every case, um, if you uh, order eaters by the, their uh, consumption of animal source foods, you've seen that the highest meat eaters have the highest impacts in every category, and the lowest animal source food eaters have the lowest impacts in every category. But that is not to say that it's all about going all the way to the end of that scale and becoming vegan, because some of the biggest differences are found in shifting from high meat consumption to the low meat consumption category. So a lot of the conversation um, in these spaces at the moment is about soil carbon sequestration in grazing systems. This is a really, really important part of the picture. Um, but we have to be realistic about what part of the picture it is, how big its um, impact can be. So this is a paper that tries to estimate the amount of soil carbon we would have to sequester to mitigate the ongoing um, emissions of ruminant livestock just in the form of uh, methane and nitrous um, oxide. Can't um, meaningfully uh, mitigate CO2 emissions through um, soil carbon sequestration in this way. And the answer that these researchers came to was that we would need to um, sequester about as much carbon as as has been lost from the soil since the advent of agriculture 12,000 years ago in order to mitigate current methane and nitrous um, oxide emissions. So that's and a wonderful goal, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. And it's not an answer to, um, it's not an answer to replace changing diets now. So are we in the middle of a big vegan revolution? Hasn't this already happened? Sadly not. Um, at the moment, about 85% of people in the UK um, eat meat and dairy, and about 2% um, eat entirely plant-based or vegan diets. Uh, it's not even actually clear that we're moving in the right direction. So the National Diet and Nutrition Survey and other research that's based on asking people what they eat tends to find that um, meat consumption is dropping. But if we look at supply, so if we look at um, the FAO's food balance sheets, which is basically just production plus imports minus exports, it appears that the, the meat being made available to people in the UK is going up year on year. So we haven't really even started this necessary transition yet. So what kind of diets does this imply? I'm sure lots of you will already be familiar with this. This is perhaps the most controversial example we could have chosen, the Eat Lancet diet. Um, the thing I think Tara would have wanted me to point out about this is that it's not a vegan diet. Um, the various diets that are being modeled as examples of healthy, sustainable diets that we could be aiming for as a society, they are not largely speaking uh, proposing that we eliminate meat consumption altogether, far from it, um, but just reduce it compared to reduce the proportion of the diet that it um, currently takes up. Uh, I'm going to skip past these bits pretty quickly, but just to say that. There is lots of research on the health of different diets, and it is perfectly possible to eat a very healthy diet right at the high end of meat consumption or at the extreme low end or anywhere in between. There are different health risks that come at these different places on the scale, but there's no single perfect diet which has no health risks. And overall mortality, um, all-cause mortality, doesn't appear to be impacted in, in, by those kind of choices. And indeed, the diet-related diseases that we suffer from most as a society at the moment are those associated with high animal source food consumption. So there are some win-wins there for health and sustainability. So what about what systems does this imply we should be thinking about for the remaining um, animal agriculture that will form part of the kind of the, the sustainable system? Well, there's some wonderful research being done into um, more circular food systems. So this is work by Hannah van Zanten and colleagues at Wageningen. Um, and this, con this is research that concentrates on systems which uh, minimize feed food competition. So we are um, feeding animals uh, non-human edible uh, food loss and waste or agricultural byproducts or grass. Um, and ensure that all nutrients are recycled back into the food system. 
And with those kinds of systems, um, we can get really substantial declines in carbon emissions, maybe in the range of 30%. Agricultural land use dropping by 70%. Um, but notice that still requires a 50% reduction in meat production, uh, reduction in meat production, because you just can't produce any more meat than that with while keeping things fully circular. And it still doesn't meet our climate goals. So we need to do this, and then we need to do more than this. Um, thanks very much. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Townsend. Some very uh, uh, stark uh, statistics there. Um, and we're going to move on to uh, Finlow Costain, who is right here, who is Editor-in-Chief of 8.9.com and the sustainable, of, uh, sustainable Farming Advocate. You might just start off by telling us what 8.9.com is. Will. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you might get some contrast with the last speaker. I know this is what you paid for, a bit of disagreement. So that's what we're... <laughs> That's what we're going to have. Now, 8.9 is a relatively new land use news channel. We focus on, uh, on land use for food, fiber, uh, forestry, fashion, natural capital, and try to work on everything from the field up to the boardroom and back again. Um, every day during the week, you'll find that there are new articles. Uh, and many days, there will be new podcasts and, uh, and video interviews as well. So I'm going to talk about the need to value um, natural systems. And often we see that there is the conversation. I mean, I think a lot of people here are sort of somewhere in the middle, but the conversation is about whether to go towards those more high-tech, industrialized systems or whether to go towards more agri agroecological. I'm very much in the latter camp. I think there is an enormous folly in putting our faith in industrialized, fossil fuel-dependent farm systems. Cattle, I would argue, are the cornerstone of restoring nature while continuing to be able to farm for food. Because the climate crisis isn't just about climate change. We hear a lot about climate change. But climate change is driving and driven by biodiversity loss. Climate change is driving and driven by desertification. All these things are connected. In terms of desertification in the UK, I'm talking about the erosion of soil health. And there are those who want to prioritize different bits of land for different purposes. But all land delivers multiple outcomes. And sometimes those are deliberate outcomes, and sometimes they're not. And often when they're not deliberate, many of those outcomes are quite negative. And so in the future, I want to see all land use being holistic. So ecological breakdown, it's already here. It's accelerating. And by the way, I'm not going to read everything on the slides. So do look at the slides as well. We don't know what the future holds, but my fear is, and with kids of 11 and 9, my real fear is that we're heading towards somewhere really pretty nasty. And in time frame, in my mind, is 2040. Pretty catastrophic. And our global interdependence and our dependence on international global supply chains puts us at risk. It creates a security threat. And as more nations experience the impacts of climate change and competition for resources increases, that accelerates that threat. And so if or as societies begin to collapse, we need high-functioning food systems. And for that, we need high-functioning ecology, uh, high-functioning and nutritional diversity to ensure the resilience of our society in a thriving society. Now, we put lots of, uh, of studies on 8.9.com. Uh, I'm not going to go <laughs> through lots of them. But every week, of course, there's a new study that sort of shows us that Armageddon is coming to one extent or another. Now, I just want to pull out this one study that came out a month or two back. By 2100, three to six billion people may not anymore be living in livable regions. Now, that's not going to wait until 2100. There's a trajectory there. Now, just imagine 3.6 million people, many of them on the move, the migration associated with that, the conflict, the war associated with that. Just imagine it for one moment. Ecological security means active and positive land use. And agroecological systems with livestock I'm arguing, give us the best chance to build ecologically resilient societies. Because ecological security requires ecological efficiency. And I'm fed up of being told that indoor industrialized systems are the most efficient. Yes, they can produce more kilos, more uh, liters for fewer emissions. But emissions are only one part of the puzzle that we face. Uh, and 
In fact, these systems are staggeringly ecologically inefficient. Food volume, it's not an issue. We waste 50% of the food that's produced in, uh, in the world if we include obesity and things like that, as well as simply flowing food away. That we already produce enough food for 10 billion people. And the trouble with these systems that we're talking about, these highly industrialized systems, is that they only produce food. I want to see systems that produce food and fiber, because, of course, fiber, 60% of our clothes come from petrochemicals. That needs to be replaced as well. So food and fiber and ecosystem services together. And regenerative agriculture is the way that we can deliver this at scale. But we need to adapt our understanding of the food system in order to allow it to scale. And ruminants are an essential part of that. They're ecosystem engineers, but the trouble is that they are constrained. They're not able to behave naturally because farmers get in the way. And so we need farmers to manage those cattle in different ways. Ideally, in adaptive ruminant, uh, adapt, sorry, adaptive multi-paddock systems, mob grazing, uh, such as was talked about before. I don't think we can solve the climate crisis without them. And regenerative grazing delivers ecological renewal, consistency, and at a rate that's really hard to surpass. All these functions here, and food, and fiber. Now, here's the difference with the last speaker. I'm saying that we've been misled in terms of enteric methane. Yes, methane is an issue. It's, uh, it's an important greenhouse gas. But is enteric methane a problem? No, it isn't. It's, this, this myth is based on inaccurate science and outdated science. New science came along in 2018 from Oxford Martin, which has now been accepted repeatedly, actually, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. A new metric, a revised metric, GWP star, is an accurate way of characterizing the warming impact from methane. The standard metric over-characterizes it by a factor of three to four. So methane's important, but it has a short half-life. After 20 years, stable sources of continuing not fossil, newly out of the ground, but continuing sources of this short-lived gas and no longer delivering warming. So think of a herd of 100 cattle. It could be a million cattle. It could actually be a billion cattle. But after 20 years, although their emissions, their burps and farts continue, there's no new warming coming from that herd. And when we get this, we can unlock the opportunity. We unlock the potential to use cows as ecosystem engineers. We need to end fossil fuels. We need to not demonize natural processes. And we need to end fossil fuel-based farm systems, not systems that are fully integrated with nature. And of course, if we're just focusing on the emissions, we're only looking at half of the carbon cycle. The cattle produce the emissions, of course, but in high-functioning regenerative systems, AMP systems in particular, soil is sequestering carbon, lots of carbon. And the abundant tall grasses in those systems are producing more hydroxyls, which go up into the high atmosphere and break down the methane. And the deep roots help to regenerate biodiversity and to break up the soil and create a soil carbon sponge which holds more water. Now, this research... So I'm just going to get a glass of water. Dry mouth. Ugh. Thanks. So US research, this is the biggest piece of research into adaptive multi-paddock grazing and carbon drawdown. Over 10 years, this has been working. They published papers over the course of that time. But this piece of research I'm talking about now hasn't yet been published. It hopefully will be this year. What they found is an average of 12 tons of CO2 per hectare per year being drawn down across these, uh, these 10 systems that they've been looking at across the USA. And it's not a competition. <laughs> But at the same time, let's recognize that that is twice the rate of standard UK woodland. We're comfortable with the idea that woodland sequesters carbon. The opportunity of soil is immense. And that opportunity may slow a little over time. But the opportunity to keep us below two degrees is immense if we can mobilize uh, and replicate this way of farming all the way around the world. Even possibly, as Jacqueline McGlade has said before, um, I've come all the way from Dorset, so I'm going to finish. Uh, a lot of people, <laughs> lot of people have come a long way. A couple of minutes. Um, uh, well. So I'm not going to hold my breath on 1.5, but you never know. It's possible. So the key message is that ruminant agriculture can be carbon neutral. It can be a carbon sink, and it can deliver food and fiber, mitigation, adaptation, and biodiversity together. 
Now, scaled regenerative agriculture requires land use change, and it requires dietary change. Let's not pretend that it doesn't. Production should be land-led, not customer-led. Now, that's a challenge. Farming needs to meet national, and national diets need to be more land appropriate. That means cattle on grazing land, not fed with imported grain and not fed with concentrate any more than is absolutely strictly necessary. Now, in Britain, that means a reduction in stocking and particularly overstocking in the West, but it means an increase in stocking probably in the East, integrated in arable and horticultural systems. The key is that we need to end fossil fuels. And if we're going to end fossil fuels, we've got to get our energy from somewhere. That means cycling sunlight, cycling water, creating biological complexity, cycling nutrients. And Regen can deliver this. Ruminants in Regen systems. So finally, just to wrap up, ecological security means that we need to value well-managed ruminants as ecological heroes, not as demons, as we keep being told that they are. Farming has been disconnected from nature. It's been powered by fossil fuels. Our task is to reconnect nature and agricultural land use. And farmers, well, farmers work to the market. And yet they've played a role in the degradation of nature, but really it's been driven by policy, driven by retailer contracts very often. And so these stakeholders need to be key and critical in creating that transition to regenerative practice. We are in an ecological emergency. This is a crisis. And we need to behave as though it's an emergency. And that means that we need to deploy ruminants around the world and around Britain and create land use that really genuinely offers us some hope of a better future. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed for that, Finlow. <clears throat> excuse me. And our final speaker is Professor Jude Capo, who I'm glad to see is now with us. Um, always nerve wracking, who is a livestock and sustainability consultant and ABP chair and professor of sustainable beef and sheep production at Harper Adams University, which is the Leaf Innovation Centre. Jude. If I sat. Thank you so much. I apologize. I would never have normally cut it this fine, but I was on a NOAA panel which finished literally about 35 minutes ago, and I have run from the other side of London to be here. So I'm very happy to be here, and I'm even more happy that I actually got here, you know, before the end of the panel. And I find myself in vehement sort of agreement, disagreement, agreement, disagreement with all the things I've heard so far, which is going to make for some really interesting discussion, I think. So I've been working in this area for about uh, 16 years or so now. I could talk about this for the next four days without drawing breath. I'm acutely aware that I've now got about seven and a quarter minutes, so I'm not going to do that. But it's, but it's going to be at a very high level. We don't have time to go into the weeds. Um, and I'm going to focus on the UK, but with the understanding that the same principles apply across the globe. But my main message, and one in, in contrast to some degree, is that there is no one-size-fits-all. There is no one definitively sustainable system. Whether we're talking native beef cattle in the biggest feedlot in South Africa, whether we're talking highland cattle in the highlands of Scotland, whether we're talking sheep on the ridgeway close to where I live, there is no one sustainable system. But what is absolutely urgent is that in every system we do our absolute best to balance economic viability, social acceptability, and environmental responsibility, all under the auspices of One Health, i.e., again, the balance between ecosystem health, human health, and animal health. So that's a huge balancing act. And we cannot um, assume or pretend that all foods do not have some kind of environmental impact, whatever our dietary and lifestyle choices are. And I want to make it very clear there's a place for everybody's choices. Those of you who are um, observant will notice that on this slide, all the foods actually go from A to Z, because I did this when I was in the States, it was apples to zucchini at the bottom right. But literally everything that we eat has some impact. So even if we only eat roadkill, for example, that still has an impact on, on soil, on biodiversity, on the climate, on water, and on air. So we've got, ultimately, to be honest about that. But we face a huge challenges. I spend probably too much time on social media. This is an infographic that I pulled from Instagram. It has some global average figures for carbon footprint. You probably can't read them from where you are, but we've got a range of foods from nuts at the top down to beef and lamb at the bottom, the size of the gas cloud coming out of the back of the animal, which isn't entirely correct. 
indicates the carbon footprint. As a scientist, this really irritates me because there's no citation. I have no way of knowing where this data came from. It's also global averages, assuming that the beef that we eat in the UK is the same as that in Asia, Argentina, Australia, wherever it might be. And thirdly, it's expressed in kilos of carbon per thousand calories. This is entirely meaningless when we're eating protein-rich foods, which are also essential sources of vitamins, minerals, es essential fatty acids, and so on. So we cannot compare protein-rich foods on the basis of energy. It's simply nonsensical. But to the public, 98% of whom don't have a connection to animal agriculture, this seems to make perfect sense. Now, having said that, we've got to be absolutely honest about our industry, honest about the opportunities, Honest that in most cases, a beef system doesn't look like this. You know, it's a pretty picture, which I took on a nice day, but most beef doesn't look like that. And we've got to be more honest. All of our children and our grandchildren have the storybooks with the pretty pictures of the farmer and the farmer's wife and the cat and the chickens and the pigs. And it's all lovely. And as consumers, they see some of the realities of animal agriculture and go, whoa, I thought it was always like this. And you're telling me it isn't always like that. So my main message is that as an industry, we need to be more transparent. And that's difficult, and it's painful, and we don't always want to do it, but we've got to be more transparent with the consumer, the retailer, the policymaker, and the processor. And we've got to be realistic about all the opportunities that we have. So the opportunities to improve biodiversity, to improve sequestration, to cut greenhouse gas emissions are not the same as a system um, where we have highland cattle in the highlands of Scotland, as they are when we have stabiliser cattle on a large operation in Yorkshire, or even where we have, well, I'm not going to tell you what these breeds are. You can guess at lunchtime if you like, but crossbred cattle in a large finishing operation in Shropshire. And again, going further ahead, even a single goat by the side of the road in South Africa. Again, a huge source of income, nutrition, female independence, status, um, fertilizer, and so many other things for farming families with very small herds and flocks in South Africa. All of these systems have different opportunities to improve and to become more sustainable, but they are system and, and place specific. There is no one size fits all. And as an industry, we've got to learn from the people who are doing it best. As I say, that doesn't just mean you must all farm like this, but look at the best farmers. What are they doing with their soils, with their animals, with their system? How are they making the best of those opportunities? We can learn an awful lot. I can talk for hours with a PowerPoint to lots of farmers. And they go, yeah, well, what do you know? You're an academic. You haven't milked any cows for quite a long time. Farmers learn really well from farmers. We know that. We trust our friends. We trust our colleagues. Let's learn from the best farmers out there as to what to do. So finally, we often see um, infographics like this one. This one I actually found about uh, nine years ago now when I was working in the States. But we see often, you know, feed efficiency is a real issue. You know, if, if you cared about the planet, you wouldn't eat beef or dairy. You would simply eat small amounts of pork and poultry. But that's, again, the wrong metric. And very simply, this was a really nice paper, came out from um, Mike Wilkinson back in 2011 now. He looked at redefining feed efficiency. It isn't just feed in milk, meat, or eggs out. It's the human edible component of livestock diets going in, i.e. the things that instead we could eat, i.e. not pasture, not grass, compared to the human edible protein coming out. And when we look at it on that basis, two things to see. Both for dairy and for suckler beef, which accounts for about 50% of our beef in the UK, both of those systems give out more human edible animal protein than they take in. There is no competition between feed and food. And when we look at cereal beef, again, 50% of our beef in the country. But here, on a human edible feed going in versus food coming out basis, very similar to pigs and poultry. As Finlow talked about earlier, we need better metrics to properly understand the impacts of our food system. And finally, yes, we can have fewer cattle, we can have fewer sheep, but that has massive consequences. One example here, ground nesting birds. If we take the cattle away or the sheep away, the grass grows. As the grass gets higher than 15 
centimetres high, the birds go, this is too high for me, I can't nest for anymore, the birds disappear. Fairly obviously, if we take the cattle away, the dung goes away, and so does the mighty dung beetle, which has so many positive consequences for carbon sequestration, soil quality, soil health. It also gives all of the larvae to feed the ground nesting birds. So no cattle, no dung, no dung beetle, no ground nesting birds. And the dung beetle is estimated to save UK farmers 367 million pounds per year in terms of better soil quality, less reliance on parasiticides and improved pasture productivity. So ultimately, as has been said earlier, we have to look after our soils and therefore our whole agricultural and, agricultural and animal agriculture system. I say almost all of our food comes from the soil here because this picture here is actually a fish pie, but of course fish health as well is affected by what we do with our soils. And animals, particularly a grazing livestock, are an absolutely integral part of that. So we've got to do everything we can to keep cattle and sheep in the UK and the global <coughs> agricultural system. So with that, thank you so much. Right. So please uh, get, get your hands in the air and shoot them up where people can see. My mistake, forgive me. Um, yeah, no shortage of things to go for there. And uh, please, yes, do get your hands up and, and, and keep them up for when uh, I send the microphones around. I just want to clarify a couple of things uh, with, with Jude, actually. Um, just on that feed efficiency, are you really telling me that a field of that goes of animal cattle feed has more useful protein to me at the end when it's come out of a cattle than if that field was planted with a, a bean or something like that that I, as a human, can consume? Given how much of the cattle feed is non-human edible, i.e. pasture, soil, and um, soil... Pasture, straw, silages, etc. Yes, but that's in, that's assumed that's taking the the grazing into into Absolutely. account. Absolutely. Yeah. But on yeah. a single field of something that's grown for animal feed, mm -hmm. it would be far more efficient to plant that arable field with a crop that I could eat and would have protein in it, wouldn't it? And calories for that matter. If absolutely everything else was equal, but of course but it's by not. a huge margin yeah. as well. I mean, it's like ten times as much per hectare of protein and calories, isn't it? For, if you, if you take the animal out. Absolutely. But also in the cattle feed, which I didn't show just, be, just because of time, is a huge quantity of other byproducts. So Finlow touched on this earlier. So things like maize gluten, sugar beet pulp, dried distillers grains, etc. Yeah. So it isn't just substituting grain that we could eat for, you know, other things that we can't. And also you talk about dung beetles. I mean, they're quite often polished off by wormers. I mean, the idea that all these grazing systems have perfect dung beetle systems, that's just not true, is it? It is when they're well managed. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Yes, uh, someone in the corner over there. Let's go for it. And then once again, if you can direct to one person rather than all six, otherwise I'll make the decision for you. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Buchanan. I am an organic beef farmer from Sussex, and I also um, advise Waitrose, amongst a few others. I have to say that this conversation, I think, has distilled exactly the problem that all um, livestock farmers are facing, and uh, frankly, politicians, the public, etc. It is really, really difficult. I, I want to agree with everything that Jude said and Pinlow said. That's exactly where I am. That's what I'm doing. Then I hear what Tamsin said, and of course I don't want to believe Tamsin because I'm a beef farmer and I'm trying to do it really well regeneratively. But this is the whole problem. When are we going to have agreed science and nuanced science? Because of course a beef lot 
in America, when they're standing on dung and being fed barley, is an appalling way to raise livestock welfare, first and foremost, but all the climate change consequences of that. Um, do it in an extensive, regenerative way in the United Kingdom. Great. Where's the nuance? Where are the answers? Where is the agreement? Because we need it, and we need it very fast. Let's go. I think you might have to endure complexity for quite a while, but um, Tamsin, where did you want to take, take that one on? Can we offer any more clarity? Uh, so is this working? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's legitimately extremely difficult, and I have a huge amount of feeling for everybody in, in the position where their life, livelihoods rely on this. Um, so I have a couple of answers, one of which, well, I've missed several answers, one of which is science is a process, it's ongoing, it's unsettled, the edges of it include lots of disagreement and lots of contradictory findings. And so part of the answer, I'm afraid, is we have to put up with the complexity and the competing analyses. But I would also point towards some of the thinking about like the scale of the system that people are talking about. So we can make, there's amazing science for improving the environmental impacts of individual farms in say a UK context. Um, if you zoom out and look at national food supply, world food supply, um, you might end up with a, a different set of answers. So that paper I um, cited at the end of my talk um, by colleagues at Wageningen, um, by Hannah van Zanten and co. Uh, they look at they they look at modelling if we had really circular agriculture, if we had um, systems which sort of maximised lots of principles about circularity, about keeping nutrients in the system, doing everything that's good um, to minimise like nutrient waste, so uh, minimise feed food competition. How much meat can we then eat? How much meat can we then produce whilst keeping it sustainable? So I think those kind of projects which try and um, look at the big picture and say, okay, let's try and have as good farming systems as we can, and then what can we ecologically, environmentally afford are, 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 are an attempt at that kind of big picture complexity. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, will, I haven't forgotten you, but I want to bring in uh, uh, Vicky on this because she's new to the stage. Where do you stand on this one, uh, Vicky Robertson? Um, I think, to pick up on Elizabeth's point, it is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it is it is complex and we're talking about a whole systems approach here and focusing and it was picking up Finlow's point as well if you focus on one issue so carbon then there are unintended consequences and I think we often don't consider those unintended consequences because it's hard and it is complex um, and you've got the science behind it but then you bring in humans and all the complexities of, of humans and, and how we make our we make our decisions. And I often think actually of um, Professor David Hughes, if any of you have heard him speak, where he talks about story food and fuel food, where he talks at the weekend, and I personally can rely to this, um, you know, I can wax lyrical about where my roast dinner came from on a Sunday, and then during the week I'll go and grab, grab a sandwich from a meal deal from a supermarket and not even think about it. And I think, you know, and I can morally justify that to myself. Um, and, and I'm sure others, you know, might be in the same position. But it's, you know, it, it, it is complex. It is a system, but it's diversity. And I think we've heard a lot about diversity this morning. And there is no one size fits all. And because it's a system, it's really hard, I think, then from a science perspective, how do you reduce all the variables to actually work out cause and effect? And also we're talking about biological processes here as well, which have the ability to throw in um, curved balls. And we've got a lot of volatility. So I haven't got, a, I haven't got an answer but other than to say I do recognise the challenge and the complexity. Thank you. Finlay? Just quickly, science, peer review science, it's really important stuff. But so is experience. And we need to get much better at combining the two. Uh, and, and anecdotally on this, I interviewed a couple of people who were part of the high-level panel of experts advising the World Food Security Committee. They told me very clearly that a decade ago, they only really listened to peer-reviewed science, and they realized they were getting it quite significantly wrong. And now they try and get a, about a third, possibly a bit more, uh, of, uh, of experience, particularly from indigenous people and from farmers as well. And, and just to sort of think about that a little bit further, scientists are people too. And, and as people, we need to work out the questions that we need to ask. And having asked those questions and having attracted the funding to ask those questions and gone through the research in order to write the paper and then discover that we didn't quite get the question right in the first place and then have to do it all over again, there tends to be a good decade of lag between the experience of farmers 
uh, especially those at the vanguard of regenerative agriculture, I would argue, and the science that's coming through, which is one of the reasons why that Peter Bick research that I referred to in my presentation is so important. But if you're moving away from peer-reviewed science and saying you should only, I don't know, make up a third or whatever of the information, why are you moving a little bit towards, you know, alternative facts as Donald Trump would have? You're just going to cherry-pick anecdotes to suit your narrative. Well, I mean, if the World Food Security Committee is doing that, then I'd be surprised. Um, I mean, the point is that you are listening to science, you're building up that science, but very often you can see outcomes in the land. And in terms of that great long slide of outcomes that I had in terms of what cattle deliver, again, it's not just about one metric because one metric distorts. It's understanding. And science is by its very nature reductionist. It, it tries to find you know, those questions in, and, and answer those questions in minute detail. What farming is often doing, what land use is doing, is dealing with all of those outcomes at once. So yeah, the science is important. It's not about devaluing the science. It's about starting to value the experience of farmers and indigenous people as well who've been doing things in particular ways and marrying those two things together. Uh, and ultimately, we're in catastrophe. We're in crisis. We've got to make some judgment calls. And at the moment, my judgment call is very much in the, in the area of regen. Thank you. Just before we get to our next question, I'd like a little uh, bit of clarity. I think none of us are saying, well, we may make it as a personal choice, but none of us are saying no meat. I just want to find out where we are on the less meat, bearing in mind that both the Climate Change Committee here and the recent National Food Strategy Report, the Dimbleby Report, both advocate a reduction in meat. <clears throat> I think it's between a quarter and a third, depending on which one. Um, so let's just go down. Vicky, less meat in our diet? I think there is... Simple yes or no will do. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, less meat. And? Uh, so more fibre, more, more fruit, more veg in our diets, but also uh, continue to support really high-quality welfare meat. So less meat in our diet or not? Um, more fruit and fibre in our diet. So no, you, you, you don't wish to answer? You don't um, wish no, to answer that? Well, no, I do because actually there's a substantive well, point an I'm making about actually if you're going to buy meat, and we would say buy meat, buy it from a place where actually you can really demonstrate sustainability and the quality of that meat. That's a hell of a... I mean, no one can do that for each individual purchase, so that's kind of absurd, isn't it? No. Okay. Uh, Finlow, less, less meat? But, but it is the position that we need to come to. Sorry, and do you, do you want less meat in our diet? It's very hard to answer that question. The answer is less meat which is doing environmental harm, and I would say that grain-fed pork and chicken are particularly high on that, but there's no reason to eat less beef if it's coming from regenerative systems. So it's about, it's so yes and no. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Tanzin? A lot, a lot less. Uh, Jude? I'm going to go with the British Veterinary Association's tagline of less but better, but adding the caveat that we haven't necessarily decided what better means. Uh, and, and, and Dan, if you could, uh, I will, uh, you, you're allowed to put a few caveats because we haven't Thank heard you. from you yet. But yeah. just tell us, uh, less? I'm just reassured to see that the whole of the panel are incapable of saying yes or no. Well, no, not quite. The, the no that's not me. fair. Some of them did. Um, but anyway, what about yourself? Are you capable of it? No, I'm not capable of it. No. <laughs> All meat is not the same in my view, so I would say... Yes, but the caveat of, of it's where that meat comes from, similar to Finlow and Andrew. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, yes, uh, someone right here in the middle for a microphone, please. And then we'll, yep, we'll come to you and Sarah in a moment. Thank you, Rosie Tootel. Um, I've got a question, and it's probably more of a retail question. So I'm going to address it to you, Andrew, on behalf of Waitrose. <laughs> it seems like everything we've said this morning so far is about better better products that are verified, whether that's rice, whether that's better beef, does that not rely on the retailers therefore making buying decisions based on quality, not just cost? So actually having KPIs for buying teams and commercial teams, whether that's from a regen point, from a better cattle, from a verified source, and how do we get to that? Thank you. Um, simple answer, yes, I agree with you. And I, oh, crikey. Hang on. No, that's working. Uh, yes, I agree with you, and I think that's what we do. Um, you know, we have various certif certification schemes that we apply to. So LEAF is an example. We've, we've been part of, of LEAF for a very long time as a business. And actually, we want our farmers to thrive. And a lot of the work that we really want to do is to, uh, particularly if I think about Leckford, it's easy for me to talk about Leckford, is we really do believe in peer-to-peer -peer farmer learning. We do believe that a lot of stuff we talked to about today is a pathway to a resilient food system, a more profitable food system, and that has to go all the way down the value chain. We also need to get our customers 
to think more about where their food comes from and understand the differences. If we can get customers to value their food, pay more for their food, everyone wins. And so I would strongly advocate for that. Mm, pay more for our food. And just a thought, Andrew, are we anywhere close to being put, being able to put a GHG label on meat, for instance? Or, it, 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 would that be desired? I mean, because you said, you said it depends earlier on your answer to less. Therefore, can we offer the consumer the information on which maybe to base that decision? Um, so, uh, look, I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, but I think we would all believe that there's an opportunity to be more transparent with where our food comes from, and that will benefit customers in making choices. Yeah. But because uh, I was thinking, you know, you, you know, I know it would be a fantastically complicated cal calculation, including soil carbon lockup and, and, and methane and how the cow, how long it lived and all those kind of things. But it would, in, in the end, if it were yes. robust, it would be a very, well, very useful tool. If we're tool. attaching importance to it as an industry, yeah. then... The old what measurable becomes important. Yes. What's measurable becomes important. Did you want to come in? Uh, so, Jude, yeah. Various retails and processes. I work with ABP, for example, and in my role at Harper Adams, are doing precisely this, looking at, um, I'm involved with the project, uh, carbon footprinting 350 uh, beef and lamb farms across the UK, to not just look at the carbon footprint, but look at the factors that affect it, both by industry, beef or lamb, by sector, by type of farm, by, you know... Um, um, a type of soil, you know, breed, et cetera, et cetera. I think it will be possible. The challenge will be that if we put a carbon footprint on beef, and let's assume it's, you know, 18 kilos of carbon per kilo of dead weight, that by itself, with no metrics for cheese and crisps and driving and buying a new book and buying a new iPad and, you know, all the other things that we do is not necessarily helpful. And we did see this happen with Tesco's, what, 15 years or so ago now? They had some carbon, um, carbon footprints on foods, which then disappeared about a year later. Yeah. So it's, it's in, been tried, but I think in some canteens. Tried. It's in the Sky Canteen, actually, mm -hmm. funnily enough. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Finlow first, briefly, just, and, just then, very, and then Tamsin. Very briefly. Greenhouse gas emissions, they're important, but they're only part of the climate crisis. It would create distortions in public understanding, reinforce distortions in public understanding. We need to combine that ecological output of the animals. And just to have another bite at your earlier question, society overall needs to eat less meat, but we need to value really well-produced meat. Okay, thank you. Um, just so on the labelling point, uh, the other thing I think to bear in mind here is the research increasingly shows that consumers won't shift what uh, category of product they're buying on the basis of any environmental labels. They do so in, they do so in experiments when it's not their money and they're not actually going to eat their product. <laughs> they don't whenever it's tried in real shops. So it's really important for making that information visible to the industry and to supply chains and making it important. It's not going to shift consumer behavior. For that, we need different kinds of policies. And, and I, you just reminded me to pick up on something you said in your talk, which is there hasn't apparently been a shift in consumption of meat, uh, at least a, a decrease. And yet we see a lot more free from, we see a lot more meat alternatives, we, we see a lot more uh, veganuary about this. Uh, so what, what, what's going on here? I think the honest answer is we don't actually know that it's pretty <laughs> contradictory right now. Um, for a lot of consumers, they are buying those things alongside buying um, meat. It's also a lot of people who were already vegetarian and vegan are, by, are now buying products that are dedicated to them without that taking away from the consumers who were previously consuming um, mm. meat. But I, I mean, I, I, I don't think I can confidently say we know there's been no shift. It's just that the data is contradictory. <laughs> yeah. I ate some uh, lab-grown meat meat, so I'm talking meat-based, cellular meat-based in Britain, which is not currently legal. So I had to sign various um, disclaimers. <laughs> the, the, that, I, that I wasn't going to sue the, the people who made it or anything else like that. And this was going into a Fortnum and Mason's Scotch egg, which will also not be for sale, but it's part of their, uh, uh, part of their um, th opening up discussions about it. But we've probably got time to do lab grown here, but I, just, I, I seem to be coping so far. What are we now 18 hours on from that consumption? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, question here, please. Yep, yep. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't warn you, Connor. Run around. Thanks very much. Um, Sarah Apple, I'm a leaf trustee. Um, really inspiring and... A little bit closer with the mic, please, Sarah. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, very inspiring and challenging discussion today, so thank you to everybody. Um, my question is 
directed probably at Jude, uh, maybe Finlow. But Leckford is inspiring, having it as a completely almost circular system. The th real problem for most uh, livestock farmers is winter feed because all winter feed has soya in it. And the single dri biggest driver of deforestation in the Amazon is a farmers moving, cutting down the Amazon and growing soya because they instantly have a cash crop. It goes straight into the, the big five agri-food companies. I don't see any agri-food company on the panel, so I can't directly challenge them, sadly. And I believe the 7 million tons of soya comes in on animal feed into this country per year, if I'm correct with that figure. What are we going to do about that? Because that is the thing that's going to make the difference. If we can get soya out of the animal feed system, it will completely change the carbon challenge with cattle. Thank you. Uh, Jude, did you want to come here? Oh, yeah, Jude. We certainly do face challenge. There's no doubt about that. Um, soya, unfortunately, is a brilliant protein for animal growth. Um, it is perfectly amino, amino acid balanced for doing exactly what we want it to do. I believe we can go soya-free in dairy and in beef and in sheep with <laughs> adequate replacement from homegrown proteins and supplementation with essential amino acids. The challenge, I think, is, and I'm not trying to point fingers here, the biggest challenge is for the pig industry. Um, they have done everything they can to cut soya and to increase the um, use of certified deforestation-free soya, but it is very difficult to get away from soya. It's a really, really good feed for pigs and poultry. And of course, on the flip side, we can't put pigs and poultry onto pasture on a large-scale basis and have an effective system. So I'm not trying to take the heat away from cattle at all, but I think we can do it. Um, we can take it out with cattle, sheep, and dairy, but not with pigs and poultry. Thank you. Vicky, you want to come on? Yes, no, I'm, and, and great, great question, um, Sarah, and one I expected to come up. So Agricultural Industries Confederation, we represent the animal feed industry, also represent the arable marketing industry. So, um, and just we, we import, um, or last year we imported 3.5 million tonnes of soya. Um, that compares to China, which imported 99 million tonnes, just for comparison. Um, and of that, 70% was verified deforestation and conversion free. Another 27% was low risk. And that is that percentage is increasing. And that's through a combination of voluntary standards, but also sourcing. So if it, from North America. Um, and so that, that yeah, there is a real drive towards doing that voluntarily. But there's also about to be regulation introduced both in the EU and in the UK, the um, deforestation regulation, which is going to look at you know, ensuring that by 2025 that that is, and, and, and um, it was referred to earlier um, by Andrew around that verified verify deforestation, deforestation and conversion free. And as Jude said, it, it is the, the challenge is what you replace soil with. It is unique. Um, where does the other protein sources come from? It's got a high source of protein. If you look at sort of like for like the heterages of other protein sources that you might need to grow, you then increase the area of land that's required. <coughs> so again, it comes around to that, that complexity. Um, and you know, ultimately, if you look at our diet and looking at uh, in preparation for this, I was looking at some stats. 75% you know, of the meat we consume in the UK is pig or poultry. Mm. And they don't eat grass. Wouldn't it be great? You know, and I know there is some research looking at trying to see if they can make it, make um, look at lignin and, and breaking lignin down so that actually it can be digested by big and poultry. So there are and there are alternative proteins being looked at in the market, but ultimately livestock farmers need 365 day consistency in their diet, and you know, animal feed is a complex recipe, and so it's not just simply a binary no soya. It's got to be looked at, you know, that verified deforestation and conversion free. Thank you. Finlay, briefly. Meat and dairy systems need to be delivering ecological quality as well as just food. You know, the days of just food need to have gone. We need food and ecology, uh, which includes climate mitigation and adaptation. And I know so many regenerative farmers now who are fully grass-fed. Um, not the farmers themselves, but their cattle, um, in, meat, in beef and dairy systems, and who are outwintering. And I spoke last week to the British Cattle Breeders Conference. 
It's about finding different sorts of animal. It's about getting the stocking density right on that land, and it's about making sure that those animals change, that they, there are different outcomes from those animals that are valued in the breeding. A lot of uh, regenerative farmers have their own on-farm breeding programs. Often it's smaller framed. Yeah, the yield is lower, but it's what that land can cope with. Thank you very much. Uh, just before we go on, uh, Vicky, um, insect protein in this, or is this just journalistic wishful thinking? Insect protein is one of these novel proteins. The challenge at the moment is the regulatory environment means you can't um, um, fry it and put it into, into feed. You can to the pet food industry. So, so I know that you have to, the, the, the research that has been done, you have to feed them sort of as whole insects. And, but the FSA are looking at the regulatory env environment. It's all about food safety, ultimately. Well, why is the so, drying particularly an issue? I have, I, I, I'm afraid that's... I don't, I don't know, Tom, but it, it's to do with the regulatory environment. I'm not an expert. Is, is this all post-BSE feeding animals to animals? I would imagine it is, yes. But then chickens and um, pigs are omnivores anyway, so it's a slightly yes, odd one. But it, they are lo looking at it, but you know, if, that can, if that can be, you know, it, and, and, and there's very positive vibes around that. So yes, it's part of the solution, but can we get enough? It comes down to that consistency yeah, volume well. and volume sure. and 365-day feed requirements. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Cedric Porter. I'm a trustee of Belief and also a potato journalist. So I'm going to have to put potatoes rather than pancakes in your in your list there, Jude. Um, my question is: Beef is always seems to be the baddie, but the number of beef cattle globally has probably not really gone up in the last twenty odd years. Whereas we've seen a massive increase in in chicken, in pork, fish, and dairy. Should some of that focus be away from the ruminants onto those monogastrics, especially because of the growth in the world population is probably going to be in places where they're eating more monogastric um, proteins rather than ruminants. Uh, yeah, thank you. Let's say Tamsin for that first. Should you be you know, spreading the guilt onto other species? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so particularly poultry. As, I mean, you, you listed several different um, species that have gone up, but poultry is it's really completely mad if you compare the kind of increase in biomass in livestock over the last few decades. Yeah, poultry is um, should be a big part of these conversations. But it's cheap protein. But it's cheap protein, and it's more uh, impact efficient um, than than uh, many of these others. So there are yeah, but on the other hand, it creates more feed food competition problems. So yeah. yeah. Dan, you've got a veterinary background. There are often strong welfare questions raised with both uh, pigs and poultry, aren't there? Particularly when they're cheap. <laughs> Certainly, yeah. And we haven't really touched on the welfare component because well, good environmental performance doesn't always equal good um, welfare performance, and the, and the reverse is true. And I don't know, Jude will probably know better than me, Phil, as well, how many people are considering the two together. I think it's a big, a big sort of gap. I do agree that the um, ruminant, and I'm heavily ruminant biased, so I'll put that disclaimer in. I think the ruminant side of agriculture does come in for an awful lot of heat. And actually, we've discussed today how we can alter their diets. I totally agree with you that we can remove soya from their diets. Um, I think they should be eating a rainbow in the same way that we're encouraged to. Um, and there should be a lot more variety in their diets. And I think a lot of emphasis is put on the monogastric side of things for the lower impact that um, you refer to, but actually that is only one side of the story. Um, and we, we've certainly looked at how easy it is to certify those sorts of um, farming systems, and it's really tricky, and I think that tells you an awful lot as well. So. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to take another question, please. Yes, sir? Hi, uh, Paddy from Rumi. Um, question to Andrew, really, but there's also there's been a, um, some conversation around how hard it is to measure um, the improvement towards regenerative farming. It's very, very complex. Andrew, um, absolutely brilliant all you're doing at Leckford. How I think you said you're three years into the transition of becoming regenerative. How do you measure your progress and, and who cares about the results? Is it your farm managers? Is it the intermediaries, the supermarkets or the end consumers? But, but I think what I'm most interested in is how, how do you measure it? Yeah, look, it's... Um... Yeah. Um, so, huh. honestly, at the moment, it's too anecdotal. Um, but I can tell you, actually, that we've had, in the last two years, two of our best um, arable um, harvests out of the last sort of 30 years. So That's great. That is good. Um, <laughs> yeah, really good, actually. Shame the prices aren't better. But anyway, it's a separate <laughs> conversation. Um, and, and look, I think, you know, one of the reasons why... So there's, there's various things we need to measure. 
And, and basically, for us to be able to demonstrate progress, we need to have baseline measurement. And so we need to be better at that. Um, and actually, particularly as we talk about unlocking values from natural capital, from ecosystem services, all of that stuff becomes really relevant. So we, we wait with bated breath to see where DEFRA get to in terms of their review of carbon audits, in terms of actually what is the right methodology. That's really important. And actually also the, the reason why we brought our biodiversity officer in was to actually baseline measure the estate in terms of the overall health of the natural environment and identify where we need to put focus. So it's kind of watch this space, but all of the bits of the jigsaw are coming into place. Um, does it matter? Yes, it does. Um, you know, the, the Waitrose view around sustainable farming systems and the importance that we can play means that we will want to put this everywhere. You know, we really want to make sure that whatever we talk about, we can substantiate. And I do think we have got to find a way to talk to our customers about this stuff because they need to start caring about it. And actually, if they don't care about it now, within five to 10 years, things will happen climatically that will mean they have to care about it. And we already saw the effects last year of droughts in Spain. More and more of that will happen. And so we've got to all collectively raise the bar around that debate. Can I just ask you something I picked up with Alistair at the end of the last session? Do you see a, a yield penalty in the transitions you're making? Um, I, I completely agree with Alistair about yield optimization. Um, to answer your question precisely, in those two years we haven't, so they have been slightly better for us, but actually I would fully expect over a long-term average that there'll be a slight drift down. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I wanted to come back on the point there because I spend my life at the moment going out telling people how important cows are and it sounds like I'm just saying we need loads more cows. I think that cows globally have gone up by about 16% over the last 20 years. The 20 year time frame you remember is really important in terms of that methane, uh, the emissions continuing but the warming not, not continuing. Um, we need to reverse that globally. And a lot of that has come from South America and it's come from Asia. In terms of the UK, we're down about 20%. So we're actually you know, below net zero in terms of just the methane from cattle systems in the UK at the moment. Not the nitrous oxide and the carbon dioxide. And this is what I say about understanding that metric so that we can unlock the ecological uh, potential. Thank you. There's a gentleman, uh, have you got the mic still with you over there? Or has it gone back? Sorry, I was hoping it would just pass seamlessly from one to another. Uh, and then we'll come to the gentleman further forward. And uh, people on this side of the room, I'm afraid, Hello. might have underrepresented. Um, there's a beautiful red stag on the picture behind you. I thought if you had any thoughts on um, wild game meat introduced into the, the markets and if that could be obvious in uh, reduced carbon emissions. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to pick up the game meat? I'm not quite sure um, who wants to pick this up. Uh, you're all the, uh, un Unusually silent. Jude, you're kind of, you made the mistake of leaning forward. Yeah. Everyone's being very quiet. Just going, oh, it was the equivalent of everyone else taking a step back. Exactly. Yeah, um, I am a complete data nerd, and I have to admit, I don't have a figure for you for wild game. Now, what I can give you, actually, um, because I'm a data nerd, is I often get the similar sort of question, which is, does it matter about all these beef cattle, given that there were bison in North America, and they must have had huge quantities of emissions. So um, being a data nerd, I did calculate this about 10 years ago. And we know that from a uh, methane and nitrous oxide point of view, um, and carbon dioxide, in fact, um, that the carbon footprint of the bison in the North America prior to mass extinction um, was equal to twice that of the, U of the 2007 US dairy industry. Now, bearing in mind how intensive and how big that industry is, that was a huge carbon footprint. I have to balance that, of course, with the fact that back then we didn't have iPads and cars and flights and, you know, all of the other things we do. There is certainly a role for wild game, again, in a managed sort of way, which sounds like an oxymoron, um, in the food system. Whether it's ultimately better or worse than cattle would be a really interesting paper to do, actually. I mean, Finno, you're interested in ecosystems. Well, actually, beautiful though they might look, too many of these are absolutely yeah. pummeling the ecosystems of our uplands, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And we've put quite a few um, stories on the site recently from Scotland in particular, where um, you know there are a lot of moves to try and manage the deer population. I mean, I'll be completely honest, I haven't got a clue about the, uh, the emissions um, element. What concerns me with wild game, I have to say, is the animal welfare 
element. When you are killing a cow in a licensed slaughterhouse, whether that's small or large, you're doing it in a way which is controlled. In a wild setting, I think there are some real challenges. When hang you on, but isn't welfare mainly about life rather than the last two seconds of an it's, animal? And that one's had a pretty good life. Whereas if, if, you've got, if, you've got, if you've got trained marksmen, which is what they've got in Scotland, then absolutely, and right. you're, you're getting good outcomes. It's when you sort of get down to pheasant shoots and that sort of thing where <laughs> there are a lot of people who are less well trained. Understood. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, John Renner, leaf demonstration farmer and um, suckler herd owner and beef producer. Right, sustainably. This is right. <laughs> I'm shaking. I'm so excited. Um, I've, I've got a list of things that are affecting beef produ production. And one of the key ones, and no one's really touched on it, is disease control. And you know, there's, there's two massive diseases within the beef industry. And if they're controlled, that can increase our production by 25%. And the key thing about all of this is more from less. And would the panel agree with me that that's almost the elephant in the room here? We can produce 25% more from farming less. And we can produce better quality meat. Dan. Thanks, Tom. That's a juicy one. Um, just before lunch, I would totally agree. Um, about disease and it is something that we for me things aren't joined up so we have a veterinary industry that looks at certain things and we have a food supply industry we have the environmental side and nobody's joining everything up at all so I imagine you'd have vets come onto your farm and look at um, certain things but they look very much my experience in isolation so they identify the disease and they talk about the cure and sometimes they talk about the prevention but they don't go all the way back several steps and talk about how we get a more resilient population that means we don't have those diseases. And so I, th I think a lot of it comes back to that. And I think we've touched on it before. And that's having livestock that are adapted to the system we want. So a very intensive dairy system, which is what I've spent my career dealing with, will have a lot of problems that are associated with being a very intensive dairy system. And so unless we look at a more resilient approach to it right several steps back, then we'll still hit those diseases. I know the diseases you're referring to, and they are big uh, help, help the rest of us out then, what are those? Well, I would imagine TB is one of the, one, uh, really? And BVD, yeah. Yeah, well, we could quite quickly come up with a list of probably 10 of big ones affecting the, um, affecting the industry. And I would agree, there's, so certainly in the case of BVD, that, there's a very easy route to eradication of BVD. Um, and the devolved administrations have taken a slightly different route on that. But, but we, ha we haven't adopted it necessarily in England at this point, although moves are made to it. Okay. I do, but so for me, for me, I think it comes back to the lack of connectivity between all of the things that feed into the same point. If we're able to control disease better, then you're right. We have less wastage, we have um, less emissions. Interesting, we've talked recently about what impact disease has um, on the carbon balance of a farm, and actually it. My understanding is it probably isn't as big as you think and it settles out in the wash some way down the line. But certainly having those non-productive animals, whether they're ill or whether they are losses on farm, will contribute to that. So sort of roundabout answer, but I think there needs to be more joined up thinking and connectivity, more people speaking to each other. Um, but I would certainly agree. I think without you know focusing on my profession, I think people can be very sort of tunnel vision on certain things without taking a step back and looking at why those things might be happening. Nutrition being a great, great example of that. Thank you very much. Vicky, you want to come in? Briefly? Yeah, I just want to pick up on Dan's point around that sort of that cross sector and the importance of nutrition as well as health. And then actually look, looking at the whole nutrient balance of, of a farm. So it comes back to that integrated farm management approach. But I think a join up between a vet, a nutritionist and a fertilizer advisor, is a great sort of advisory team that can work with farmers to support them to look at you know, making the most of the nutrient balance and making most efficient of their, of their production system. Thank you very much indeed. There's a quick, if we could just get the microphone to John the white sweatshirt. And without wishing to be like a pantomime audience, this side of the room is doing a lot better on this question. <laughs> this <laughs> so really, you know. Panel, um, and Andrew, just a question for, for me, just very yeah. quickly. Uh, in your, your transition, as we're calling it, yeah. uh, um, have you, uh, what's, the, what's been the fertilizer um, use 
Uh, have you used less? I mean, uh, that's a yeah, big yeah, thing yeah. of regen farmers. Yeah. And how much less so far? Um, so uh, we, we're bringing it down. And, and the whole idea about transition is that we're not going to shock the system. Mm -hmm. So we are bringing it down. But we're probably using about um, 50 kilos less per um, hectare on, on our wheat right now. So that might be like, that could be 20% less? We're down about 160. Okay. But it's coming down. And actually, of course, what we're seeing now is that <clears throat> more of our fertilizer will be coming from the digestate from the biomethane plants. So actually, the, the source of that nitrogen will change over time. Thank you. That was just a note I wrote down. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Dale Kingston. I'm from the Southwest from a company called Channel Atlantic. I'm probably the only one in here with an idea about seaweed. Um, and I'm sorry that I just have to put my two pence in because uh, no aquaculturists come to agricultural events. So I thought <laughs> I'd give it maybe another one. Um, so I've got a few questions. Um, one of them is how can seaweed improve um, livestock nutrition? The other one is how does, uh, how, what are your opinions on it and how can we uh, uh, make it more available in agriculture? Um, how can it contribute to um, like being an alternative source of nutrition and, and is there a providence interest from like a cattle farmer um, in terms of, oh, you know, it's all grass fed or I'm supplemented with not soya. Um, and that's probably enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, can I just check one thing? Are, are you talking about seaweed both in terms of the sort of protein source for animal feed, what? but also there's been a lot of talk about it in terms of a methane reducer, hasn't there? Yeah, I, I think that's sort of a, a misnomer actually, because it's a, that's a species from the Pacific. Right. So um, in your case, more from an immune, immunological improvement and as a, a carbohydrate uh, uh, and trace mineral foliar application on crops. Uh, thank you. Interested as part of the, the feed? I mean, you're, you're, you're making feeds. You're interested in feeds. Any interested in seaweed as a stock? Yeah, it, it comes under that novel protein aspect, um, along with you know other other areas we talked about insects. And so I suppose again, it comes back to that you know, that nutritional aspect, how it blends with the uh, you know into a compound feed, given that recipe um, and and the huge number of raw materials that goes into a compound feed. You know, what, what's its what's its impact in there? What impacts it have on the combination of ingredients? And then obviously how that's digested and the palatability, obviously, of that of that feed as well. But again, it comes back to the point, you know, is there enough of it for it to be consistently incorporated into animal feed diets, you know, all through all through the year to meet the nutritional needs of whatever animal it is that, that's consuming it. So yeah, it to me it, it that, that it's definitely part of potentially part of the future, along with you know some of these other innovative approaches. Um, that, are, that are being looked at. Forgive me, raising all those problems makes you sound a little bit conservative with a small c. You know, stick to what we know, that's what the farmers like. Haven't we got to be a bit bolder in the face of these massive ecosystem and climate crises we're facing? No, absolutely, Tom. I'm not saying not being... It, it's just that it's the reality of what the market the market needs and the risk that's being put on. You know, if, we're, if we're going to incorporate it into feed, then you know, who's taking that, that risk in, in terms of if it's small batches... You know, is the farmer taking the risk of let's see how it how it goes? And we need the evidence, I think, to un underpin underpin that if we want to sort of make it more you know, as a, as, a comp as a consistent Thank you. feed product. Jude. Yeah, really good question. Actually, takes me straight back to my PhD, which was uh, some time ago. But we were feeding um, in one year we fed fish oil, and in a different um, year we fed seaweed in an attempt to improve neonatal, neonatal lamb brain development, vigour and behaviour, which it did, which was great, which is a real issue given that we still lose about 20% of our lambs each year on a national basis. Um, the only issue that we had which would need to be addressed was um, residues or taint in the, um, in the milk and meat. Um, frankly, I smelt of fish oil through most of my PhD, which was great. Um, <laughs> So we need to address those type of issues, but it is certainly an option, I think. I know you've got follow-up questions. Lunch is coming up. Pick it up one to one, if that's all right. Yeah, can, sure. can, can, can... Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we've got China. I'm not doing well with this side of the room. Yes, sir. Uh, last one, please. Um... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Toynbee, 5M Books. Um, it's a bit of a cheeky question. I was just asking whether uh, the panel's aware of the recently released film Six Inches of Soil um, and whether the room's aware of it. And 
give us a couple of sentences on it? So we know um, we'll, yeah, we'll so um, released at the Oxford Real Farming Conference. It follows three young regenerative farmers um, through a, a year, through 2000, uh, 2022, a horticulturist, um, a mob grazing regenerative uh, cattle farmer and a mixed farm with uh, sheep and arable. Thank you. Any film reviewers on the panel? <laughs> I'm only going to say that... Have you seen um, it or are you uh, just... Are no, you I haven't seen oh, it, but I'm oh, going to say that, so, that, that obviously it's fantastic and I know that five <laughs> them are publishing the book, which is, uh, which is even better. Um, um, but there are two other films coming out. One is Peter Big's series called Roots So Deep. I'm not sure where it's going to come. It'll be streaming. It's four hours over time. Uh, and there's another one. Uh, I'm interviewing the director in a couple of days uh, called Planet Soil, which is turning the soil, um, uh, it's turning the soil into Yusufari. Uh, so it's, it's the first kind of proper naturalist documentary about what happens in the soil. And I'm really excited to see some of the characters in there. Has anybody seen it? <laughs> That's on the list. Well, I mean, it is fascinating. I mean, the newfound reverence and you know, soil being hip is an extraordinary thing. I've got some you know, young producer friends who I work with who are in their uh, in their twenties, and they're really passionate and excited about soil. These are you know, TV my, and radio. My favorite producers. book is For the Love of Soil, which is okay. Nicole Manners, which is a fantastic book. Yeah, yeah. So it, it really is. I think uh, finally uh, finding its place in the sun. So uh, that is most welcome. Now, I think <laughs> we are. Yeah. Just, just gone one. So uh, I think it's time to, uh, to, to, to wrap up this panel. So to Andrew, to Tamsin, to Finlow, to Jude, Vicky and Dan, thank you very much indeed for your time. We've got an hour now.
Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, could I ask you to get be seated, please? Hello to you, Jackie. I'm Jackie. I used to work at Oh, you can sit here if you like. Huh. How are you? Good, that's great this morning. Both of you. Hi. Hi, Ed. Nice to meet you. So are you I'm ready? Are you nervous? No, you thanks. I'm, I'm an SRI person, not an SRP. I'm an SRI person, not an SRP. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Yes. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, that was a very fine lunch. Some of it is still around us here. It's like the second half of a party. We're all having fun around the old glasses and plates. Love it. A very real feeling. Um, now then, uh, we're going to um, have a, a, a talk from Professor Jacqueline McLean and then a discussion about soil. But we're actually going to open uh, this afternoon uh, with a film related to soil. And I think this film has come uh, from Tesco's. I've heard of them. I'm Natalie Smith, I'm Head of Agriculture for Tesco. As part of some of the challenges that our farmers have faced over the last 12 months, fertiliser costs has definitely been one of those. A huge amount of volatility, a massive spike in terms of prices. Fertiliser is a significant part of our produce carbon footprint and low carbon fertiliser not only has a benefit of providing a bit of stability in terms of cost and pricing, but also a win-win from an environmental perspective. It's one of the largest trials of low carbon fertiliser to better understand practical implementation and how we can look to scale up from a production perspective. The particular trial that we're doing with Hunter Pack is Crop Intellect and it's using their our leaf technology within their carrot supply chain. We've been supplying Tesco with carrots and plastics for the last four to nine years. The last 12 months have been a challenging growing year. We've had drought, we've had extremes of weathers. On top of that, we've had additional costs through labour, fertilisers, energy. With Tesco Low Carbon Fertiliser Traffic, it's identifying new options for us to use to reduce our carbon footprint. We trialled on a small scale initially, and we're now going to 50 hectares this next year for crop intellect. We've completed initial trials with Hunter Pack and outcomes of those have been really positive. Sustainability is a key part of what we do. How we use fertilisers and what we can do to improve some of our carbon footprint and emissions is a really important area of focus for us. Very, very good. Well, we are on to our keynote uh, speech now and that will is going to... Uh, be delivered by Professor Jacqueline McClay. Uh, Jacqueline is Professor of Sustainable Development and Knowledge Systems at University College London, and she's going to be looking at some of the trends and thoughts and data all around this area of, uh, of, of soil and where we're going on this journey. So, Jacqueline McClay, the floor is yours. Great. Well... Good afternoon, everybody. It's a huge pleasure to see 
see such a full room, and um, I'm hoping that by the end of it, I'll take you on a quick global tour, um, which is a sort of reflection of my life, which is slightly odd, a bit of a backstory, but I will explain as we go through why you're looking at certain things. But um, essentially what I'm going to try and capture today is two parts. Well, my challenge, I was given the talk. I didn't ask for it. I was told what to say, <laughs> David. Uh, so, could you just cover off the entire methods measurement issues around soil and carbon and everything else. Oh, and then while you're at it, could you then talk about the social, the ecological, the economic impacts of all of this, blah, blah, blah. So, um, so it's, a, it's a lecture in two parts. So one is rather scientific, and the second one is rather policy-orientated. And you'll forgive me, but that's kind of the nature of my life, which is, yes, I'm a professor at UCL, but I'm also a professor at Strathmore University in Kenya. Um, I'm married to a Maasai chief. You'll see lots of reasons why I believe that the Maasai have got some interesting things for us to learn about. Um, and you'll see some of the challenges of living in the Maasai Mara. Um, and I'm also, um, you know, no, no, no uh, nothing withheld, I'm also a co-founder of a company called Downforce, which measures many things, I hope, as accurately as possible with great precision. Um, but let me just then kick off, because you can see part one, part two, yes, right. So carbon drawdown, we talk about storage, we talk about removals, but essentially what we're trying to do is bring carbon into the ground using all of nature's power that we can. And when I was the chief scientist in the UN, it used to drive me crazy because we would have these huge policy debates. Um, I, I was kind of responsible for the environment pillar, <clears throat> for the sustainable development goals, all of the statistics. And prior to that, when I'd been in the European Environment Agency leading that, it was all about data and how to get all the sectors reporting in a way which was not too onerous, but would at least tell policymakers, are they getting it right? Are they on the right track? But when you get to the UN, it's a whole other game of policy and politics, because there is no common cause. You, you, you find, you think you're going to have a conversation about some environmental parameter, but actually what you are negotiating is territory in the middle of a desert. Okay, so you, you have to sort of read and weave all these things through. But at the end of the day, when we signed the Paris Agreement, and you know, to much, much accord, um, I really thought, finally, we've got the science, we've got the policy, and we've got the wherewithal, in other words, the finances, to move forward. Well, how wrong can you be? Um, and I'll tell you how wrong I was. Uh, but, but there was a sense then, which I'm feeling in this room, we could do again. And it's that positivity of bringing science into our conversations, bringing policy to be accountable, but at the same time to set long-term goals which are achievable. And I, I really do sense that with the amount of information we have at our fingertips, we can have a different argument. But I spend a long time in rooms which are not the echo chambers I want to be in. But this is a really nice echo chamber because everybody's really positive and we're all going in the same direction. So it's like having a holiday coming to talk to you, I can tell you, it's really nice. It's not people lobbing things from the back. Um, so I'm rather hoping that we're going to move in the left direction, in other words, the future that we want, rather than just sticking with the present that we, ha we currently have, despite all of its problems. But my first task was to ask about the science and really to think about carbon capture methods and measurement within the global farming system. But as we said today, global farming is transport, energy, land, uh, people, urban areas, diets, choices, you name it. It's all in global farming systems. So it's a completely quixotic world when it comes to trying to find the right things to measure, which will motivate, at one hand, a consumer, and at the other hand, a highly skeptical farmer, plus a policymaker that doesn't really like the fact that you're not a scientist from their country. Absolutely the case. In other words, if you're not from the UK and you're talking to a DEFRA person, all bets are off. And every country, I'm afraid, has that kind of knee-jerk reaction. So you're playing with all of that. So I, what I hope is that by the end of the first 10 minutes, you'll get a flavor of what I would call politically independent, neutral ideas about metrics. But I might spend some time talking about Australia, because Australia, now I see your attention, Australia is a long, long, long way ahead of the rest of the world. You might not think so, um, but it is absolutely clear to me, anyway, that the farmers there um, are confronting the climate 
future that we're potentially going to have, they're already in it. And it's making them make very, very different kinds of decisions. It's creating an ecosystem of different kinds of companies, of different kinds of support devices, policies, and regulations. So I was delighted, actually, to find a colleague here from SoilQuest from Australia. Hey, that's really good, Andrew, right? <laughs> One of the Aussie in the room. So it, it's really important that we don't get too stuck into the UK and really don't look at what other people are doing. It's incredibly important. So great that we have Tesco's and others here because they have products coming from there. So to put it bluntly, we've got some pretty formidable challenges in front of us. Huge skepticism. If I'm honest, you know, you could pack up and go home, quite honestly. If, you were, if you're in the business of trying to measure things, it's not that easy. And there's a huge skepticism, even amongst scientists, you can hear it, that the no-till, well, where's the evidence? Where's the proof? I could give you 40 papers on this hand that say there is no impact of no-till, and I can give you maybe 40 papers here that say regenerative agriculture is the absolute solution. And who's to judge? But my challenge to all of them, and including many academics, maybe even in this room, is that academic research unfortunately, is a long way away from the reality of farming. And what we haven't really got are enough researchers sitting on the farm, working with farmers, seeing the day-to-day, -day, and measuring things consistently enough to be able to really demonstrate and give evidence to farmers to show whether they're making a difference or not. So that's my number one. That's number challenge number one. Um, there's a kind of frenzy and a lack of consensus because of that frenzy about the reliability and the robustness of the measurement methods. When I was in the UN, I had a very simple rule, which is if you can't explain it to the policymaker, i.e. the minister sitting next to me, then you haven't got a chance of getting that method put into any kind of policy, right? So you have to be able to explain what you're doing, and part of that is creating trustworthy mechanisms that come back and give people a sense of the reality of what you're measuring looks like the reality of the person who's involved in delivering it, that being a farmer or a landowner. Um, we need to look way, way, way further than just in the soil looking for carbon. So it's all about natural capital. That's fine. We have accounting methods. But what we don't have are assurance methods, people who will insure you. So, you know, you put all this effort in, you store up natural capital, doing a great job. Can you find an insurance company that will insure you for the day that the flood comes and wipes it out? No, we haven't got to that level of sophistication yet. So we need more assurance methods. We need more auditing and financial things to come together. And then, I'm sorry to say, but I actually do think that there's a small, well, a shortage at least, of trusted, not agronomists, but climate smart agricultural advisors. So people who've had the experience, and I think probably in this room, many of you who are practitioners are almost the best people to be the advisors. I think you were saying, Farmers listen to other farmers, and, and that's really, really true. You know, professional advice comes cheaply. Experience is very expensive. So what are the responses? So this is the sort of science part, which is it's all very well to create narratives. And, I, and I'm a great believer in storytelling, but at the end of the day, you've got to have proper attribution science. Something happened because you did something. There was an intervention, and it had this effect. So many of the debates we have are groundless because you no one's gone out and really measured it sufficiently to be able to do the attribution. We need much, much more, I would say, rigorous and tough campaigns for intercalibration and validation. So I also used to work in the sort of satellite business. I, I was one of the team that put the Sentinel missions up, designed them, and so on. If you could imagine the intensity of the industry involved in that, which is three and a half years of intense calibration, intercalibration, people standing on the ground as the satellite goes over, taking a measurement, millions and millions of ground truth data so that we knew the sensors were measuring what they said they were measuring. Do we do that in most of our farming systems? No, we don't. So we need more rigorous intercalibration that's done independently. We also need global industrial standards. Having a protocol is not a standard. A protocol is a way of doing something. A standard is something that you get auditors in to go check, like an ISO standard or something like that. Now, the leaf mark is in that category because you have a group of people who go out and have something to measure it against. So we need more of those global, but I, I use the word industrial because that's really where we are. We're, we're in an industrial world 
of decarbonisation. Um, but it's all got to align with all these regulatory and reporting uh, requirements. So I, had a I sort of had a mantra, which I use all the time with member states and with participants in all these things, which is measure it once, use it many times. So make sure what you measure is really something that is valuable and is going to tell you a lot, because then you can use it many times. So if you're looking at SFI or BNG or TNFD or TCFD or SDDI and all those other ones, yeah, you need to be able to show that the measure you take, you can move from one of these regulatory environments to another. So you can put a lot of effort into making it high integrity and really worth the money and investment to go out and collect it. And then finally, how do we get this collaboration between local and global knowledge communities? So I'm not going to say too much about attribution science. Those of you who've watched the IPCC and seen the difficulties, the struggles that we had just to get that phrase, human-induced climate change. I mean, I started in the business in 1988 with Al Gore, and I tell you, it has been a very, 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 very long road to get just that phrase put in where you then have to add things like very likely and, and all the kind of caveats around it, okay? So attribution science is well known within the climate community, but attribution science in the soil science business is not so well sort of defined. And I just put this little graph on the right-hand side because when you're talking about, let's say, sequestration of carbon into soils, in principle, you need to be worrying about all of this are you working at the particle level, the aggregate level? Are you at the farm or the landscape scale? Because different processes will be working at all those different scales. Or oh, don't forget time, because of course there'll be things happening on nanoseconds and days and years and decades and etc. So you have this enormous intersection of potential, potential drivers of change, and it, it would drive you crazy if you really thought you could describe soils directly molecule for molecule. So we have to be smart about it. We have to think about what are, the, what are the big things that will determine the health of a soil, the health of a crop, the health of a biome, and so forth. And just to give you a kind of an idea, I just put this, it was a, a table in a paper from um, uh, USDA, from the US Department of Agriculture. And it's really just to say that when you do work like they have done, which is going out consistently in a particular area and been very precise about the kinds of studies of no-till, in this case, tilled, um, surface residue you replace, these were particular um, agricultural practices, then you begin to have a lot more confidence in the kinds of data that come out. And sure enough, as we've seen actually with our eyes, you can see, of course, there are big differences between the till, the no-till, and so on. So the practice that you had, for example, and you showed and you talked about this morning and others have shown in their pictures of fields is visual, but we actually need government agencies, researchers, and so on to come back with extremely well thought through data that will tell you the difference by depth, by seasonal range, and so on, to disambiguate all the different parts of the attribution of science. Now, the second thing is you need to do intercalibration and validation. So we consistently, I want to say we, I mean, there's a large community of trusted academics, let me put it like that, who sort of believe that if you've got your research grant to go and do something, that it must be of high enough quality, otherwise you wouldn't have got the grant. Okay, that's good, excellent. And so then off they go and they, they, they do the study. But it takes a skeptic sometimes to say, well, just because you got the grant doesn't mean to say that the methodology you're using is exactly the right methodology to achieve what you want. So here's the case in point. And when we part, I'll explain what we did, but essentially we're looking at how do you go out and sample the soil carbon pooled in a way which is meaningful and fit for purpose, and you measure it once and use it many times. Because what you're trying to do is to create, a, in this case, a greenhouse gas account. You want to know how much soil is being sequestered, how much is being lost in all these different ways. So if you do greenhouse gas protocol work, this is the kind of accounting you need to fulfill. So I got fed up, and this is now me wearing my hat as downforce. So working with Plymouth University in Reading in this country, with Charles Sturt in, um, the, in Australia, and then with colleagues also then in the US, we've started to really stress the point 
So we've got lots of novel, different kinds of sensors entering in. So people will turn up with an EM, or they'll turn up with a gamma, or they'll turn up with X, Y, and Z, or a spectrometry, or whatever. Okay? And one of the things you realize quickly is that these are all black, many of them are black box. So you hire them, they come to your farm, they look very busy, go up and down, seeing lots of data, it's very intense. They send you back a pretty picture, excellent. And, and then they tell you the number. So your soil organic carbon, Philip, is 2.8, okay? Got that? 2.8. And it's the, all those fields, absolutely. No problem at all, right? Did they tell you the variability? Did they tell you the error? Did they tell you what the library was? No, no, because that's inside the black box. Well, I, it, I get fed up with that. So I said, well, oh, well let, let's have an all comers go. All come to Riverford. Bring all your instruments. Bring every instrument that's out there. Let's go out on the same day. And let's all measure the same fields. All right? Take the soil samples, send them to the labs. Do the spectroscopy, do the EM, do the gamma, all the fancy things. Send a drone over, all of that. All right? And then let's gather and see what we got. Okay, right. This is what we got. Well, the first problem was that we tested all the sampling protocols. So who uses with their agronomist a W when they get their soil samples taken? Right, hands up, come on. It's not bad or good. Excellent, right. Who uses a random stratified sample? Sounds, sounds slightly more sophisticated. Excellent. Who does dense grids? Well, actually, you can't afford it, so probably nobody, all right? Okay. <laughs> um, who, who takes one sample and puts it all in a bag and shakes it up? You laugh. You laugh. However, <laughs> in the standard methodology, it's quite often done like that. Um, how many of you are careful enough to take the first 10 centimeters, then the 10 to 30, or 10 to 20? Oh, there's a man after my heart, and then 30 downwards, right? And you don't go and shake it in a bag and mix it up and send it off to the lab, do you? No, you don't. But I mean, how crazy is that? Okay. So um, we did all of that. We got a you know, guy out there, took all the samples, et cetera, et cetera. So shock of horrors, the sampling protocol alone gives you a 15% difference in your soil organic carbon. Now, most of us would be really happy if over a five-year period you had a, maybe a 5% increase in your soil carbon, wouldn't you? You'd be really, really... But if you knew that if you just sampled it slightly differently, you might have got a better number, that would probably lead you to some unrest. But it's more serious in Australia, because Australia has the only soil compliance market. Soil carbon is a compliance market in Australia, and so you can lose big money. So our first encounter in Australia was turning up where a farmer said, I went out five years ago, I did my sampling as expected by the regulator, I did my regenerative activities, I thought I was doing really well, I did all these great things, cover crops, et cetera, et cetera, no-till, and then I went out and I measured it again as per prescribed. And then they told me that my carbon had gone down. And I'm now expected to pay back a lot of money. Okay, so this is, this is really the, the cutting edge of where you can end up in a very bad situation. So we looked at it and said, no, actually your carbon hasn't gone down. It's gone up. And the reason simply was that the sampling had gone to particular parts of the property. Some of it had been in highly variable parts and others had been in more static parts. But if he had known and had enough money, it was quite a large farm, it's 5,000 hectares, but if you imagine doing it on 20,000, 60,000, 600,000 hectares, where you can't afford to do that level of sampling, of course you're gonna go and just take a few and hope for the best. But this is not a hope for the best situation at all. So, word of warning, be very, very careful when you get soil sampling, if you get soil sampling done. Now, Downforce, which is the company that, that I co-founded, just as an aside, we, we don't rely on any of that. We use all of the data that exists for any part of the world, and then we tested it blind, so we looked at our data versus the most intense sampling, which was 300 samples taken in the field, and we had a match rate of 92%, and we didn't have to go to the field. That's another story, but the point being that we emulate the dense sampling as opposed to the one or two or the W. So when you want to describe the amount of variability that's in the natural world, you have to be asking again and again, am I getting access to the right kind of information? Because if not, 
I'm going to be reporting and disclosing financially in a way which is not underpinned by real evidence. And here's another example. So in the UK, we now have an SFI coming along and saying, we'll pay you a lot for hedgerows. And so I've been working with Essex on all sorts of things, landscapes, I'm a climate commissioner, so we looked at everything, green spaces and so on. And about two years in, they came back and they said, we think that hedgerows are really important. I said, yeah, hedgerows are really important, not just because of biodiversity, but because they leach carbon into the soil. So they're incredibly important. So how many, how many kilometers of hedgerow have we got in Essex? And they said, well, we don't know. Why, why don't we know? Well, there's a laboratory. I can say this because I used to be a lab director. So we have a laboratory, and, but we have to pay for it. No, no, you're a public body. No, 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 this is ridiculous. Okay, so we'll get the data. And then we discovered it was just a tiny bit of Essex had the hedgerows actually calculated. And yet here we are with an SFI payment on how many kilometers of hedgerow do you have? So I said, well, it can't be that difficult. So looking at now this, these sort of four pictures, this is the Google version of that same picture. Not very good. This is the ESA world cover, slightly better. This is the UK CEH picture, getting better. And, and this was the one that Downforce did. And why is that different? Well, it's because this actually interrogates the land as you see it, but it, it can interrogate it every 10 days. So we no longer have to wait five years for an update to the land cover. But now it does several things because you can go and look at the rural, the rural payments agency and you can find out how many people actually got paid for hedgerows when they didn't have any. That's another matter. But there's also an enormous resource which is not being accounted for. So I would really love to say to every farmer, let's get your hedgerows done properly, but then let's also look at how much carbon they're putting into the soil because they're not just there for biodiversity, they're actually there to help the whole ecosystem. So they're not just an odd element that sits in the, in the landscape, they're an incredibly powerful piece of it together with woodlands and others. And I think at the end of the day, this is where I get a little bit frustrated with policy, is that you can have fantastic data, you can get into standard setting, but at the end of the day, we need policies that join it all up. Genuinely, that's what we need. So we need industrial standards. How many people have heard of VERA? Well, you're all good Guardian readers, obviously. Excellent. So there was an expose. Uh, there's a particular way of measuring carbon. When I was in the UN, I was really nervous about it because I felt that it uses counterfactuals. It talks about the future rather than the past and so on. But when I, when I sat back and I thought, okay, why, why are these... Why is it not really working to the point where people have got confidence as an industrial standard? And I realized that actually the BSI and its equivalent were never involved. It, it actually is an academic exercise. That's how these standards have come about from the bottom. But we now need proper sort of standard setting bodies to get involved and to put in place auditors and so on. And that's why the leaf mark is very good, because it could grow up to be things like the ISO. It's an integrated one. Now, I put ISO up because it's very specific. It's the greenhouse gas protocol, and you need to apply it. When you do apply it, you can then do things like this. You can talk about what's the threshold, what's the baseline, how much carbon is going in every 10 days, and then you can really look at an outcome, which is a historical delivery of carbon in the ground, and it's not a forecast. So it's actually, did you change your farming practice? Did you do cover crops? And we can detect it, so now we can see how much carbon went in because of that intervention. And that's how industrial standards work. They're really powerful if they're tuned to the right thing. So measurement and methods, okay, need to be brought up a little bit more, but you need to have a home for them, and international agreements are fine, but they're not the basis of running an industry. So you need to go the next step and take yourself, so to speak, seriously. So you think the airline industry doesn't have industrial standards? Of course they do. That's why they shut down airplanes and do all of that. So that's actually what I feel the agricultural sector, broadly speaking, needs, not to be more onerous, but to give you a kind of standing credibility alongside of all those things that attract a lot of investment, you know, ships, trains, et cetera, et cetera. So global standards are really important. With this kind of financial grade data, that's sort of what we're looking for. 
And then, of course, you need to align the business needs with all the various things that farmers today are doing. So that could be net zero planning, it could be crop rotations, timing of amendments, but you also need traceability. And this particular one I love, it's a, it's a client actually in um, Australia, it's cotton, called Good Earth Cotton. They've perfected a way to improve soil carbon, but at the same time reduce the amount of water, so they do dryland cotton. So they use 90% less water than any other cotton producer. Their brands are Nike, Ikea, H&M, uh, and so on. Now, for them, they needed to in introduce a traceability so that when I buy a jacket and I'm in Paris and it's a really top designer, I want to be able to scan it to know exactly where my cotton has come from. So these guys have invented something called fiber trace. It's a rare earth that goes in at the ginning and it's in every single fiber of the cotton. So when the bales arrive in the, in the auction houses, you scan it and you say, oh yeah, that's a good earth cotton bale. And that goes all the way into the clothing, literally to the point where you can wear a pair of jeans and now you can go right down to the field where it's grown and you link that to, is that a net zero or a carbon positive cotton field? Now, that completely changes the consumer's view of that product. So if we can do it in cotton, we're going to do it in wool, we can definitely do it in many other things. So that's just a, just a kind of thought for you. But at the same time, we also want to be able to have sort of precision insofar as you can repeat data, but where we can create the opportunity for farmers to do rotations and understand the consequences of them in terms of carbon and soil health. So that's an example where you go through a rotation. This happened to be a farmer looking after lupins, wants to introduce them into, into the human uh, food chain. And he said, I'm pretty sure I'm going to great, create a great product but I also want to know, am I doing anything for soil health? So, of course, he was delighted. Oh, it's, in Australia, it's ridiculous. It's like 0 0.001. But anyway, big hit, you know, lupins can increase carbon. But only if you put them in succession with several other crops. So I think that's the picture. It's very complicated, but it doesn't have to be difficult. You just have to have traceability through all of these different stages. And that's the important thing about data and measurement is not self-serving, it's there for a purpose, to help you get a better outcome and hopefully a better price in the market. That's why we do it. It's the only reason in many ways that farmers respond is that, is this going to get me a better client, a better customer, a better brand, and am I going to be able to prove all the claims that I'm making? And this is just to give you a little nightmare, but no, it's fine. Uh, it's <laughs> so farmers love soil organic carbon, but they also need to worry about bulk density. Because actually, if you do intervene and do a very deep plow, you can change the structure. But the good news is that the soil can come back. So if you do somehow destroy structure of soils, it will come back. It may take some time. So if you take very heavy machinery, as you can imagine, or you do potatoes, where there's a potato grower here. I, shouldn't, I, I should be very careful now on potatoes. Yeah, potatoes, very careful. Lose a lot of carbon with potatoes. But, but anyway, if you, if you keep on taking potatoes, <laughs> you can do a lot of harm to your, uh, to your crops. But the bulk density will sort of come back. So that's the great thing about nature. You can be very abusive to it, and it will generally try to find its way back. And, and now here I, I offer a word of pity and sympathy. <laughs> Because, seriously, there are just so many things coming at companies and coming at farmers that it's, it's sort of unbelievable that one would be able to find a way through it all. But having been on the other side and, and written some of these, mea culpa, I, I feel that even the policymakers are going to get tired very soon and they're going to have to find a way to align all of them. So, you know, TCFD... I'm sure some of you must be doing TCFD. You will, some of you, already be doing TNFD. You, hopefully, some of you are doing SBTI. That's not a gym exercise. That's definitely something which is aspirational and you need to be there. And then there'll be some other things, CDR and so on. But wouldn't it be great if a measure like soil organic carbon measured in a particular way at a particular frequency with all the guidelines put in was the same measurement for every one of those. 
So for TCFD, you have a soil organic carbon. You take that number and you can put it into that. Then you can put it into the nature one. You can put it in your target for carbon scope three removals, not scope three emissions. So now you have the other side of the balance book. So all of these elements, which are all coming towards you, if you haven't already got them, are going to be asking you to do many different things. So maybe one of the things that LEAF can help to do is to be quite firm. If we're going to measure soil carbon, let's say, let's do it this way. Let's all do it in the same way. And then we, as an industry, are saying, OK, policymakers, this is how we're going to measure it. The scientists like it. Everybody likes it. This is the way. And then you only have to think about it once. You do it once, and then you use it for all these different reporting mechanisms. That, that's the sort of the sweet spot that we're after. And to help you do that, um, we created a, a kind of community of all the soil carbon companies who are very, very competitive, I have to say, but we all agreed in the room that we could work together to affect this particular outcome. That soil carbon is really important for soil health, for the planet, for food, all those things. So we have a common set of messages. And yes, they may be measuring it in slightly different ways, but there's a bigger purpose. And how you get there is sometimes going to be jurisdictional, but nevertheless, we're all going to go in the same direction. And that's incredibly, incredibly important because it becomes part of a farmer's narrative. So that when a farmer goes out into the field and maybe is filmed and has soil in his hand or her hand and says, this is the basis of my success and it is the land and how much investment I've put in, it can be believable because actually it's not that sample. It's the fact that the farmer knows he's got many, many, many other samples and many other data, but this is the icon of that measurement because then the public get it. They absolutely get it. So that's the point of these different um, sort of communities. And I hope maybe that's something that LEAF and sort of industrial groups can get together on. Um, right, second half of lecture, much more quick. Okay, this is the disaster movie. So we had the, we had the sort of science movie. Now we've got the disaster movie. Um, these are the challenges. So now I see life in a very different way. I'm not, I'm not a scientist. I'm just going to point out some of the things why we need to do it. So we heard about various, you know, I think David put the first picture up about, you know, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. So there's a group called the, draw, the Drawdown, Project Drawdown, and they had this wonderful idea several years ago that we were going to do this, bend the curve. And the idea of bend the curve, just me, sorry. The idea of bend the curve came actually in 2015, a little bit earlier in Copenhagen. Um, I made some films about it for, the, for, for Europe. And it was all about if we all work together, we could get ourselves going down instead of carrying on. Well, here we are eight years later, and we're still doing that. And the planet is now doing that. So when this was made, we were at 395 parts per million. Sure. We were at 395 parts per million, and the man's going to give me a nice new one of these. Okay. Oh, it wasn't me. I don't think so. Oh, it wasn't my fault. Um, okay. So I can take that out. Okay. The curve has just continued to go up. The one on the right-hand side at the bottom is this famous place in Mauna Loa, where they measure every day, twice a day, um, what the carbon dioxide equivalent is, is the concentration in the air. So this shows no sign of going down, and hence the UNEP reports, which I sort of started, which is the emissions gap report, is now a broken record, because it's simply not happening. And the Paris Agreement is literally standing you know, outside in the, in the litter bin. Now, what's happened, though, in the meantime, is that finally, member states have started to put all of these, oh dear, started to put all of these stressors, drivers together, and... If you look at that picture, which is a sort of caricature of the world, you have down in the corner systemic failure, which is what we're looking at now in many places, like in the Middle East, in Ukraine, and so on. And you can see there's an awful lot more on the building stresses side than on the mitigating factors. And that's really the problem. We have so, so many stresses being pushed into the system that you don't know whether to turn right or left, whether to go up or to go down, because you're not sure that the mitigating factors are going to fix many of these. And climate change is precisely that. It's a threat multiplier, and it will make it worse. The other thing that makes it worse is us. We're completely addicted to our way of life. So we have you know, a hierarchy of you know, 
I've earned all this money, I earn respect, I'm a very important person, I've earned my security. And then you've got people saying, no, 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 everybody deserves security, everybody deserves a proper life and so on. So I hate to tell you this, but you know, we have to, we have to get real about what we're addicted to. And it's not just fossil fuels, it's, it's the way that we think about the planet. And none more so than when we think about where our food is going to come from. So yes, very, very likely that we'll have a huge pressure on those lands that are not so impacted by climate change to produce more food, which is ironic when you think about the UK, when you consider how much land we have available. But along with that comes some really nasty things. So as climate change starts to diminish or cut down some of the opportunities for growth, then we have molds appearing. We have not very pleasant molds, I have to say. Um, and they perpetuate because just the right conditions are there. It's slightly too wet, slightly too warm, and then it just proliferates everywhere. And we've seen this with rice, we've seen it with maize, we see it with aflatoxins. Now, we're very lucky just now in the UK about aflatoxins because it turns out that we don't have too many. And there's a strip of water, which for whatever reason also helps us. But one microgram, oh dear, one microgram of aflatoxin essentially will kill a child. One microgram of aflatoxin. Aflatoxin causes cancers. It causes so many things. In Kenya, 50% of all the foodstuffs, like maize that are stored, are contaminated with aflatoxin. So this is on its way, and the, and the pictures that we have for Europe is telling us that aflatoxin is marching its way up through Spain. It's now all around the Mediterranean. So again, it means farmers in those areas need to be extra careful. So you're worried about weeds, you're worried about disease, but you should also worry about things that the plants are doing. So we've got lots of our plants, sorghum and so on, that have a defense mechanism for drought. And it's basically, they produce prussic acid to protect themselves. When they get a bit of water, the cells which are containing the prussic acid burst. So if you eat that, it's like eating cyanide. Okay? So we see it now already. In East Africa, we have many places where people have got staggers, they're going blind. It's because the plants have turned on another mechanism which makes them toxic. Um, this is where I live. This is the drought. These are all the animals I lost. For, we lost thousands and thousands of cattle. So we've now decided not to do that again um, and not really to be pastoralists and to change production and to invest in grassland improvement um, and to bring sort of smaller numbers of cattle, new breeds and so on. So it's changing entirely the way of life. So this is a social, ethical question. It's not just about agriculture. It's not just about livelihoods. Um, and at the root of it all, it is partly market failure and human frailties, but it's also because we don't really have a proper framework to address all of these issues around climate change. In other words, a rights-based approach for this. And yes, we have, in fact, today Greta Thunberg, as you know, is in court for demonstrating. So, you know, where, where do, you, do you want to see her in court? No, we don't want to see a young person in court for standing up for the future. Of course we don't. So climate justice may not, you know, it may pass you by, but for young people, it's real. It's absolutely real. And, you know, so we have to take it very seriously. So decarbonizing our society is the headline. How can we do it naturally? So these are roads in China. I hope we don't go there. And this is a lovely solar place in Hampshire where they've spent a lot of time doing biodiversity and so forth. So we kind of are on a way. But when we think about how we're going to make the decarbonization happening, it's not just about how we grow our food. It's about many other things. It's about the fires that may be created for land clearance and so on and so forth. So every one of these activities, in one way or another, not only transforms the carbonization process, but transforms lives. And so I think that you, know, you could just imagine every one of these areas occupying somebody's life, trying to make the difference here. So it's about rethinking agriculture, from plantain ecologies to renewable, from industrial, uh, really taking a, account of the soils. And so what that means is we have to invest in nature. And we have something called payment for ecosystem services. It's in the policies of some countries. Kenya, for example, has it. Others have it. Um, and does it work? Actually, it does. What you're trying to do is give people a motive and a motivation to invest, even if they're not landowners. 
because payment for ecosystem services per se is not really the answer because you have countries like Brazil and the previous president who then say, pay me for not burning down the forest. That's exactly what he said. And of course, Norway said, no, we don't trust you. So we're not going to pay you. But that's the kind of rhetoric you get. It's, it's like blackmail on a continental scale. You pay me and I won't do something bad. That's not, why we want, that's not how we want to do payment for ecosystem services. We want to do it the other way. We want to invest. And so what better way than to use the climate funds and subvert them in a way to yield outcomes that are good for communities, not just for a few businesses. So if you are a shareholder on any of these companies, please vote accordingly, climate smart agriculture and community-led activities. But just imagine that all of this, like the Amazon, is, the, it is like the biggest asset that we have on planet Earth. But we don't really have a ledger. The UN tries to keep one, but actually we don't really have a ledger about how healthy all of the ecosystems are, what's their productivity, and so on. We have an agricultural ledger. We have a forestry ledger. We may have a sort of a water ledger, but it's not that good. And we have a poor air quality ledger, and so on and so forth. What we don't have is a ledger for the whole planet. And frankly, we need it, because what we can't afford as we go forward in this sort of rethinking is to have a separate logic for our economy compared to the natural world. We just simply cannot afford anymore to separate them. And I think that's why LEAF is just so important, because it's already put it together. And, and I would that, it was, would that it wasn't just A and farming, but it was for the whole society. So that could be LEAF. Um, and then we need to turn the, the accountants into nature accountants, nature asset accountants. They need to be thinking about birds as well. We also have to think about new legal traditions. If you look at old, uh, if you look at tribal areas and so on, they have a very different tradition about the rights of trees, the rights of land, uh, the rights of soil. So effectively, there was an entire legal tradition which protected the world until humans sort of came along and did a lot to it. But that legal tradition has been eaten away. And some countries, South Africa and others, have reinstated that so that you have people going to court to speak on behalf of a river or to speak on behalf of landscapes. And, and it's very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. We need to restore ecosystems. That's my village. That's my mud hut, by the way. That's where I live. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but restoring ecosystems... You can't just simply put a few trees in. So don't say, we're going to plant 15 billion trees. It's got to be the right trees in the right place to do the right things and so on. So I was delighted to have a conversation with a, a, very, a former colleague who's trying to do precisely that. It's, it's very inspiring. And I think that's why farmers who know their land will probably know what kinds of things to plant. The beetle banks, the grass, all of that. You don't just choose an ad hoc seed mix from your local seed supplier you think about maybe even collecting the seeds that are stored in the, in the soil where you are. And place really matters. So at the end of the day, we can have great science, we can have fantastic policies, but to make it work, it has to work in a particular place with all of the context, with all of the history, and with everything that counts and has led to the history of that place and people. And so... In a way, I, I do work in lots of places. One of them is here in the, in, the, in the Outer Isles in Scotland. It's about a new thinking of prosperity for all of us, not just for farmers. But it's a, it's a sort of prosperity which is based on not only belonging and culture and stewardship, but it's about linking people to the place, but then to the planet. So it's having the two and connecting it and knowing that the data that you're doing something counts at a planetary scale, but at the same time, you know that you're making a difference locally. And that, for me, is actually what the social contract should be as we go forward for everybody, not just farmers. Thank you. Thank you. One, two, three. Are we working? I think we are. Right. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, uh, Jacqueline. For me, You're welcome. Get my uh, my uh, stuff together. Um, uh, you did go a little over time. Um, I started late. Uh, well, even then. 
Um, uh, so what we're going to do is um, is we're going to go on to the, uh, the, the the panel. You are going to be represented in the discussion afterwards. So I think we should go on to the uh, the, the, the panel on soils uh, now. But starting whilst um, the panelists who are uh, Jane and Jonathan Armitage and Duncan Farrington, uh, um, yeah, you can you can come to the stage. If you three come to the stage now, Jacqueline, you're very I'm welcome to stay you there if much. you wish. Um, while we have a film from uh, Duncan, while you all come to the stage and get mic'd, you haven't been, but you have been, I think. Thank you. Let's just... Hello, I'm Duncan Farrington. Welcome to our family farm in Northamptonshire, where we produce Farrington's Mellow Yellow Rapeseed Oil. We are very proud to be certified carbon neutral. We worked with One Carbon World to measure our carbon footprint, which we had reduced through practices such as reduced cultivation and fertilizer use and installing solar panels. We offset the remainder through a One Carbon World grant. Our biggest achievement is increasing our soil carbon content, although this is not currently counted towards our carbon neutrality. We are now a UK case study for agriculture CO2 looking to change this by looking at how soils can be evaluated at scale to accurately measure soil carbon content with an ambition to create an internationally trusted and verifiable certification to help land managers improve soil health, creating a financial and moral incentive to manage land for the huge potential from carbon sequestration. We'll be hearing from uh, Duncan in a moment, but you'll have to save your excitement because first we are going to hear from the equally exciting Professor Jane Rickson of Cranfield University, who is one of the total uh, godmothers of soil. Jane. Oh, God bless you, Tom. Godmother of soil. I didn't. You introduced me first of all. I didn't have a surname, but now I have got a surname. So yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to. Um, talk about the soils, which I am very passionate about, and I'd like to share some of my thoughts uh, with you on this. That's good. That was my opening slide, so that's fantastic. So I was given this title as well, as I think all my, my fellow panelists have been. So first of all, what lies beneath? That sounds a bit suspicious, doesn't it? So uh, yes, uh, but I've been asked to make the case for better soil management to underpin sustainable farming practices. And we've heard a lot already about the importance of soils. I'm a, I'm a geographer by background, a physical geographer by background, who has seen the error of her ways and, and has now specialized in soil science. And I'm a great, uh, passionate uh, believer in the importance of soils. So I was asked this afternoon in my eight minutes to talk about the value of soils. How do we actually put pounds, shillings, and pence to the importance of soils and sustainable soil management? How do we actually do that? So let's look on the bright side of things in terms of what the healthy soils give us. And of course, there's a huge debate as to what we mean by soil health. See me afterwards if you would like that debate because there is yeah, many definitions as you've had hot dinners, frankly. But healthy soils are part of this natural capital, delivering these multiple ecosystems, goods and services. And that's not just me saying that. That is according to the UN and particularly the UN Sustainable <coughs> Development Goals, which I'm going to talk about. What I love as a soil scientist is that that can then directly link to sustainability, which is what this conference is all about. The economic sustainability of our farming businesses. So in other words, you know, it's hard to be green when you're in the red, so it's really important. I think a point was made this morning. You've got to make the economic profitability of these farms to keep farming businesses in, in business. It's also really important soils pr protect the environment. They give us all of these environmental benefits. And something that we haven't talked about very much in this conference, and is often the case, is also the social pillar of sustainability, keeping people in their livelihoods, making the most of their skills. There was a question this morning about am I supposed to continue with the livelihood that I know? I think it was a beef producer. Do I continue um, using my skills, using my, my legacy of knowing how to run my farm successfully? That is the social pillar of sustainability that we don't talk much about. With all of these land use changes, what new skills are required? What skills will go out of date? And so on. That's something that we don't talk about. And I would argue, again, soils underpin both the economic, environmental, and social pillars of sustainability. 
That, in turn, is related to human health and well-being. Healthy soils give healthy crops, which means we are healthy livestock and humans and so on. And again, that's not me just doing a PR for soils. This is according to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And that is associated, and this is where politicians start to pay attention. That, in turn, is related to individuals and national economic status. What is it? We're only two meals away from social unrest. And this is, if you think, what happened in the Arab Spring. That was all about food prices, market prices. And if we start, oh, I won't go on about starting degrading soil, because that's my next slide. So I'll hang on to the good things first before I all depress you with how bad soil degradation can be. This table is a snapshot of what we get from soils. If we all think about what we have for lunch today, I think it was Jude mentioned 94% of our food comes from soil. And so I've highlighted its agricultural production, its food, its fiber. Somebody else was talking about it's, it's all the Fs. It's food, fiber, fodder, pharmaceuticals. That's cheating, but you know what I mean. Fuel, biofuel, that's a big issue as well. We get these from healthy soils. We also, soils are important for water storage and supplies. Look at the flooding that we've had. These increased extreme weather events. Where is that, all that water going? It's not going into the soil because we've started to degrade our soil. They are not those sponges at the catchment level. So what do we have? Runoff and flooding and peak flows and so on. We do need, I'm not a Luddite, I do know that we also need land for development. With a daughter who is an urban planner, don't hate me, uh, she is an urban planner, but we do need land for development, definitely. We need residential, industrial infrastructure. But are we using the right land resources? You know, the agricultural land capability classification, really, really important that we know what are our best quality land and what is land that is fit for purpose for urban development and so on. We also know that, oh, Tom's leg's fallen off. <laughs> not, not so great then. Sorry, Tom, I'm, I shouldn't do it. Right, regulation. But I also know that soils, not only are they very important for food, we had a delightful lunch and 94% of that came, not the salmon, okay, but 94% came. But we also know that soils are really important in regulating things like water storage, not only for flood control, but also in drought. If we manage our soils that hold on to that water. Water retention is also really, really important. This is the wonderful things about soils. It takes it all in, but it also releases it as well. So when it's available during flood to store it and then drought to release it to the crop. Carbon storage, we've heard a lot, and that was fantastic about how we measure the dam stuff. Real, real challenge. And as a soil scientist, I totally understand how do we measure those metrics. And then we get on to the sort of soft, and touchy-feely things like landscape aesthetic. How much would you pay when you come, when you arrive back in a, on an airplane? I shouldn't say that because that's carbon, not that's high carbon. But when you land back in your home country and you see your landscape, how much joy does that give you that you're home? And that is a function of the soil. The landscape around us, even urban soils, give us a particular landscape that we have that sense of place that you were mentioning before. That's thanks to soils. Um, recreational immunity. Everybody likes the football, let's be honest. So again, soils are very important for recreation, amenity, cross-country running, all of this, but, and protection of heritage, archaeology. All of these things from that brown, muddy stuff that everybody thought dirt. Oh! No, not at all. You'll get fined. Okay, very good. And then finally, oh yes, all right, do go, by all means. Uh, and then finally, supporting. We've talked a lot about habitats and biodiversity. Again, I would argue, where would we be with habitats and biodiversity if it wasn't for the soil? It's not just me saying this. Uh, if you then, this is a bit of work that was done by IBES, who looked at the relationship between soils and land and all of the 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. And you can relate soil to every single one of the Sustainable Development Goals. So if that doesn't show how important soil is, I don't know what is. So this is a wonderful quote that will be on my gravestone when I pass away. The thin layer of soil covering the Earth's surface represents the difference between survival and extinction for most terrestrial life. And this is my visual aid that I have. 
which I normally cut up into the various different segments. But if you imagine that that is the planet, three quarters of that apple is oceans, rivers. We can't actually produce food from that, from that three quarters of the planet. A quarter of the planet is available for agriculture. About two thirds of that will be for livestock. About a third of that again, of the quarter that I'm talking about, this is when it gets horrible with fractions and everything. But basically, very little of our global surface, which is a finite amount, is available for agriculture. And then when you think we're just dealing with the peel of that apple, that we have to feed 10 billion people. And the challenge there is how important we value our soils, because that is that thin layer of soil that has to feed the world. Now, we were asked, OK, you're, you're doing a very good PR job on SARS. You put a value to that. The economists want a number. I cannot put a number to that. And I'm sure there will be economists in the room who will be much better than me in actually putting pounds, shillings, and pence. Agriculture is quite easy to put a value on how much we get from soils. But how do you do those cultural? How do you add biodiversity? How do you put water regulation? How do you put those numbers? We were asked to do this by DEFRA. What is the value of soil to UK PLC? Really difficult to do. So we flipped that coin and said, OK, what happens if you don't have healthy soils, if you don't look after the soils? What is the impact on the economy then? Now, are you doing that? Yes, all right, OK. This is a horrible table, which I should never show you. But I want to just demonstrate that we have been able to do this and actually put a cost of soil degradation, it's the other side of the coin. What happens if you don't look after your soils? So here we have all the degradation processes, basically how we can, technical terms, graph our soils. Soil erosion, soil compaction, loss of organic matter, diffuse contamination, loss of soil biology, soil surface sealing with urban development and so on and so forth. And along the top are all those ecosystems, goods and services that we get from soils, agricultural production, flooding control, regulation, water quality. How much does it cost you to actually clean your water to be potable and so on? Greenhouse gas emissions, cultural. A couple of things to notice, lots of question marks. We just do not know what those answers are. We can't quantify that because the data is not there. But where we do have data to um, quantify the impact of poor soil quality, soil health, we came up with a value of 1.8 million, sorry, 1.8 billion, oh, got my units wrong there, quite important, 1.8 billion pounds per annum is costing the UK PLC, or well, that actually is just England and Wales, we did some more work for Scotland as well. So my point is that if we don't have healthy soils, if we don't look after our soils, we continue to degrade our soils, then this is the sort of cost, the economic cost, to the country in terms of not looking after our soils. And I know that's the wrong way of looking at it. We should say how much is the value, but that's very difficult. Tom, I will shut up, I promise. What can we do about... Oh, shut up. That's really down a Debs. I've really brought everybody down saying, look, we're degrading our soil, we're costing our country this. But there's lots that we can do, and that's what LEAF is all about. It's about aiming to avoid that soil degradation, first of all, and then regenerate soil resources. And if I may re-quote, I think it's all about building back better. And I know I shouldn't say that for all sorts of reasons. But to me, that's what regenerative agriculture is about as far as soils are concerned. It's what we've got, but we need to actually build back better by using some of this integrated farm management practices, soil management, land management, crop management, to then give us our healthy soils back again. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that was great. And now uh, we're going to be moving to uh, Joel Carlton, Joel Scott Carter, our wonderful sponsor and host here today, who's going to talk about the emerging implications uh, of the market for both soil carbon sequestration and Thanks, Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. I feel properly um, intellectually dwarfed and um, scientifically a bit beaten up, which I think has put me in a perfect place, actually, to talk 
uh, about how all this stuff lands uh, at the farm level. Um, so, yeah, we're all embarking on the early phases of a shift in focus for farming. And um, for long-term LEAF members in the room, that's perhaps not such a new approach. But for mainstream farming, for the bulk of farming in the UK, uh, it's new, and for many people, it's pretty scary. Um, the conversations we've been having this morning um, are quite different to those that we were having even maybe five years ago. Uh, so what does this all mean uh, at a farm business level? Well, in a moment, Duncan will tell you exactly uh, what that means for his business, uh, very much at a farm business level. Um, I've only got about eight minutes, so I'm going to make a few points or perhaps raise uh, a few questions in the Q&A afterwards. But the first point I want to make is that the rapid reduction in the basic payment scheme receipts for farmers is now being really keenly felt. Uh, now, there is hope amongst farmers that... Uh, the natural capital markets and an approach to farming that relies less on expensive manufactured, in, manufactured inputs will be their saviour. Uh, Strutt and Parker's PR team are uh, sick of me saying this in response to their questions to me, but everything is complicated. Uh, different sectors have different challenges, individual farms are different. But the one thing we know is that marginal productivity gains are not the answer on their own to the loss of BPS for farming businesses. Uh, for many sectors, their financial returns uh, reflect global commodity markets. Uh, and risk. Risk has come up in almost every, everyone's um, speech talk um, today. And it's, it's getting more. The amount of working capital that we, has to be deployed on farm before any return is crystallised is getting higher. And it's more expensive because interest rates are going up. Now, we know that performance is about people. Uh, and much of the leadership in our industry finds the new circumstances daunting. Uh, they're uncertain on how to respond to some of this. And whilst new income streams are developing, there are a plethora of businesses, as we've, as we've been talking about today, uh, operating in this natural capital space, vying for farmers' attention. But the same applies, again, as we've been talking about today, certainly this morning, um, the same applies to our farming customers uh, who are also navigating the same space, forming policies to deal with their moral obligations uh, as well as their commercial and legal imperatives to measure and reduce their environmental impact. So I've been asked this morning to look at two things. Uh, the first, uh, I've added a possible uh, third and fourth, but... Um, the two things are soil carbon markets um, and biodiversity net gain. So on soil carbon markets, uh, the first thing I would say about soil carbon markets is that it's not about soil carbon. It's, um, it's about reducing emissions and it's about increasing sequestration on farms. That's where the markets lie as far as farming businesses are concerned. Uh, each of these businesses uh, have varying, varying models, uh, but in the main, they're about um, obviously reducing emissions and increasing, um, increasing the sequestration by adopting new farm, farming and land management techniques. Now, on broad acre arable farms, we're seeing incomes of maybe 20 or 30 pounds per hectare for those sort of schemes um, per, per year. Now, of course, there are plenty of challenges in those markets and questions that, that we all ask ourselves and we've been talking about some of those today. But uh, when you're, when you're um, starting to, to become involved in those markets, you do need to ask yourselves some of these questions. First of all, is it real? Uh, am I actually doing something different to what I would have done in any event? And what about permanence? Again, we've been talking about that. Uh, from, a com from a commercial perspective, do I care? Um, do I believe the numbers? Uh, which are often based on models rather than measurements, and we've been talking about that. We can talk about that for several days with the panel um, here. Um, I'm absolutely certain about that. Uh, and what impact will my, farming, my new farming practices have on my farming profitability? And again, I'm sure Duncan's got some good perspective uh, on that for us. Uh, but almost most importantly, what is my existing net carbon position before I start embarking in these, in these markets? 
Uh, will I need my carbon units to satisfy my customers' scope three e emissions? Um, in July, uh, a couple of, in July 22, uh, we carried out a survey with CLA and uh, respondent uh, around these these sorts of subjects. And respondents um, said, d generally, they had a high willingness to deliver carbon and biodiversity and soil health and so on. But only three percent of people had actually engaged uh, in in these markets. So I just mentioned that just to give you an idea of, of the scale of those of those markets themselves. And in summary, uh, carbon markets can provide some useful additional income on, on, on farm, uh, but it's complicated, it's unlikely to be game-changing, um, and you really do need to watch uh, contracts. So that's a brief bit on carbon markets. Turning then to um, biodiversity net gain, this has huge amounts of discussion in farming circles uh, at the moment, with vast sums of money mentioned in all of those discussions, all terribly exciting. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, biodiversity net gain is uh, introduced into, into policy starting from this month, actually, that re requires property developers to deliver a 10% gain in biodiversity as a consequence of their, uh, their development. Now, the way that's achieved is by an ecologist surveying the site, calculating the biodiversity units uh, on the site before the development commences, calculating the units on the site after the development has been, com been completed using the government's biodiversity metric complicated Excel spreadsheet. Um, and any additional biodiversity units that cannot be established on the development site itself will need to be found off-site. And that's where the market for a farmer potentially comes in. And there's potentially this opportunity to provide those units to satisfy the requirements of a nearby development. Uh, but, uh, I should say, the marketplace is valuing those at the moment, just to give you an idea of scale, at 20 to 30,000 pounds per unit, because they unlock huge development values, hence all of the excitement. But we believe the market is actually much smaller than was originally envisaged. So, the first point is that developers are really heavily incentivized to deliver those units on site. Uh, so that means within the red line boundary of their, of their own development site. And the evidence to date is that they've been able to do 90% of that on the site of the development itself. Whether or not that actually achieves the biodiversity addition required is, is another matter. Um, given dogs and cats and children playing and all this sort of stuff next to a development site. Um, we carried out some research with our um, environmental economic partners, FTEC, uh, on behalf of DEFRA a couple of years ago on this very question about what the size of this market was likely to be. And the results of that survey, uh, oh, sorry, the res re results of that research were that it was about 12,500 biodiversity units per annum in England. Now, if 90% of those are delivered on site, that leaves you 1,200, 1,300 units to deliver off site. Now, even if you only produce one biodiversity unit a hectare, that's about 1,200 hectares. And we know that it's more likely to produce three or four or five biodiversity units a hectare. Now, that equates to an average of four hectares per annum per local development authority. Now, obviously, there are big, big differences from one development, from one local authority to another about how much development there is. And it and it's obviously needs to be, needs, this needs to be delivered in close proximity. Uh, usually in close proximity to the development. So there are variations across the country, but I just wanted to give you those, uh, those numbers as a flavour of the size of that market. But at £25,000 per unit, that equates to £30 million, £31 million pounds, uh, a year for farmers. Now, in the context of farming profitability, which is £3 billion pounds a year, you can see that it doesn't make a huge dent in, in farmers' profitability generally. Um, now, having been a bit depressing about BNG markets uh, for you all, uh, there is a, an increasing excitement about the potential for private voluntary biodiversity markets um, being drawn out of some of the things that Jacqueline was talking about, about earlier, uh, about uh, particularly Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosure and, and all of that sort of thing, which requires commercial businesses really to take note and to declare their impact on the environment. And 
to go some way towards offsetting that impact. And this is where we see some potential for those markets to develop. Now, it's complicated, as always, because there is no internationally recognized unit of biodiversity for a start. Uh, so that needs to, be needs to be developed. And I don't think it's going to be something that farmers are going to get too excited about in the next year or two, probably. But it is something that is coming down, down the track and could potentially be much more important than the BNG market just in, in the UK. Just one final thing uh, before I, I wrap up is um, the public markets. And I just wanted to mention that the public markets for biodiversity and so on are the sustainable farming incentive, countryside stewardship schemes, and so on. And this is where there's been a huge amount of talk about it. Um, they're ever-changing schemes. Just trying to pin them down at any point in time is particularly complicated for any farmer or indeed consultant. Um, but just to give you an example, a farmer now can put down any amount of land that they want to in the sustainable farming incentive into a winter bird food mix and collect £850 per hectare. So that's what their farming operations are fighting, fighting against. And the conversation that is starting just to happen now in, within farming circles is about land use change, it's about uh, food production, it's about uh, sustaining farming activity. Um, and I, there is a danger of talking about environment versus food instead of environment with food. Uh, and I think that's uh, really important just to mention, particularly in the light of where and who we are with today, and that it should all be about linking uh, the environment with farming. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone, um, for ha having me. I'm now going to try and, um, yeah, after all the wonderful speakers uh, earlier, um, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but we'll, we'll have a go. So, yes, I'm Duncan Farrington. I'm a, a leaf demonstration farmer in Northamptonshire, and uh, uh, on a medium-sized family farm, we're a heavy clay farm. We, we average normally about five or 600 millimetres of rain a year. 2023, it was 20% above that, like everyone else. We were very wet. We were near 800 millimetres of rain. Um, and I stopped ploughing in 1998. So I've been on this, what is now called, regenerative agriculture journey, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But I'm always aware of getting a plug in first. So I'm probably better known for Farrington Oils. We were the first people in Britain to grow, press, and bottle uh, cold-pressed rapeseed oil. We sell it nationwide. I've got um, customers here today, and everyone's a consumer. So everyone's a potential customer. Um, and we are doing the ESG bit. We are leaf. So I, I grow 10% of the seed we need. I buy in from other leaf mark growers. So we are um, uh, adding value there to a, a farm commodity. We are, or we were, and we still are, the world's first food company to be certified. And certified is the important bit. Certified both carbon and plastic neutral. With uh, Jacqueline, I'm pleased to say it is the United Nations are certifying it. So whether my figures are correct or not, or whether the people that did the figures the UN are happy and we've just done our we've just done our fifth fifth uh, carbon audit I got the figures back literally we've been talking with the um, auditors over the last couple of weeks and we've got a, a 9% reduction this year compared to last year on total carbon emissions and an 11% reduction on the carbon emissions per thousand pounds of output we do as a business so uh, yeah we're, we're proud of it we've got a Queen's Award and I've just been accredited by the Good Business Charter but what's all that mean to the consumer? And, uh, you know, often farmers say to me, yeah, you, you're talking all this leaf stuff, but how do I make money? People aren't interested in it. We've heard today from supermarkets and from producers that, you know, people just want to buy the cheap and cheerful and they aren't worried. Well, I completely disagree with that. There's some Kantar data here. It's not a straight line, but I've got um, older Kantar uh, versions of this. And the top bit, the green bit, shows that even through a living, um, price of living crisis, and uh, post-COVID and all the other things, more and more consumers are actively purchasing or making active eco-purchasing choices. Another big sector of the community are considering it. That still means, is what is it, 25% of the community are not considering it at all. But, you know, the 80-20 rule, 80% 
um, more, more, nearly 80% of the community are either actively buying or um, considering it. So when I hear people say, oh, it, it doesn't really work, I, I, um, I don't believe that. And it's all down to how we communicate, and we've heard that already today. So what is regenerative farming? Well, there is no definition. I call it IFM, Integrated Farm Management. We are here on a LEAF conference, um, um, of course, so uh, we are all aware of that. So um, regenerative IMF farming. So yes, we've got cover crops. Yes, I do companion cropping. Yes, I've got a sexy drill that we do zero-till farming, and I plant um, my wheat after the previous into the, straight into the stubble, and we do all those sorts of things. Um, but it, I'm not a, a zero-till zealot, or um, um, I, I, I hopefully use a bit of common sense then. Sometimes we need to help nature, and on our heavy land temperate soils, Sometimes I need to put some air into the soil, so when I'm growing a crop of winter beans that you know, we can feed and let um, to livestock or humans and reduce the soil imports, um, I found that it works better if we put some air in the soil. And this picture here I think is very important because you hear a lot of people talk and eulogise how wonderful zero tillage is. I make mistakes as well. And this is, uh, so I drilled this, um, I, can't, I did that myself, so yes, I'm not perfect. Um, Heavy land, clay soil, I think that was uh, February time I drilled some uh, spring barley. It then rained for a month and that's what we ended up with. That is emitting a lot of methane. That is not any good at all for carbon sequestration. I'd be probably better off getting a plough that I don't have and going back to traditional methods. Um, pulling an eight tonne drill over wet clay soil is not the best thing. So is a lot we can learn and a lot more we need to do. And it's also important, others have mentioned it, it's not just about the, what happens in the fields, it's what we do around the fields. It's, it is a whole farm approach, which is exactly what LEAF is all about. So we've talked a bit about soils, and you know, the panel here, we've got the absolute experts in this, but soils are a great potential. And I've got one field that Tom's been to where um, we've, I've been looking at this particular field for over 20 years now, because soils do have the potential um, with soil uh, carbon sequestration of absorbing between 10 and 30% of global carbon emissions. Now, to put that into perspective, that is all of global um, transport, planes, ships, cars, everything. So it is potentially huge. Another way of looking at it, if global agricultural soils were to increase their soil organic matter from 1 to 3%, we could reduce um, atmospheric carbon levels back to pre-industrial times. So agriculture globally, not just in the UK, has a big part to play in this. So here's a graph of the field that I've been doing the analysis for the last 20 years. I have got a 2023 figure, and I do it every February, so when I get back, I must remember to do it for 2024. But the um, orange line is going in, upward, in an upward trend. That is the soil organic content of my um, uh, soil, uh, the carbon content of my soil. Now, this is done, Jacqueline. I did do that W pattern across the field. I didn't just shake it up from the soil out of the gateway. I did the whole lot. I'm, I'm the person that has been taking it. There was a spike there in 2016, and that just shows that is down to how we do it. I blame the person that did that. I probably got a bit too much leaf matter in there. So what this graph shows is don't take just one year. Don't worry about the number. But over a 20-year period, we've almost doubled our soil carbon content, 94% gain. What does that mean, though? Well, on that particular field, it's 20 hectares. And again, let's get a bit of a marketing opportunity. We drive around in a mellow yellow mini. That field's absorbing 14 tonnes a hectare of CO2 um, a year, if you believe the figures. And I heard someone else, one of the speakers, saying 12 tonnes a hectare. Um, so, you know, we aren't, we, you know we, we're, we're doing pretty well on that. Now, if, um, if on that one field alone, we are potentially offsetting the CO2 emissions of around 200 of those cars off UK roads each year. That's one field. On our whole 290 hectare farm, we're offsetting, if those figures are correct, nearly 3,000 medium-sized family cars off UK roads every year. And then the carbon figures, so that equates to about 4,000 tonnes of CO2 our fields are absorbing every year. And in our latest carbon figures, our whole business, which doesn't take into account the soils, um, is emitting about two and a half thousand tonnes. So if soils were counted in that, we are um, definitely way in the, um, the net zero or minus figure. So we're in a good place. But that's just me as a farmer doing my W pattern. Absolutely no scientific rigour, but it's interesting data I've built up over the last 20 years. 
So I was asked to join the uh, Horizon 2020 project, which is a European-funded project called AgriCapture CO2. We've just come to the end of it, and we've used all the things that Jacqueline was talking about. Um, we have uh, the whole idea of the project was to try and find an international um, accepted method of measuring, verifying, and certifying uh, soil organic carbon at scale um, and affordable for the farmer. So we use things like Earth observation, satellites to you and me. Um, so uh, with Sentinel, that, they're using Sentinel um, uh, satellites there, and we were working with Planet as well. And Planet's got a lot of satellites, so we can have an image every day rather than every three weeks, which is much better. Lucas data stands for something like land use, something area survey. I think it's something like 40,000 uh, um, uh, plots around Europe, so it's data to go at. AI, AI has worked with the algorithms. Um, but it all comes down to um, Stuart over there, him and I went round our farm and we were given 12 geo locations to go and test down to a metre deep at all the different horizons. We did it two years apart um, and at the end of the result, I'm afraid to say, our carbon um, went down. So I'm not getting too depressed about that because as a farmer doing my farmer surveys over a time period, it shows it going up. In this one incidence here, it's gone down, and it's gone down because of the change in the soil bulk density. So now we've got to go back to the laboratories and see, did we do the analysis right? Was it so? What I'm trying to show here, it's incredibly complicated. So when Jonathan talks about selling carbon, I would be very, very uh, uh, cautious about selling it. And I'll say it here now. No one should be selling carbon. We can answer that in the questions uh, later if you want. I've got ideas on what you might want to do with that. So it's not just soil. It's not just carbon, it's not just biodiversity. This is another graph, it's been mentioned a bit today, but I think it's the future that we should be very, very interested um, in looking at further. Below the um, graph there, the red and the green, it's some research that was done looking at the nutrition of food between the end of the war and 1991 uh, in both vegetables and meats. And everything's negative, which to me says that, says that food nutrient density has gone down since the war. And that's probably not a great surprise, but on our one field where I've got my measurements for, from for 20 year, um, years, the yellow above the graph, everything apart from potassium here, which has stabilized the magnesium that's gone down a tiny amount, everything has gone up. So as well as my soil carbon going up, my soil nutrition is going up which I would suggest two things. One, the crops we grow on that field are probably going to be more nutritious than crops grown on another field where it's gone down. And another thing that was mentioned this morning was um, uh, in integrated pest management. I would suggest that if we've got more nutritious crops growing, we're going to have um, biodiversity, biology working with us and uh, um, healthier plants that can uh, defend themselves against disease and pests. And finally, I see Tom's waving at me. So I think sustainable uh, farming, it is joined up thinking, it is the future. Um, I think as a farmer, I can get my income from three or four different areas. The crops I produce on my farm, the income from public uh, money for public goods, potential income from, as Jonathan was saying, carbon and biodiversity services trading. And then also the thing we don't talk about, potential income from ecotourism and, and more engagement, consumer engagement in what we do. So I think it is the right thing for all of us to do for all of our futures. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, <coughs> we've got a, a slightly abbreviated time to get through some uh, some questions uh, before wrapping up. And obviously, I want lots of questions on the floor. So please uh, get your hands up and uh, let's uh, let's uh, well, let's get a mic straight straight to here. I think that would be very nice for us. Uh, keep your hand up so that the gentleman can see you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Uh, it, it's what's going through my mind is that the problem of, uh, is very much of climate change is very much related to the re uh, releasing long term a bit, a bit the mic, long term stored uh, carbon, uh, uh, which which is fossil fuels and lime uh, limestone from the ground, things like that. Uh, we are really tempted to equate that, to put it into short-term storage by growing trees, 
by uh, putting stuff into the soils. And it's that equation of not putting things back into long-term storage mm. that is a big, big worry in my mind. Mm. And so you've seen in the past people flying around in helicopters saying, well, that's okay because I planted a tree. <laughs> and it, it doesn't equate <laughs> in my head. But yeah. I'm wondering what people think. Well, that, that's a good... Uh, because the ring, there is a link between the soil um, carbon storage and geological carbon storage, isn't there? And, and weathering. I don't know, Jacqueline, whether you want to take that on because there, there's a sort of there is a link between the two. It's not all just uh, no. Immediate. But Phil, it's a, a perfect question because there is the need to put soil health at the top of the pile because unless you get it started in the soil, it, it's not going to go down. So you have to start the process. The question is, how do you keep carbon in that mineral fraction? Make sure it stays there. And essentially, you still can do your business whilst the, whilst the storage is increasing. And I think the genuine problem we have at the moment is there are too few people looking at the one meter depth. But even if you did, what you would find is a fairly static picture. So I think what, what we saw just now is that that's a very believable process because it's about the right amount that soils can absorb, but there is a saturation. And then you think, well, how do I keep it in the ground? And at that point, it's like you have to have a different strategy because it's not like doing the same business, because it's harder to keep it in the ground once the soil has saturated. And that's where people like Pete Smith are right. He gets worried about carbon markets if you don't take that into account. Now, there's a whole industry that started to do weathered rock. And what they're suggesting is if you put a whole pile of granite on the top of your soil, it will work its way down, and somehow that will be a permanent storage as well. I'm rather sceptical about that, but let's wait and see. But are you generally sceptical about enhanced weathering, this idea of spreading enhanced, rock dust on the fields? So essentially what we don't understand, and, and they, just, they, they will say it themselves, is that, and do and others, is that we don't understand the chemistry of putting granite on the top. But if you're literally just trying to grab air and take it down, so to speak, almost like an inert material, then it will work its way down to the, to the, to the bedrock, absolutely. But whether or not it will do chemical things as it's going down through the soil, we don't actually know what those chemical reactions will be. So they might enhance, but some rocks might not. But where I think the trees come in is that they genuinely, of course, because of deeper roots, will start to essentially create conduits down to deeper areas. So it's the combination of having roots in contact with more organic matter, which is coming from that soil preparation and the health of it, which means that the trees themselves will secure the deeper one. But if you don't do the two together, you actually probably are not going to have permanent storage. So the trick's going to be in 25 years, how do we put those two kinds of activities together? Alley cropping, all sorts of things come to mind. Thank it's you a really good much. question. Just while we're looking for another question, I'd like Duncan to tell us why we no one should be selling their soil carbon. But you've only got about a minute to tell us. Yeah, um, so when we started agriculture, I think soil carbon was worth three to six pounds a tonne. Currently, I don't know, it's worth, I don't know, 20 to 30 pounds a tonne. So in the space of three years, it's, it's gone up potentially 10 times. What's it going to do in another three years' time? If you need money, we're sitting in a bank. Go out and uh, borrow against it. Use it as an asset and don't sell it. In, in set it into your business mm. because it, you might want it to trade and do business in the future. Totally agree. Totally agree. I wanted to uh, just make sure I'd understood something correctly. You said at the end, Jonathan, did you say that any land can go into winter bird feed and you'll get <laughs> £850 a hectare for it? Is that, did I, I get that right? That as well. Any area Arab. of arable, arable land. land. I, what I mean by that is that, that there, there is no there is no limit in the SFI. No, which seems fairly jaw dropping to me because I'm not a farmer, but I think that's a pretty good return per hectare, isn't or it? Or legging fallow, or um, <laughs> any, yeah, yeah. any of those options. And but are we seeing any evidence that people are grabbing huge chunks of that? I mean, is it going to become you know one of those subsidies that disappears in a year because everybody's grabbed massive handfuls of it? I think it's uh, too early. Defra's, Defra's objective is to is to is to fill the books. They need to they need to right. get people signed up to the, to their scheme. So they've been increasing payment rates until such time as they do. Totally, regardless of the productivity of that land. Totally insensitive to its grade or anything like that. Yeah. Intriguing. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, this is for me. Uh, questions for <laughs> yes, gentlemen. <laughs> hmm. I, was a, I was a little late getting here today. I'm a slightly frustrated farmer. I do poultry, both meat uh, broilers and eggs and arable. 
I'm 55 and I'm exhausted, really. Want to <laughs> you know, I'm just exhausted everything, interest rates, staffing, Brexit, you name it. We went on a trip with Hampshire Farms up to Cranfield Institute and we heard that French beans are grown in Morocco and they're using groundwater from 5,000 meters down to feed the crops. And in three years, the Morocco soil will be dead. But Sainsbury's will keep buying it because it's cheaper. They will buy Italian chicken meat. They'll buy Polish eggs or vice versa. I mean, the supermarkets have a huge amount of power and control and are just ruining farmers because we do the right thing. We go through Red Tractor. We get certified. We do what we're asked to do. And there are problems. And the moment the price drops, they're off. It's Italian. It's Polish. It's uncontrolled in some cases. So... What hope is there? We can do this, but we represent such a small part of the world population that Britain is just, you know, a, a draft in a hurricane. And I'm just very, very frightened and very frustrated that this is all good, but Sainsbury's et al. will just chop and change when it suits them. Understood. Uh, this is more about soil this afternoon. Now, there would have been a little more appropriate this morning. But... Okay. Um, does anyone want to... <laughs> do do you want to pick that up, Jacqueline? I, I will pick it up because uh, I think in the case of Morocco, uh, they know. And the king has interestingly picked up on this and has said, I want to revitalize all my soils. So I'm not saying it's the answer for you and for the continuous you know, buying and purchasing of cheaper food wherever you can. But there is an understanding more and more that many countries that are currently supplying into, let's say, into Europe are realizing the price they're paying. And I, and I think this is the discussion you have to have. And I, I can't speak to your position, but, but just the fact that you've raised it now, I suspect that many people will then go and have a look at Moroccan soils. And presumably, if uh, Sainsbury's were leaf marked, they wouldn't be able to do this? Is that correct? Anybody? That's for anybody ah. in the room, really. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's an advantage of leaf marking. Is presumably, the idea is you would stop that kind of undermining. Is that, am, I, am I right? Well, yeah. I, I, I take it that that is a very big issue, but it's not central to the issue we're discussing this afternoon, so I'm going to park that. But I do want to pick up something that Jacqueline said, because I was, he's actually raised something which I thought was really interesting. You talked about the soils or lack of them in uh, sub-Saharan uh, oh. sub Africa, well, or Australia. Yeah. Are there, and, and, and Duncan actually talked about the really quite relatively swift gains you can have yes. in soil carbon. Are there some... Big gains to be had in some of these degraded soils in some of these countries. What I have been staggered by is that on a continent like Australia, where the soils are ancient, I mean, they really are, they, they've been almost stripped of uh, organic carbon, how really almost engineered responses have been able to rebuild soils back. We have people who have, in the space of two or three years, been able to put 1% and 2% soil organic carbon in a soil where it was like 0 0.1. And it's just really assiduous application of good practices with organic matter and taking care of the pH and so on. So this gives me hope. And I think what we almost need is starter kits. When you think about sub-Saharan mm. Africa, you need that first initiation to get a little bit of moisture in. And then, and then after that, it is literally the care. And I think there's someone here who is building dams and buns and so on. It's just that bit of moisture sometimes that's all you need. So yes, soils can but it needs a lot of care and I think and technical expertise to do it. But it can happen, absolutely. Uh, can I add to that? When, uh, in uh, the agriculture project, uh, one of the scientists we were working with, I was having a discussion with her one day. And actually, land values in the UK are phenomenally expensive. And as a farmer, you know, we're competing against all the other interests that want it. If I want to go and invest in something to get a return on agriculture, you might want to go and buy degraded land in okay. Australia or um, uh, Africa in a, a dry climate because actually it is, as you've mm. just saying, it is easy with the right skills to turn it around and improve it and then you can start adding an asset value in the form of that carbon in there which will have a, a value longer term. Actually, can I, can I just give yep. an example of that? So most of you buy flowers, I'm sure, from some of our supermarkets. <laughs> And those flowers, many of them come from Kenya. <clears throat> those Kenyan flower growers have a pretty hefty bill in terms of the flights because they ship them out every night on an airplane. So they've now realized that through insetting, what they should be doing is taking in hyperarid land, making it productive, creating more farming and livelihoods, 
And actually you get really good practice out of that. So now the flowers can genuinely be considered to be sort of going towards net zero or carbon net zero, but you're getting all the extra benefits. So it's not just a wish about restoring land, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, it's about creating livelihoods, food as well. And also, Jane, when we, Jane, when we talk about restoring land and degraded <laughs> land, we need to be a little bit careful about always assuming that's happening over there. I mean, some people might say our, our uplands have become fairly degraded in their soil. Are there some fairly rapid gains one could make in, in soil quality uh, and, and reversing and soil and carbon storage in our uplands here in the UK? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, as, an, as a soil erosion specialist, I would say that certainly controlling erosion of those uplands is really important. The big challenge we have is climate change and rainfall events, more extreme rainfall events. But certainly keeping the carbon there is the, and avoiding the degradation that I mentioned earlier is mm. really, really important. I was interested, Jackie, in your last slide where you were making the point about livelihoods but you, would, you showed a picture, I think that was peat extraction. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, and that's really interesting because that is part of that culture and that the, the, the livelihood. But everybody says peat extraction is one of the worst ways of emitting carbon to the atmosphere. So how do we square that circle in terms of that is the livelihood, that is an economic input to that community, and yet we know it is one of the worst ways of exactly. emitting carbon. Um, but, but going back to your point that, yes, I am an optimist that I believe it is possible to reverse degradation. I saw getting the microphone to that gentleman. Something I wanted to ask you, Duncan, um, was I, I've heard some farmers say this about whether there's a ceiling on soil carbon, which there may well be. But people have actually said, I'm actually increasing the amount of soil, full stop, that I'm actually increasing its, its quantity. Is that something yes. that you're seeing? I'm not, I'm not seeing it. I'm sure there is a, a, a ceiling. I don't know what it is on our soils. Um, and uh, Andrew Francis I've seen somewhere, and I always think of him because he grows um, onions and carrots and vegetables on sand. Now, he can do some wonderful things and not make much of a difference, whereas on our clay soils, over 20 years, we can double the organic content. So we're only up to about 8.5%. Uh, but I think we can go a lot more than that, which actually it is increasing the volume of soil. Maybe it's, yeah, volume. Yeah. But I think I've heard livestock farmers talk about how they can gradually increase the actual mm -hmm. volume of, of the soil. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, that uh, Tom is entirely prescient. That was absolutely my point to the professor. How did the prairies form if soil doesn't increase in volume? No, they did. If it does increase. Correct. <laughs> and, and, and so soil, soil might saturate in a given volume sorry, in the I, laboratory. I was using a less technical word. Saturate is exactly the right word. Absolutely. But you had a lot of buffalo there as well helping. Yeah, I, I, I speak as a, somebody who has drunk the Kool-Aid and now has uh, mob-grazed cattle. And all, all exactly. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, yes, let's have uh, one or two more out there. Okay, while we're waiting, I'm going to put a... A question to, to, to Jane. I couldn't quite work out when I saw your 1.8 billion or 100, uh, 1,800 million that million. the poor soil was costing. So it was one of those things where I thought, is that a lot or a little? Uh, it, it was um, part of me thought, well, actually, you know, that's a rounding error in government spending, um, 1.8 billion. <laughs> every, every year. Uh, every year, I suppose that, that, that tot up and it could get a lot and, worse. And avoidable. <laughs> avoidable, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know how much you're being paid, Tom, but 1.8 million. million. <laughs> <laughs> it's close to what I'm getting for doing this event, but, you know, not I, close enough. Exactly. I rest my case. <laughs> Sorry. But, but, in, but in terms of avoidable costs, I think that is a lot. You soon want to come in on this, Jack? No, I, it was just a mathematical observation. I think it's 1.8 trillion. In the UK? No, that number that was in the table. No, it wasn't. No, it it was, wasn't. Oh, I couldn't 1. see. 1.8 million, no, million. It was 1.8 million. Million, million. Yeah, million, million. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's not a little amount. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> For Tom, obviously it is. Obviously. So. No, I, it, it's just one of those things when you look at overall funding and you say how vital soil is to us, and then you look at that figure, and, and in many ways soil is a life and death thing, and then you look at that figure, and I'm thinking, does that actually reflect its level of yeah. importance or not? I suppose that was my, so I, was my gut feeling yes, about it. Another way of putting it in the equation, how much is the government spending on soil protection and, and soil regeneration? Well, that would be your salary for 
<laughs> so not much. Hey. Touche. Uh, right, enough of this banter. We're gonna have to, come on, so, some, uh, a nice question to finish. You don't want to finish on me. Uh, that's very, very... Go on, come on. Uh, yeah, oh, 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 yes, yeah, oh, they're all there. I'm going to get the lady in the... the, the you're bad. tentative, uh, but you're, you're, you're... No, you're allowed these gentlemen both asked one. They both asked one this morning as well. You get repeat offenders in this. <laughs> yeah. So just on the biodiversity and metric... Naturally, that's an absolute nightmare for everybody concerned, especially when you take into account the SFI payment now. If we're talking about new reporting requirements, CSRD, that are coming in into Europe, you've got TCFD, you're also talking about kind of B&G. What is that looking like in terms of legislation and policy, and who is actually looking at that at the moment to unify that? I can tell you. I met them yesterday. Oh, great. <laughs> well, who tell and, us? And, where, and, where and are guess they where they are? are. They're not Nowhere. Defra. No, they're in the Department of Energy Security and uh, Net Zero Business. Desnes. Desnes. Desnes, yeah. That's where they sit. But the, There's I a mean, little team there, and they are completely flummoxed. Yeah, I, th I think... <laughs> <laughs> I think that's this is going public now, right? Okay. <laughs> I and think they're asking the for help, is, is what I could say. Yeah, genuinely. I think that's the point, though, because yeah. obviously these reporting requirements yes. are coming in in 2025. <laughs> yes, 25. And they want to understand the metrics Next and double materiality yeah. before that date. Yes. And yet, at the moment, nobody's got any guidance mm. on they're what They're going that's to have look some like. round tables, they think. Mm. 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 Yeah. <laughs> we'll wait for the round, round. tables. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we're going to um, uh, wind it up there. So please put your hands together and thank uh, Jane Rickson, Jonathan Armitage, Duncan Farrington, and Jacqueline McLeod. Um, thank you. And now, the man who needs no introduction, Cedric Porter. Thanks very much, Tom. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for, for everyone. What a great day we've had. So I've just got to do a summing up. I, I'm like the judge. Uh, today, so uh, uh, summing up. So let's start with integrated farm management. We, we had a great history lesson from Alistair, and then we heard from Rosemary about how it needs to evolve and how it actually might not be all the, the answers. It's just part of the picture, but it's important that people do it better. Then we looked a bit more globally with, with uh, Jop and, uh, and, and Wynn, and then James as well. And I think what's impressed and brought it together with both of those was this working with all farmers, working with smallholder farmers as well globally. And this is really important to LEAF in terms of LEAF is not just a UK uh, standard, it's a global standard, and it's not just for big farmers, it's for um, farmers of all sizes as well. Uh, and it's great to see that, that, that happening. Uh, there were questions about the, um, the relationship, inevitably the relationship between the retailers and the buyers. Um, uh, uh, and the farmers, although if we didn't have the retailers, then we wouldn't be farmers. Um, and I liked, I think it was, uh, Yop, you said, this is a movement, not a membership. And I think that's really important, that actually this is not about being, it's very important to be a member of LEAF, but it's not about just that is not the, the end game. It's about improving the way you farm and the way we um, farm in, in terms of the environment and sustainably. So then we went on to the uh, controversial, perhaps more controversial, uh, question of livestock. Quite a lot of disagreement there, but I think there was essentially some agreement as well. There is a place for livestock, there is a place for ruminants, uh, but perhaps it's not as much as we've got now, but there's a there is definitely a place for improved livestock production. Uh, and that's something that, again, LEAF is, is working with and looking at. Uh, honesty. Jude was talking about honesty, and I think honesty and transparency, that's really important. And something like LEAF can help you do that. Um, and I like Dan's eating the rainbow. And that's not a bag of Skittles. <laughs> uh, and then we moved on to, um, on to Jacqueline's uh, LEAF lecture. And what a fantastic lecture it was really made us thought, think. I think this, you, you planned it. Where, where are you, Jacqueline? Um, you planned it very well. You, you hit us with the science, and then you sort of opened it up. And I love your, your end piece about the philosophy of stewardship, people, place, and planet. I think that's something that we, you know, that really sort of enca encapsulates what we're doing uh, and, and the importance of that, and not just thinking about it just in pure science terms or just in pure farming terms. It's, we're a part of a bigger picture. Uh, and then putting that 
discussion around as well. Uh, and we had that. Uh, and Jane, building back better. I, yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that someone else used it before. But yeah, it's, it's important to... He wasn't the first. But yes, yeah, so let's reclaim it. <laughs> uh, and, and of course... Then John T. giving us uh, a, an idea of how it might work uh, financially. And then, of course, Duncan, bring it back to the farm level. And this is why I think it's really important, and I think this is what LEAF does well. It looks at the science, looks at the thinking, puts it out there, thinks, uh, you know, it's, it's prepared to question uh, and to, to learn new things, but then has got a very much on the ground. It's not blue sky, just blue sky. It's also brown earth, green grass, and golden crops thinking. It brings it all back together, and I think that's the real advantage. We've got some fantastic demonstration farms. Uh, we've got some fantastic um, demonstration farmers here in the, in the room. So that's my whistle-top um, summary of the events, and I've just got a couple of other things to show you. Uh, here we are, closing comments, that's me. And here we go. So this... Uh, we, we've been remembering Caroline um, uh, today, and I think it's important to, that, to, to do that. And the most important thing is not just to remember, to, but to build on her legacy. And it's great to have David uh, uh, doing that um, uh, as he leads uh, LEAF now. But just a couple of things that I wanted to, to, to show you. First is the Caroline Drummond Award. This is Communicating Farming uh, uh, Excellence, and that's in conjunction with LEAF but also the Institute of Agricultural Management and the British Guild of Agriculture Journalists. And here we have um, Philip uh, presenting to Jake Freestone the first award last year. Uh, so he was the winner of the first award, and he's Ober Overbury Farms, um, and uh, the fantastic work that he could be... He's actually skiing today, so he can't, can't join us. But here, And he, um, he received the fantastic uh, uh, um, uh, award there, um, sculpture made out of Cornish yew on a base of uh, English oak. So uh, really sort of remembering, but then building on that uh, legacy of Caroline as well. And just, and perhaps even more importantly, now I want you to pretend you're at a Taylor Swift concert. I want you to get your phones out, and I want you to point at that QR code. I'm not, I'm not going to stop until you've pointed at that QR code and downloaded it. So this is the Caroline Drummond Scholarship for Innovation and Sustainability. There are also um, leaflets on your on your on your chairs there. So please do take it there, take, take it with you, with you. That will explain it all. But essentially, what we are doing, we're we're raising funds. We've already raised uh, some funds, but we're looking to raise more funds, and then every year to provide a scholarship of around about probably about twenty five thousand pounds a year. Uh, to, for, for innovation and sustainability. So, again, building and carrying on that legacy of Caroline's um, right into the future. So we're looking for support in that now. There's, there's various ways you can support it at different levels, um, from uh, a, a significant five-year uh, five uh, um, uh, support level down to individual um, uh, donations. So share it with uh, your friends and family as well, and uh, then we'll be speaking a little bit more as we open it up for applications for that as well. So if you've got an app, if you've got an idea uh, that you want to, to to be considered for it, look out for that. Although you can already uh, contact us on that as well. So as I say, building on that uh, that um, legacy and reputation. Uh, here's another date for your diary: the 9th of June, 2024. Open Farm Sunday, uh, get that in your diary. It's not that far away. Uh, and again, really tell your friends and family about that, uh, particularly your non-farming um, friends and family. Fantastic way of uh, getting out, seeing the farm uh, and meeting the farmers. And actually, I think great for the farmers as well to meet the public and discuss this is a two-way thing. It's not just about, um, uh, not just about um, um, uh, the public learn learning from farmers. Uh, and again, this great sort of strand of uh, LEAF's education uh, strand, all the fantastic work that uh, LEAF does with that. So you will be pleased to know that I am just about to finish. So we connect, we build trust, and we educate. But we must also thank 
Uh, we thank very much all our speakers for, for, for coming uh, and sharing their, their wisdom uh, and uh, being candid in the, uh, in the questioning as well. And we certainly need to, to thank our sponsors. Thank you so much to Strutton Parker for, for your hospitality, for your great lunch, uh, and this fantastic um, building here. Uh, and our other sponsors as well, Frontier. Uh, I know we've got Tom here, so thank you, Tom. Uh, and to Oxbury Bank, which is uh, the farmer-owned or farmer-run agricultural bank in the UK, uh, and very much a supporter of LEAF as well, uh, and I know of the agricultural industry. But finally, just to thank you. Thank you very much for coming uh, and for sharing your questions as well. Tom is waving at me. Have you guys got anything to film? Yeah. One film. One film. Yeah. Should we, we'll end on... We'll end on a film. So, um, I'll, I'll, yeah, just do the thank you, and then we'll end on a film. And, yeah, please, many thanks for coming, and a safe journey uh, back for all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>close to the young people. They're the future of working tomorrow. They're our future consumers. So we need to be speaking to them better, to be more obvious, and actually to lead them into the industry where there are so many job opportunities. So thank you for your interest, and I really encourage you to do all you can. Thank you also to the organisers, to, uh, to Teresa and uh, to Justine in particular, and all their team for their hard work. Thank you.